Welcome to Billionaire Romance Audiobooks. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. It helps more than you know, and it's the best way to stay up to date on our latest releases. When you subscribe, you'll also get notified when we release new videos. We also love hearing from our listeners. If you have any suggestions for future audiobooks, please leave a comment below. Or if you just want to say hi, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you for listening, and we hope you have a great day. Subscribe to this channel today, and become a part of the Billionaire Romance Audiobooks family. The Billionaire's Secret Desire A Holiday Romance Audiobook By Michelle Love Audio Copyright 2023 BFA Publishing Note we edited this romance audiobook to comply with the YouTube content guidelines. If you want to listen to the non-edited version and steamy scenes, you can grab a copy from Google Play Books or Kobo. Blurb Rule number one in my job, don't fall in love with a customer. Never. But of course, that's what I did. Knox Renault is perhaps the richest entrepreneur in New Orleans but he's also the most stunning, attractive, and seductive man I've ever met. And he wants me. Every time he touches me and is in me, it feels heavenly. It's pure ecstasy. Our love is so pure, so real, so animalistic. Nothing will divide us, not even the dark forces that threaten us. Nothing and no one will be able to stop me from loving this man forever. Chapter 1 Amber Duplass squinted at her oldest and dearest friend, as he handed her a plate of perfectly cooked eggs. Knox Renault, you are a pain in my ass. Knox, his green eyes amused, grinned at her. Well then, my work here is done. But why? Amber sighed, and bunched her auburn hair up into a ponytail. You're one of the wealthiest landowners in New Orleans, an incredibly successful businessman, and, according to Forbes, one of the world's most eligible bachelors. And yet you stand in your own palatial kitchen, she gestured around the vast room, cooking me eggs for brunch yourself. Haven't you heard of chefs? Knox shook his head. He was used to this line of questioning from Amber. You know I don't like a lot of people around me, Ams. Amber forked some egg into her mouth, almost swooning at the taste. Which is why you're a pain. I'm worried that you'll become a hermit. I think hermithood arrived a while ago. Knox said mildly. Look, I know you mean well but I'm nearly forty and I'm set in my ways. I like being alone. He dumped a panful of eggs onto his own plate and sat down. And anyway, in a few days the best and brightest will be here to drink my champagne and bother me all night. Gosh, why do I do this every year? He groaned and Amber laughed. Such a grinch. She ruffled his dark curls and he grinned, though he was sighing on the inside. The Renault family had given a Halloween charity benefit since way before Knox's birth, it had been a special project of his beloved mother's. Before the tragedy, of course. Despite his solitary nature, Knox could not bear to dishonor his mother's legacy. His eyes flicked over to the framed picture of her and Teague, his adored elder brother, on the kitchen counter. Both of them dark and beautiful, laughing and hugging. Both of them gone so senselessly. The tragedy of the Renault family was known throughout Louisiana and beyond. Tynan Renault, a respected businessman, adoring husband to the Italian-born Gabriella, and heroic father to his sons Teague and Knox, had suffered a psychotic break and gunned down his wife and eldest son one night before turning the gun on himself. Knox, away at college at the time, had been destroyed. After dropping out of school and coming home to the huge plantation mansion out on the bayou, he had struggled for years to understand what his father had done. Amber and his other friends had tried to persuade him to sell the place where his mother and brother had been murdered, but Knox refused. He took over his brother's business with his friend Sandor, and together, they had made a success of it. The company, Rencar, quickly became an outlet to forget his pain, with Knox pouring twenty hours a day into the work. Luxury food importing had never been his dream, was it anyone's? but he had found something he was good at, and that was enough for him. His boyhood dreams of becoming a musician were pushed aside for something that would utterly distract him. 
The studio his mother had set aside for both of them to work in had stood empty for almost twenty years now, as had Knox's heart. He realized he wasn't listening to Amber now and apologized. She rolled her blue eyes. Knox, I'm used to you spacing out on me, but listen, this is your party. I'm just saying, why don't you try to be more gregarious for a change? These people pay a lot of money to come here. Mostly to see the murder house, he mumbled, and Amber made an annoyed click with her tongue. Maybe so, but the money we raise goes to a good cause, doesn't it? Something good to come out of, damn it, Knox, you're not the only one who lost someone. To his horror, he saw tears in her eyes. He reached over and took her hand. Ams, I'm sorry I know. I miss Ariel too, every day. He sighed. So much pain, so much death. Amber was right, he needed to get out of this self-pitying funk. All I ask is for you to do your part on the night. Mingle and talk to your guests. Amber's tone was calmer now and she smiled at him, her face soft and her eyes on his, holding them for a beat too long. Knox nodded, looking away finally. I promise. After Amber had gone, he wandered into his living room and flicked on the television. Local news station WDSU was doing a feature on Halloween New Orleans, the magical manic mayhem of the festival the city threw every October. Knox sighed and waited for the inevitable mention of his party. Wait for it, he muttered to himself. Will it be the Renault family curse or the mansion with the dark secrets first? The anchor looked serious. Of course, before the festivities kick off on Halloween night, the New Orleans elite will gather at the Renault mansion out on the bayou. Regular viewers will know that the annual Creepy Cocktails Gala benefit is held every year at the place some locals call the mansion with a dark history. More on that after these messages. Knox clicked off the television with an annoyed flick of his hand. Same story every year and now his guests who watched the news would be all the more curious about the only remaining Renault. Damn it. His cell phone rang and he answered it gratefully. Sandor man, you have impeccable timing. His friend laughed. Any time. Listen, we may have a deal on the Laurent restaurant chain. Knox sat up. Really? The Laurent business was worth twice what they had offered, but had been on the market for two years with no interest. Knox knew if they got it at a cheap price and refurbished it, it could make them a fortune. He and Sandor had decided to branch out into buying restaurants to serve their luxury foods as a new income stream, not that either of them needed it, but they both were bored with their business. They wanted to get their hands dirty and do something, something physical rather than just importing food for, well, people like them. Yep. Gustave Laurent is getting a divorce, and he wants to get rid of the property quickly. Knox was astonished. Gus is divorcing Catherine. Seems so. Seems like she was sleeping around on him. Knox made a half-amused, half-scornful noise. Like Gustav hasn't been messing around on her for years. You know Gus. Sadly, yes. Listen, I can be there in a half hour. Good, Sandor replied. And afterward, I'll spot you lunch. Deal. Knox smiled down the phone. Deal. See you then. Livia Chatelaine balanced three plates expertly along her left arm and carried them to the table. The two women and the child seated at the table smiled gratefully at her as she laid their food in front of them and returned their grins. Enjoy, folks. Let me know if you need anything else. She skirted back to another table that was waiting for their check and settled up with them quickly and with her innate friendliness. She had been working at Le Chat Noir Café in the French Quarter for three months now, ever since she had packed her whole life into her battered old gremlin and driven across the country from San Diego. Morico, her best friend from college, had been in New Orleans for a year and had gotten her the job at the café. It didn't hurt that the owner, a handsome dark-haired Frenchman called Marcel, had a huge crush on Morico and would have hired anyone she recommended. Thankfully though, Livia and Marcel had become good friends, and Livia showed up early, stayed late, and worked her ass off for him. In return, he gave her the shifts that fit best with her studies, and paid her enough that she could afford the tiny apartment she shared with Morocco. Livia had decided as she left San Diego 
that she wouldn't return to her hometown again. It held no interest for her now, and there wasn't any family left there that she cared about. An only child, her mother had died when she was young, and Livia had brought herself up. She'd worked hard at school and at various jobs to put food on the table, while her father drank himself into a stupor every night and screamed at her if she disturbed him. Livia had stopped caring years ago about the man. As far as she was concerned, he was merely the sperm donor. What she remembered of her mother were warm, happy memories. Cancer was a bugger, and it had stolen her happiness away when she was five. Livia's last memory of her mother was of the beautiful woman kissing her goodbye one day before school, and that was the last time she had seen her. Her father hadn't let her see her after she died. Livia had put herself through college on a scholarship and by working three jobs, and it had become second nature to always fight and scrape for everything. It gave her energy and reason, and when she had graduated top of her class, it had all been worth it. Her tutors had been loath to let her go and had championed her to apply for postgraduate research scholarships, but it had taken Livia four years to finally secure an offer from the University of New Orleans. Hey, dreamer! Morico nudged Livia out of her reverie, and her friend smiled at her. Morico, a tiny Japanese-American of exquisite beauty, and she knew it, hoisted herself up onto the counter. Marcel needs a favor. Livia hid a grin. When Marcel sent Morico to do his dirty work, it meant that, whatever the favor was, it would be a big and probably inconvenient one. What is it? Well, he's been asked to cater the Renault party on Saturday. You know which one, I mean? Livia shook her head. Nope. Morico rolled her eyes. It's an annual thing Knox Renault does. He throws a Halloween gala party and gives a ton of money to charity. Never heard of him, or it. So, what's the favor? Livia thought she could guess, Marcel needed waitstaff. A moment later, Morico confirmed her suspicions. He was going to hire in silver service staff, but apparently they don't want anything but canapes and cocktails. Silver service staff would cost him more than he's making so. Livia smiled at her. It's no problem. Usual uniform? She pulled down on her too tight white shirt and tucked it back into the black mini she wore to serve. It barely contained her lush curves, her full breasts and softly curved belly. Her legs, long and slender, were encased in black tights, and she wore flat pumps, absolutely refusing to wear heels to wait tables. Livia wasn't the tallest girl, but her long legs made her look taller than her 5'5 height, and her long tawny waves were her crowning glory. She had pulled her almost waist-length hair into a bun, but it was forever escaping the clips. Morico grabbed it now and twisted it up for her. Livia shot her a grateful smile. Thanks, boo. I really should cut it all off. No way, Morico said, her own shiny black hair falling in a straight curtain down her back. I'd kill for your curls. So, Saturday night, waitressing for the rich muckety-mucks? I'll be there too. Hey, at least we get to snoop around the rich guy's house. Livia sighed to herself. She honestly didn't mind helping Marcel out, but she had very little time for rich boys with too much money. She'd had to wait on them enough in her time. She went back out to the cafe and grimaced. Two regulars had just come into the restaurant. Speaking of rich muckety-mucks, she thought, plastering a fake smile on her face. The woman, an icy-looking blonde with bright red lipstick and cold blue eyes, looked at her dismissively. Egg white omelet with spinach and a mango teeny. She didn't look at the menu once. Her companion, a suave-looking man who at least smiled at Livia and said please and thank you whenever he was in, nodded. Same for me please Liv. Good to see you again. Livia smiled at him. She judged him for the company he kept, but if she was fair, he was always polite to her. She knew his companion was called Odell, and her father was one of the richest men in the state. It didn't impress Livia. You too, sir. Sure I can't interest either of you in some french fries to go with your salad? Odell looked horrified, but her companion grinned. Why not? Livia grinned and disappeared into the kitchen. Marcel slunk in and smiled at her. Thanks for Saturday, Livy. I'll pay you double. 
She kissed his cheek. No problem, pal. Marcel, his eyes so dark you couldn't see the pupils, nodded to the restaurant. I see Elsa and Lumiere are in the restaurant. Livia laughed. You're getting your Disney all mixed up, and anyway, he's okay. But yeah, she is the ice queen. Don't let their wealth get to you. It was all inherited, not earned. Oh, I know, and it doesn't bother me. Money can't buy breeding, Livia shrugged off the woman's rudeness. I can honestly say these people and their ways don't keep me up at night, Marcel. I'm just saying because I know the man, Roan St. Mark, is Knox Renault's best friend. It's more than likely, they'll be at the party on Saturday. Marcel grinned at Livia, who rolled her eyes. Just promise me you won't tip their meals into their laps. Livia snorted. I promise, honey. Good girl. Livia finished out her shift, then walked home through the busy streets of the French Quarter. She had fallen in love with this city, the slow, sensual heat, the sultry, laid-back nature of the people. Strangely, for a city known for its voodoo and black magic, she had never felt uneasy walking the streets at night here. Morico was still at work when Livia got back to their apartment, so Livia took a long hot shower, then made herself a bowl of soup, grabbing some saltines from the pack in the kitchen. As she ate she flicked through the television channels but soon got bored. Dumping her bowl in the sink, she washed it out, then decided to go to bed to read. She had a piano recital coming up, and she wanted to go through the score again, miming her keystrokes in the air. She fell asleep with Moriko's cat cuddling in next to her, and didn't hear her roommate come home. Out on the bayou, Knox too had fallen into a deep sleep, but his was not so peaceful. Almost instantly the nightmares came. A woman, a beautiful young woman he knew but one whose face he could not see, was calling to him, begging him to save her. There was blood, so much blood, and he ran through the darkened mansion wading through something blood to get to her. A dark, malevolent force overcame everything, stopping Knox from reaching the girl. He heard her screams cut off abruptly and knew he was too late. He sank to his knees. He felt a hand on his shoulder and looked up. His mother was smiling at him. Don't you know you'll never save them, she said softly. Everyone you love will die, my beloved son. I died, your father, your brother. Ariel. You'll always be alone. Knox awoke, gasping for air in a pool of his own sweat, the certainty of his dream mother's words screaming around his mind. Don't fall in love. Don't risk it. Don't let anyone else get hurt. Chapter 2 Odell Griffin G. lit another cigarette and stood out on the balcony of her bedroom. She hated this holiday and hated this party. And yet Roan of course wanted to support his best friend, Knox, and so now they were getting dressed to attend. Knox never had a dress code for the cocktail party, Odell would have feigned a headache otherwise. She looked back into the bedroom where Roan was dressing, his dark gray suit spectacular with his coloring, medium brown hair and bright blue eyes. Ripped to the max, his hard body and his huge prick made him a machine in bed. Roan St. Mark was, with the exception of Knox, the handsomest man in New Orleans, probably the state even, and he was hers. Odell might have been brought up in the upper echelons of New Orleans society, but she knew her brittle beauty would only last so long and that her cool, aloof nature wouldn't make her many friends. That's why she was staggered when Roan, known as the fun-loving one in his group of Harvard grad friends, made a play for her. He could have had anyone. Odell turned back to see the crowds on the streets of the city. New Orleans went crazy for Halloween parties everywhere, people haunting the streets and the locals playing up the myths and legends to sell more drink, food and tourist crap. The normally serene street where Odell and her cohorts lived were no different, pumpkins and jack-o'-lanterns, trees bedecked with twinkle lights and fake cobwebs, and Odell's least favorite thing, kids trick-or-treating at every house. Her doorbell rang, and although Odell knew her staff would answer it, she couldn't help an irritated, oh buzz off. Her voice carried down to the street, and she heard Roan's throaty laugh from behind her. Don't be scared, Deli. It's a rite of passage, trick-or-treating. Odell made a disgusted noise. I never did that. Roan smiled at her, sliding his arms around her waist. No, you were too busy casting spells and mixing potions. Odell studied him coolly. You think I'm a witch? 
Cute cheesy line from me about you casting a spell on me. No baby, I don't think you're a witch. You just have a warmth deficiency. He said it with a grin, and although Odell knew he meant it as a joke, it still stung. Because it's true, she told herself. What is wrong with me? Why can't I be more like Roan? Or Knox, whose heart was so big it actually scared Odell. Or even Amber, her frenemy, who had once had a thing with Roan. No, Odell told herself. Don't go there. Not tonight. She attempted a smile as Roan brushed his lips against hers. You're right. It's just one night. That's my girl. Roan looked her up and down in her tight black dress, and when his gaze met hers Odell saw the desire in his eyes. Knox won't mind if we're a little late. Odell smiled and turning, she bent over the balcony and hitched her skirt up to her waist. She heard Roan chuckle. Out here. What will the neighbors think? But then with a grunt she felt him from behind, his was massive. Odell closed her eyes, reveling in the feeling of him filling her so completely. Her hand drifted down and soon she was moaning and shivering, not caring who heard her. Roan was a brutal lover, especially when he came panting for air and cursing softly with release. He spun her around and ground his mouth down on hers. Gosh woman, you drive me crazy. Odell smiled and squeezed his diminishing prick in her hands. Do that to me once more, and then we can go to the party. And they began again. Livia and Morico helped Marcel and his sous chef Katerina, Kat, load the trays of canapes into the restaurant's van before Liv and Morico hopped in the back for the drive to the Renault mansion. Livia was trying to keep the trays from tipping and tying her thick mane up into a chignon at the same time, but the weight of it would not stay clipped. Morico grinned at her. Just pull it back. You'll never get it all up. I refuse to be beaten, Livia muttered. Eventually, Morico pushed Livia's hands out of the way. Let me. As Livia held the trays of food, Morico deftly worked Liv's hair into a messy bun at the nape of her neck. That's the best you're going to get, girl, so live with it. Livia tentatively patted it. You're a miracle worker. From now on, I'll pay you to be my hair wrangler. Morico laughed. You couldn't afford me. When they arrived at the mansion, they were stunned into silence. The old plantation home had been modernized to some extent. A plaque on the door detailed its history and its passage to the Renault family in the 1800s, wherein all slaves were freed and the plantation became a family homestead rather than a working freehold. The imposing white building with shuttered windows and soft light radiating from within was decorated with high-quality Halloween trimmings. Morico grinned at Livia as they passed a batch of expertly carved pumpkins. You think they got Michelangelo to do them? Livia rolled her eyes. The place screamed money and opulence, but Livia wasn't impressed. As they moved into the kitchen, she saw Marcel talking to a young man who was dressed in a dark navy sweater and jeans, and who Livia guessed was the owner's assistant. He had dark curls and the most intense and beautiful, green eyes she had ever seen. The stranger sensed her scrutiny and looked up. Their eyes met, and Livia felt a shudder of desire ripple through her. Gosh, if even the staff looked like supermodels here. She nudged Morico. Does Marcel want us to change now or after we've set up? After. Apparently, there's a dedicated room for us. Fancy. I know, right? Usually we have to squat in the back of the van to get ready. Livia snorted, and between them, they quickly arranged the canapes on the silver trays. When they had finished, Livia saw the handsome assistant had gone and Marcel was nodding at them. Lovely job. The food looks great. So, this thing kicks off in an hour but guests are starting to arrive, so we'll start with the welcome pumpkin spice sidecars first up. Think you can cope. No worries boss, Morco hugged Marcel who turned red with pleasure. We'll show these rich kids a good time. Wait, that sounded dirtier than I meant it to. Livia snorted with laughter as Morico shrugged. Come on then. Let's get dressed. A half hour later, Livia was regretting the tightness of her skirt. It had been her go-to throughout college, short, black, and figure-hugging even back then when she was ten pounds lighter. She'd dragged it out of her closet this morning, 
it had been the cleanest, most professional skirt she could find. I need to go shopping, she told herself as she plastered a smile on her face and made the rounds with a tray of drinks. The mansion's main ballroom, main ballroom, she'd muttered to an amused Morico. Because the other ballrooms are too small. Was decorated beautifully, even the cynical Livia had to admit. Twinkle lights draped the walls and soft music was playing as the guests milled around, talked and drank. Morico was making the first pass with a canapé tray, and Livia could tell her friend was gritting her teeth, fending off unwanted remarks and come-ons. Hey Livy. She heard Roan St. Mark's voice behind her and turned. She was actually relieved to see a friendly face, if the guests weren't turning their noses up at her presence or trying to talk her into bed, they looked through her as if she were invisible. Roan's smile was friendly. He indicated the man he was talking with, a tall dark-haired man with a neatly trimmed beard and dark brown eyes. San, this is my friend from my favorite restaurant. Livia, this is Sandor Carpentier, a good friend of mine. Sandor Carpentier had a warm, open smile as he shook Livia's hand. She grinned at them both, happy to see friendly faces at last. Can I get you fellas a refill? She waved the bottle of Krug she was holding and topped up their glasses. Boss tells me the good bourbon will be out soon, she said with a wink. If I know Knox it will be, Roan said and looked around. Speaking of whom, have you met our lord and master yet, Liv? She shook her head. But he would probably tell me to get back to work. Nice seeing you, Mr. St. Mark, Mr. Carpentier. Sandor, please, the man said, and Livia decided she liked his merry twinkling eyes. He didn't seem as aloof as the others. And if you knew Knox, you'd know that's unlikely. He'd probably insist you join us for a drink. Livia smiled and made her excuses. Despite what they said, she didn't want Marcel to get into trouble if she was caught fraternizing with the guests. She made her way back to the kitchen to refill her tray. Morico was just coming in from the garden. Hey boo, I just finished up my break and Marcel told me to let you grab one now that I'm done. There are a couple of good places to hide and take your shoes off out there. Livia smiled at her friend gratefully and headed out of the kitchen door into the lush gardens. It was darker down here than at the front of the mansion and she could see a fog coming in off the bayou at the end of the property. Livia thought it was much spookier befitting the Halloween vibe of the party, and yet more beautiful than any of the decorations inside. With a soft moan, she eased off her heels and wondered why she hadn't worn her usual flats. No, she knew why, she had wanted to make a good impression for Marcel. She knew she could pull off the cool professional vibe with her heels on, and at least it gave her a few extra inches when she needed to be seen. Still her feet pulsed with pain and when she put her hot soles on cool ground she sighed with relief. She crept barefoot into a little grove and seeing the edge of a stone seat headed for it. She stopped, seeing the other end was already occupied. Sorry, she said, then saw it was the assistant she'd shared a moment with earlier. He had changed out of his sweater and jeans and was now wearing what looked to be a very expensive black suit. Perks of the job, she suspected, but her attention was drawn by the way it fit his broad shoulders and slim figure so well. She meant to turn and go, but the sheer sadness in his eyes took her breath away. Are you okay? Her voice was soft and the man stared at her, his eyes intense before he half nodded, then shook his head. Not really, but common manners dictate I say I am. So. His voice was deep, a beautiful deep baritone that sent a shiver through her. Livia hesitated for a moment, then sat down next to him. Escaping from the melee? Me too. Just for a minute. She smiled at him, noticing again how gorgeous he was, except for that pain in his eyes. She wished she could take it away for him. Are you hiding from the muckety mocks? His mouth hitched up in a half smile. Kind of. She leaned forward conspiratorially. I won't tell, she whispered, and he laughed. It changed his whole face, turning it from brooding and slightly dangerous into a boyish, joyful thing. Right back at you. He looked at her name tag. Livia. Not oh Livia. She shook her head. No, just Livia. She shivered at the cool air coming up from the water. It really is beautiful here. He nodded, 
and seeing her trembling, he shrugged out of his jacket and put it around her shoulders. She felt her face get hot. Thank you. They gazed at each other for a long moment, and Livia felt tongue-tied. He smelled wonderful too, all clean linen and woodsy spice, and for a moment she found herself having to resist the urge to run her fingertips over his long, thick lashes. They were so black, they looked like he had eyeliner on. She swallowed hard, the desire to kiss this stranger overwhelming and bewildering. She cast around for something to say. I was thinking, that mist from the bayou must have known there was a Halloween party here tonight. Gosh, could she have sounded any dumber? She cursed herself but he smiled at her. I guess it must have known. I find it romantic. Dark and malevolent, perhaps. But also sensual. Livia could feel a pulse beating furiously between her legs, and was amazed. She hadn't had this reaction to a man in forever, or ever, if she was being honest. Electricity hung in the air between them. She had to dispel it, before she did something reckless. She had Marcel and Morico to think about here. She nudged him with her shoulder. Hey, you better get in there before all the food is gone. Honestly, they're like sharks, these people. Fins and everything. The food is really good too. I hope your boss agrees. Another smile, amused and sweet. I'm sure he does. He stood and offered his hand. Shall we sneak into the kitchen and grab something then? Trembling, she took his hand, the skin surprisingly soft and dry, and stood. Okay. But afterward, you have to tell me your name. Their bodies were really close now, and Livia could feel his body heat through her clothes. He trailed a finger across her cheekbone, and Livia shivered. She smiled but stepped away from him. I think we'd better get inside. As much as I'd like to make love to you right here, right now. His smile didn't change and he squeezed her hand. Of course. Knox? They both heard the female's voice from across the garden. Knox, where the hell are you? A thrill of panic went through Livia as her companion called out. Right here, Ams. Keep your shirt on. I should have known. Livia was frozen. Shoot. This was Knox Renault. He smiled down at her and put his finger over his lips for a second before his smile widened into a conspiratorial grin. I have to go. She nodded and shrugged out of his jacket. Here, you better have this back. I'm going inside now, anyway. He thanked her, taking the coat, and with a last regretful look towards her, disappeared back towards the direction of the shouting woman. Oh, damn, Livia hissed to herself. Way to be unprofessional. Catering 101, don't almost kiss the client. Her face flaming with embarrassment, she went back into the kitchen and managed to work the rest of the party while avoiding any contact with Knox Renault or his friends. Difficult, but not impossible. When it became clear the party was winding down, Livia hid out in the kitchen and dealt with the cleanup. Marcel was all smiles when he came to thank them both. Liv, you didn't need to do this, he said, looking in amazement at the stack of empty clean trays she was loading into the van. She grinned at him. No problem, boss. She made herself busy untying her apron. Did you get good feedback? Very good feedback. And a somewhat unexpected bonus, which you'll find in your paychecks. No, don't argue. Say what you want about the Renault family, but Knox is a very generous man. He also told me that I was his go-to caterer for the future, which isn't saying a lot because he rarely entertains guests, but it's still something. It is something. It's a big something. Morico kissed Marcel's cheek and he gave her a hug. Thanks, Maury. He also said he'd be recommending me to his friends and clients. Good guy. Geez, look at the time. Come on, kids, let's get out of here. I'll buy you both a late dinner. Later, at home in bed, Livia could not help but look up Knox Renault on the internet. She flicked through pages of photos of him, drinking in the shape of his face, the green eyes that looked just as sad in his childhood pictures as in every photo of him as an adult. She traced his face with her finger. In some pictures he had a beard, which made him look even more handsome, she thought. When she began to read about his history, the murder-suicide of his parents and brother, the mysterious death of his teenage sweetheart, 
the years of suspicion aimed at Knox himself, she learned he'd been thoroughly investigated after the death of Ariel Duplass. Knox was only 18 at the time and was the only suspect, but the police had completely exonerated him. The piece Livia was reading made it clear that his family's deaths had broken the handsome young man. Since his family tragedy and the subsequent investigation, Renault has kept a low profile. His luxury food importing business with friend Sandor Carpentier has made him a billionaire, but this has just served to draw more attention and comparisons to other tragic figures. Many locals refer to him as New Orleans' own Howard Hughes, a reclusive man with a myriad of secrets. Only once a year do we really get to see the man, at his annual benefit on Halloween, but it doesn't stop gossip magazines the world over wondering about the romantic life of this devastatingly and some say, dangerously, handsome young man. As he approaches 40, will Knox Renault ever break free of his past? Gosh, I hope so. The thought came unbidden to Livia as she slid her finger over his photograph. Not that it would have anything to do with her, but she had sensed something special in the man she had met, that he was more than just another handsome rich boy. There were hidden depths there, she was sure of it. When she went to sleep that night, she dreamed of Knox Renault and his beautiful green eyes, and of the moment his lips would press against hers. Chapter 3 Amber rolled her eyes as Knox sat down at the table. It was the French Quarter, with busy streets and lunchtime crowds, and the restaurant Amber had chosen was almost full. You're late again, Renault. Where's the Rolex I bought you last year? Knox sighed, kissing her cheek. You know I don't like to wear it out in public. It looks too ostentatious. Not that I'm not grateful for it, he added, seeing Amber's frown, it was a lovely gift. I just don't know if it's really me. Amber opened her mouth to argue, then gave up. Knox looked different and had seemed different, lighter, since the party. Amber had wondered if it was just the relief of getting it over and done with for another year but it had been a week since the party, and every time she had seen him, Knox had been happy. What's going on with you? she asked him now, and Knox, who was reading the menu, glanced up and smiled at her. What do you mean? I mean, you look different. You look lighter. I haven't lost weight, far from it. Amber rolled her eyes again. Knox was nowhere in the vicinity of overweight. I mean, emotionally. You seem to be carrying yourself more cheerfully than usual. Knox laughed, his green eyes twinkling. Do I? Fine, don't tell me then. Amber snatched the menu from him grumpily and sulked behind it. Knox smothered a grin. Ams, you ever have one of those moments in life, however fleeting, where someone or something just reminds you why you're alive? Someone who sets off a thought process that makes you reevaluate your entire existence. Is this your fancy way of saying you got laid? Amber felt a twinge of jealousy go through her and brushed it away. He doesn't belong to you, he never did. Knox shook his head. No, I haven't. No. I just had a moment with someone, a woman, at the party. I'd like to see her again, is all. Really? Amber ran through all of the party guests in her head, and Knox just smiled and shook his head. Who? Knox hesitated and smiled ruefully at her. Can I just have this secret for a little bit? I swear, the moment it becomes more than a moment, you'll be the first to know. Amber relaxed. Of course, honey. She reached over and squeezed his hand. I'm very happy for you. It's about time you got your pickle tickled. Knox burst out laughing and Amber joined in, her blue eyes amused. As they ordered their food, she studied her friend. They had known each other for more than half their lives. They'd been drawn together by Amber's twin, Ariel, who had come home from school one day and told her family that she had met the most beautiful boy in the world. She hadn't been wrong. Knox Renault was the kind of boy that sculptors made statues of. That strong jaw, those perfectly symmetrical features. Big green eyes. Sensual mouth. Gosh. More than once since Ariel's death, Amber had wondered if she and Knox would end up together, mostly out of convenience, but he'd never made an advance, and she had never found the courage. She had to admit, it hurt a little that Knox had finally shown interest in someone, and it wasn't her, 
but she could not begrudge her friend his happiness. Amber's own love life was complicated. She always kept two lovers at a time, but never let either near her heart. Her beauty, her wealth, her position in society, she didn't need a husband, which made her lethal to the women of New Orleans, who kept their husbands away from her. Little did they know, Amber wasn't interested in any of them. What she wanted was far more complex. Far more Knox-like, she told herself, than pushed the thought away. He would never be hers, and she would have to accept that. So, when are you going to make your move? She asked Knox, who blinked with nervousness. To her amazement, two spots of pink appeared on Knox's cheeks as he shrugged. I don't know. I've been working on getting the courage up to approach her. Amber almost spat her water out. Knox Renault, billionaire, drop-dead gorgeous businessman, was nervous about asking a girl on a date. Wow. I haven't seen you like this since. She trailed off and looked away. Ariel was always there, always between them. Amber swallowed the lump in her throat. Knox's smile had faded and he nodded. I never thought this day would come, Ams, and look, no one, no one will ever replace her. I know that, sweetie, but hopefully someone will mean just as much to you someday. His eyes danced in a way she hadn't seen for years. I hope so too, Ams. I really hope so too. Livia tried to stop thinking about Knox Renault as she practiced her scales up and down, using the plain rhythm to distract herself. In the weeks since she'd met him, her body had felt wired, her brain whirling. To have that much chemistry with someone she probably would never see again, it didn't seem right. She faltered in her playing, and then crashed her fingers down on the keyboard. Unless you're going for some kind of weird Stockhausen thing, a voice behind her said, I'm guessing you're having an off day. Livia turned to smile at her tutor. In the few months she had been at the college, her tutor, Charvi Sood, had become more than just a teacher to her. The two women had bonded over their love of jazz, of Monk Parker Davis, and to Charvi's delight, their mutual admiration for Judy Carmichael, the reason Livia had fallen in love with the genre. Listening to Carmichael's radio shows when she was living at home with her father, her headphones plugged in to dull the sound of her father shouting drunkenly at the television, she had used the genre as her way to transport herself out of the San Diego heat and here to New Orleans. Charvi put down the stack of scores she had in her hand and peered over her glasses at her young student. You okay? You've been in here practicing all week. You can rest, you know. It may be your master's degree, but rest is vital for brain power. Livia smiled at her. I know. I'm trying to distract myself from thinking about a boy. It's very annoying. Charvi laughed, shaking her head. It happens to the best of us. Want to share? Livia picked out a tune with her forefinger. It's embarrassing. He's way out of my league and... Let me stop you there, young lady. No one is out of your league. Livia sighed. It's Knox Renault. That stopped Charvi. Ah. Well, I would say the problem there isn't that you're out of his league, it's that he's Knox Renault. Livia looked at her friend curiously. You know him? I knew his mother. I've met Knox a few times. He's an enigma. At least if you believe the gossip. He has the saddest eyes I've ever seen, and he seemed so sweet. Lonely but sweet. Nice. Gosh, nice is such a bland thing to say, but he was friendly and warm and... You have an enormous crush on him. Livia shrugged. Yes, but it doesn't matter. It's not like we run in the same circles. Forget I said anything. Charvi smiled. Well now, let's channel that desire into your playing. Give me something slow and sensual. And make it up as you go along. Think about Mr. Renault and let your fingers move across the keyboard. At first Livia was embarrassed, feeling exposed, but as her fingers stroked the keys she began to find a melody. She closed her eyes and thought about the feeling of him trailing his finger across her cheek, the scent of his skin, the ocean green color of his eyes. She played a melody so sweet she wanted to cry, and when she finished and opened her eyes, she felt her face burn red. Wow, you have it bad, Charvi teased her and held up her phone. It needs work but there's something there. I've recorded it, and I'll email it to you. 
Your homework is to score it and mold it into a piece you can perform at the end of semester recital. Livia gaped at her. Are you kidding me? She felt panicky at revealing something so personal to an audience. But Charvi nodded. I'm deadly serious. That was the most connected I've ever seen you with your piano, Liv. She checked her watch. And I have a seminar. Work on it, Liv, and I swear you'll see what I mean. Left alone, Livia checked her laptop. Charvi had indeed emailed her the MP3, and as Liv played it back, she realized there was something there. She grabbed some blank score paper and began to write. Knox looked up as Sandor knocked on the door jam. Hey. Sandor grinned. You still working? Dude, it's Friday night. Let's go out and have drinks. Knox chuckled. I would, but I'm waiting on a call from Italy. Haven't you got a date? Sandor shrugged. She blew me off. I'm kind of relieved, to be honest. I'm getting too old to be dating a different pretty girl each week. My heart bleeds for you. So, I'm your consolation prize? Sandor grinned. Yup. Grab your cell phone and take the call on that. We're going drinking. Knox hesitated. All right, but let's go to the French Quarter. Wanna mix with the tourists? Come on then. An hour and two shots of bourbon later, Knox relaxed back into his seat and glanced around the bar. He hadn't told Sandor that the bar he'd chosen was across the street from Marcel Pessu's restaurant, or that ever since they'd gotten here, Knox had been looking for any sign of Livia. He hadn't had one night of peace since he'd met her. The feel of her soft skin, her huge chocolate brown eyes, the way her tawny hair fell in messy waves over her shoulders, it all haunted him. The faint flush of pink when he'd touched her face. He'd been so close to kissing her, which would have been entirely inappropriate. But gosh, the feelings he had thought he'd never feel again were whirling and thrashing through him like a storm. He had to see her again, to see if the connection between them hadn't been just that moment in time. To see if it was real, tangible, and something they could build on. Also, he really really needed to kiss her gorgeous pink mouth, it was driving him crazy. Knox? Buddy? Knox blinked back into the present. Sorry what? I was saying, I was talking to Roan at the party. He seems pretty keen on working with us on the Feldman project. Knox snorted and sipped his bourbon. What does Roan know about the luxury food trade? Nothing, but he does know about the shipping trade, Sandor gave Knox a reproachful look. Look, I know you think he's a playboy, but he's got a good head on his shoulders. Besides, he wants to buy his way in. What? He told me he wants us three to go into business together. He wants in on the company. For the first time that night, Knox stopped thinking about Livia, leaning forward to study his friend. How come he hasn't said anything to me? Sandor chuckled. Because he knows you think he's a playboy. He's your best friend but there's always been the Joker in the pack, and it's always been Roan. He was feeling me out in the hope I'd do the approach. So I am. I think it's something we should talk about. He wants to impress you, buddy, is all. Knox considered. I'm open to talking about it, certainly. Sandor smiled. So I can tell him yes. Talking about it, San. Nothing more at this stage. I love it when you get masterful. Another drink? Go for it. Knox leaned back his eyes flicking automatically to the restaurant on the other side of the street. He could see the pretty Asian girl who was working with Livia at his party, waiting on tables, but there was no sign of Livia. He thought about what Sandor had said. Roan was Knox's oldest friend but he was also someone who acted on impulse, he would best be described as reckless. Knox had worked too hard on the business, and not even his love for his friend could override the fact that Roan was not a good bet. Knox rubbed his eyes. Maybe he should loosen up, take a risk. Take a risk. His mind went back to the lovely girl he'd met at his party. Yes, he would take a risk. Enough of skulking like a creep across the street. Tomorrow, he would go to the restaurant and ask for her. If she wasn't there, he'd leave his number. If she was there. He was still smiling when Sandor returned with the drinks. 
It was after midnight when Livia left the practice rooms, and as she didn't have enough cash on her for a cab, she decided to walk home. When she got back to the French Quarter, she decided to go to the restaurant and see if Morico wanted company on her walk home. As she turned into an alley leading to Bourbon Street, she suddenly felt herself being jerked back, and a heavy arm locked around her throat. Shocked into action, she threw her elbows back with all her strength cussing and screaming at her attacker. Get off me! She slammed her fist back into the man's groin and he groaned, releasing her. Her anger at full flood and the adrenaline spiking in her system, Livia punched and kicked the mugger until, still groaning, he took off. Yelling, skank, at her as he ran, she unleashed a litany of curse words at him, beyond caring who heard her. Finally, she caught her breath and picked up her bag, turning to go to the restaurant. She stopped. Knox Renault was looking at her, astonished admiration in his eyes. Livia's breath caught in her throat. Well, he said finally, a grin slowly spreading across his face. Hello again. Chapter 4 I'm absolutely fine, Livia complained as Marcel fussed over her, making her drink the bourbon he offered. Knox Renault sat across from her, a small smile playing around his lips. It was as if they shared a secret now, and Livia couldn't help but grin. I heard you holler, Knox told her, and came to help but you'd pretty much wrecked the guy by the time I got there. Pretty badass, if you ask me. A girl's got to look after herself, Livia said. She couldn't stop looking at him, she hadn't imagined how gorgeous he was. Those green eyes, that dark hair and messy curls, they were all as beautiful as she remembered. The way he was looking at her sent thrills through her entire body. Marcel and Morico seemed to notice the charged atmosphere, and after making sure Livia really was okay after the shock of her mugging, they discreetly disappeared. The restaurant was closed now, only a couple of lamps still on, and in the gloom Knox took her hands in his. I haven't been able to stop thinking about you, he said honestly. I admit, my friend and I came to the quarter for drinks, and I deliberately chose the bar across the street from here. I hope to see you. Which friend? Sandor. You might have met him at the party. Livia nodded. I did. He seemed lovely. Knox smiled. He is. But as lovely as he is, I don't want to talk about Sandor. Liv, those few moments we spent together in the garden. I don't want to presume, but to me there was something there. I felt it too. She began to tremble, as he got out of his seat and stepped closer to her. He was so tall she felt tiny next to him. He pulled her out of her chair and slid his hands onto her waist, tentative, a question in his eyes. Is this okay? Livia nodded and Knox smiled. He bent his head and Livia felt, at last, his lips against hers. The first kiss was brief, hesitant. But it didn't stop at one and went on, becoming more passionate, his fingers tangling in her long hair pulling her closer. Livia could feel his heart beating in his chest as her own arms snaked around him, her hands feeling the taut muscles of his back. Kissing him was like taking a shot of pure heroin, she imagined. Heady, overwhelming, electric. His lips shaped themselves perfectly to hers, his tongue caressing massaging hers, his breathing ragged. Finally, desperate for air, they broke apart. Wow! Livia breathed. Wow! Knox brushed his fingertips across her face. Livia, may I please take you on a date? His words seemed so formal after that breathtaking kiss that she giggled. Knox grinned. I'm sorry, I'm out of practice. What I mean is, I would like to see you again. And again. And again. His words made her melt and she leaned into his embrace. She gazed up at him. I would like that too, Knox, very much. But, what will your family, your friends think? I'm just a waitress. Well, a grad student, but I'm clearly not of your social circle. Won't they think badly of me? I really don't care. There is no just a waitress or a student. Both of those things are honorable, genuine things. But who cares what our jobs are? You're Olivia, I'm Knox. The rest is just window dressing. Livia gave a soft moan of desire, and he tightened his arms around her. I'd just like to get to know you, Liv. We can work anything else out together. 
let's just try, that's all I ask. He walked her back to her apartment, but didn't ask to come in. He kissed her again, and it was just as spine tingling as their earlier kiss. She could feel the tension in his body, the way his huge hard on pressed against her belly when he held her tightly, but Knox Renault was clearly a gentleman. May I see you tomorrow? So proper, so polite. She nodded, grinning. Tomorrow is my day off, so yes. Then would you spend the day with me? I'd like that very much. Knox brushed his lips against hers, his hands gently cradling her face. Then shall we say 10 a.m.? Perfect. The kiss deepened, once again leaving Livia breathless. Knox smiled at her. Good night, lovely Liv. Good night, Knox. She felt bereft as she saw him walk away, turning to look at her once more before he turned the corner. His grin made her heart swell. For a moment or two, she stood out in the cool night, blinking. Did that actually just happen? She chuckled and went inside. As she opened the door to the apartment, Moriko, dressed in Hello Kitty pajamas, held up a bag of potato chips and said, You, on the couch, now. You're not going to bed, until you've told me everything. He had watched Knox and the girl, Livia, walk back to her apartment, following at a safe distance. They were obviously smitten with each other, and he guessed they must have met at the party. The party where she was a waitress, and Knox was the billionaire party host. He couldn't fault Knox on his taste. Livia was beautiful, all sumptuous curves and softness. But still a waitress. The scandal would be great indeed, especially amongst their cohorts, but that wasn't what was making him smile. No, it was the thought of Knox and Livia possibly falling deeply in love, so deeply in love that when she was taken from him, Knox would finally be destroyed. And that was all he had ever dreamed of. Chapter 5 Moriko was sitting on the bathroom cabinet, watching Livia apply her makeup. I cannot believe you didn't sleep with him. Livia rolled her eyes. Dude, we haven't even been on a date yet. Prude. Livia grinned. Moriko was a seize-the-moment kind of girl, Livia preferred the slow burn. Besides, if we'd had intercourse in the restaurant, health and human services would have been outraged. Gosh, just thinking about doing it with Knox was making her hot, but she brushed the thought aside before Moriko could pick up on it. Look, we're going on one date. Don't jump the gun. Where's he taking you? Livia sighed. We're taking each other. I don't know. We haven't discussed that yet. Too busy sucking face. Livia laughed aloud. Well do you blame me? Have you seen him? Now go away, I need to finish up here and you're distracting me. Morco hopped down grinning and tapped a closed drawer. Plenty of rubbers in there. Take a handful. Better safe than sorry. Livia pointed out at the door and grumbling but grinning, Morico left her alone. Livia shut the door behind her and sighed, leaning against it. Her whole body felt as if she were wired up to the national grid. If Knox even touched her once, she would jump him. Calm down, she muttered to herself. Still, when she'd finished getting ready, she grabbed some rubbers from the drawer and shoved them deep into her purse. Knox was five minutes early. Sorry, couldn't wait. Livia saw Morco make a crude gesture behind Knox's back and glared at her. Do excuse Morco, she was raised by wolves. All the best people are, Knox grinned at Livia's friend who smiled back at him. Look after her, she said. Later, lovers. She disappeared back into her bedroom, while Livia's face burned red. So, she said, trying not to look flustered in his presence, what's the plan? Well, last night your roommate told me you hadn't been in New Orleans for long, so I thought maybe we could take a steamboat trip. We could see the city and talk at the same time. What do you think? Livia smiled at him. I think that sounds perfect. The steamboat Natchez was full of tourists as it began to float down the Mississippi River, but neither Knox nor Olivia cared. They sat out on the deck, the weather still very warm despite it being November, breathing in the fresh air. Knox asked Livia about where she had come from. Southern California, so I'm used to hot weather, she grinned. It is different heat here, more humidity. Sultrier. 
New Orleans is a very sensual city. Knox laughed. If you say so. I'm Nola born and bred, but I have to admit, sometimes the heat during the day gets to me. So why did you leave SoCal? Livia looked away from his gaze. No family to speak of, and Morico was here. I managed to get a scholarship to the university, so that made it official. I haven't regretted it once. Especially now. They smiled at each other, and Knox leaned in to kiss her again. Livia, that night at the party. I haven't felt a connection like that in years. Really? She was delighted, then frowned. No, I mean really? Look at you, you could have anyone. I'm fussy, he said lightly with a grin, but she could see something behind his eyes. You don't give away a lot, do you? I mean, I could see the sadness in your eyes when we met. You can talk to me, you know. Knox's expression changed for a split second, fear, but he shook his head. I'm a firm believer in the past staying in the past. What I want now is for us to get to know each other. Is that something you'd like, Livy? She studied him, leaning on the railing of the steamboat. Charvi was right about you. You are an enigma. Charvi? Charvi sued. Knox's eyes lit up and Livia nodded. Yes, she knew your mother. I'll say. Charvi was my mom's best friend. He looked so excited, like a little boy. I had no idea she was back in New Orleans. She is. She's my tutor, my mentor, really. I'm sure she'd love to see you. Knox gave a short laugh. Why wouldn't she come to see me, herself? He frowned to himself, obviously deep in thought, and Livia wondered if she had made a mistake mentioning Charvi to him. Knox shook himself. Well, yes, I'd love to see her. He smiled at Livia. So, you're a master pianist? She laughed. Oh no, I'm really just a beginner, at least when you consider the scope of the craft. My focus is on jazz piano, for this program at least. But really, I love all classical music and rock and blues and on and on. I'm afraid my music knowledge extends as far as Pearl Jam and Tom Petty. That kind of music. I adore both, Livia encouraged him. For my undergraduate thesis, for the recital, I did a slowed-down piano version of Rearview Mirror. Anticipation is a marvelous thing, she said softly and Knox nodded. Oh, I agree. He grinned and swept her hair back over her shoulder stroking the back of his finger down her neck. Your skin is so soft. Tingling sensations were racing through her body at his touch. Gosh, I want you, she thought. But as she'd said, the anticipation of making love with this man was electrifying. Her eyes dropped to his groin, his heart on obvious in his denim jeans. She looked up at him from underneath her lashes. I wonder how long we can hold out. Knox grinned. Personally speaking, and to be blunt, I think it would be amazing to be inside you right now. But yes, let's keep this going until we don't have a choice. Why bow to society's pressure to rush into anything? Livia suddenly crushed her lips to his, sliding her hand over his groin and squeezing. Gosh, he was huge. Knox gave a moan. Gosh, Livy, try to make it easy on me, why don't you? She chuckled, loving that he'd used her nickname so soon. Listen, you have all the cards here, Mr. Billionaire. This, at least, is on my terms. Knox laughed, burying his face in her neck. You smell so good, it's intoxicating. She stroked his dark curls. How is it, I feel like I've known you forever. Knox sat up and studied her. She stroked the thick, dark eyelashes she had been dreaming about, and he leaned into her touch. I know, I feel that too. She grinned at him. Knox Renault, we're going to have a lot of fun together. And she meant it. She wanted to erase the haunted look in his eyes forever, even if this thing between them was only fleeting. The thought caused an unexpected shock of pain, already she felt so comfortable with him, they were so in tune with each other. A small voice inside her whispered, you don't know him yet, but she pushed it away. For now they would have fun, and that was enough. They spent a blissful two hours on the riverboat, and then took a cab back to the French Quarter, to an upscale burger joint, that Livia suggested. 
Knox didn't seem the type to turn his nose up at everyday fare and she was right, he practically swooned over the juicy burger, which was smothered in sautéed mushrooms and melted cheese. Livia grinned at him. It's good, right? Damn good. He took a swig from his bottle of beer and she grinned, picking a stray mushroom from his cheek. I like a man who enjoys his burgers. Knox muffled a belch in his fist and apologized. Livia chuckled. Excuse me, he said and she kissed his cheek. There was already such a change in him now, from when they had met. He was relaxed and laid back, and even the sadness in his eyes was less apparent. She couldn't believe it was because of her. Tell me more about yourself, Knox. Her smile faded a little, and she looked at him steadily. I'm so sorry about your family. There it was, the wariness in his eyes, and he looked away from her for a moment. I'm sorry, she said. I shouldn't have said anything. No, it's okay, he said. He wound his fingers through hers. I can't pretend it didn't happen, and I want to be honest with you from the start. Yeah, it was rough. That doesn't begin to cover it, but for now I'll just say, it took some getting over. Can you get over something like that? He shrugged. I don't know. Livia stroked the back of his hand with her finger. I think society places too much pressure on someone to get over things. Why? Why should we get over things? Can't we just acknowledge that the pain will always hurt like hell, no matter how much time has passed? We just go on, live our lives, pretending we're okay when we're not. She cupped his face in her hand, her eyes locked on his. That night in the garden you were so honest with me. I asked you if you were okay, and you said you weren't. Let's always be that honest with each other, whatever happens, wherever this goes. Deal. Knox's eyes were intense on hers. How old are you, Livia Chatelaine? Because you have the wisdom of someone much, much older. Yes, of course, deal. He leaned over and kissed her. We have so much to learn about each other, and I can't wait. One question. I'll be 40 in two years and you're what, 23, 24? 27. Does the age gap bother you? Livia shifted around and sat on his lap, not caring if the other diners were watching them. She hooked her arms around his neck and nuzzled his nose. You just said I was much older, she whispered to him. So what age gap? Knox slid his hand under her shirt and stroked her belly as she kissed him. The feel of his big fingers against her skin made her weak. Gosh I want you. She gave a small moan. Knox grinned wickedly. Anticipation, remember. She wriggled against his groin, feeling his prick harden almost instantly, and he groaned. You are a very bad girl, Livia Chatelaine. The moment I'm inside you can't come, excuse the pun, soon enough. She hopped off his lap and smirked. Anticipation. Devil woman. And they both laughed. Amber sighed as she saw Odell approaching her. It was late afternoon at the salon, and Amber had just had a blissful massage. The last thing she wanted was for Odell to ruin her buzz. The blonde woman smiled tentatively at her, but it didn't reach her eyes. That wasn't anything new with Odell. Always good to see you, Odell, Amber said smoothly and indicated the tea tray in front of her. Won't you join me? Odell nodded. Thank you. She sat and Amber poured her some herbal tea. Did you enjoy Knox's party this year? Amber was being facetious, she knew Odell hated public gatherings. Odell, despite her beauty, didn't mingle well with people and Amber had always wondered why. Odell's famed iciness aside, she rarely made the effort to get to know other people, almost as if she were protecting herself from something. Odell, Amber, Knox and Roan had known each other since they were teenagers, but still Amber felt as if she had never really known Odell. All she knew was that Roan had pursued the blonde woman, and that Odell had only ever opened up to Knox, who she regarded as an older brother. She studied Odell now. The other woman looked tired. Is everything okay with you, Odell? Of course. Roan and I are thinking of getting engaged. Amber tried not to spit out her tea. Really? She couldn't help the tone of cynicism that crept into her voice, but she regretted it when Odell flushed red with annoyance. 
Is it so hard to believe? No, of course not, I'm sorry. It's just Roan never mentioned it. Are you sure you want to be tied to, let's just say, to a man who can't keep it in his trousers? Odell's smile was bitter. You think I don't know about his other women, Amber? Of course I do. Maybe not all of them, but I have my suspicions. She looked hard at Amber, who met her gaze steadily. Then why would you marry him? Why not set your sights on someone else? Knox, for example. You adore him, and he thinks very highly of you. You think of our group as a revolving door of bed-hopping and casual hookups, Amber. Knox is my family. Roan may have his peccadillos but I assure you, it's me who he comes home to. Suddenly Amber realized why Odell had sought her out. She was warning her off. She wanted to marry Roan, Roan of all people, and was making sure that his friends knew he belonged to her. Amber gave a sad smile. Poor deluded Odell. I believe you. Amber casually sipped her tea, and they sat in silence for a while. When Odell left, Amber pulled out her cell phone. She listened to the buzz at the other end of the line, and when he answered, she didn't let him speak. Roan, just how long has Odell known about you and me? When did she find out we were messing around? Roan hung up the phone and rubbed his eyes. Damn. He and Amber had been so careful, but now Odell knew he'd broken her one rule. Don't shit where you sleep. I don't care about random hookups, she'd told him the night he'd first mentioned marriage. I do care about you messing around in our social circle. And he had been careless. Shit. Marrying Odell would secure his future, her father was richer than even Knox, and besides, he liked being with her. He liked seeing behind the icy facade. Screw it. Now he would have to lose all his other girls and make nice with Odell. He should never have started up with Amber again, Amber, who had nothing to lose by admitting their affair. And that was the allure of the redhead, she simply didn't give a crap about anyone. Except Knox of course. Roan couldn't help the jealousy he felt towards his friend sometimes, Knox was just so damned good it was infuriating. Roan sighed and grabbed his cell phone. He would forget the crap with the women in his life, and just focus on getting his shot together for the meeting with Knox and Sandor. He wanted in on their company. He was ready to grow up, and he needed to focus, because there was one glaring problem in Roan's otherwise perfect life. He was stone cold broke. Chapter 6 After eating, they had wandered the streets, enjoying the atmosphere. Later in the evening, they found themselves at the Spotted Cat, a jazz venue that was jumping with music and crammed with people. Livia and Knox found standing room by the bar and ordered drinks. Livia looked excited. I keep meaning to come here but never found the time. Knox grinned at her. Out of interest, how do you manage? I mean, I know you have the scholarship, but working at the cafe can't pay for everything. Actually, scratch that, it's none of my business. She laughed. It's okay. I get by. I've always had to fight for the basics, so it's become second nature. Sharing with Maury helps, and I don't need a lot. Thank God for the scholarship, though. Knox smiled at her openness. She really didn't care about money, and that was refreshing. He could imagine her happy with just a book and a sandwich, this wasn't a woman who needed diamonds and pearls. Of all the things he could give her, what she seemed to want was his time. He swept his hand into her hair and pulled her lips to his. You're gorgeous, he murmured against her lips, and I adore you. Livia chuckled. You barely know me, but I'll take that. You're not so bad yourself, rich boy. Her words were totally without reproach, and he felt her mouth curve up in a smile as he kissed her. A band was just setting up, and when they began to play, Knox slid his arms around Livia's waist and pulled her back against his chest. Livia leaned back into him, comfortable with the intimacy already. The band was wild fun, and Knox lost track of time in the sweltering heat, the drink, the heady feeling of this beautiful woman in his arms. More and more people were cramming into the space, and his arms tightened around Livia. She turned her head to smile at him, and something shifted in both of them as their eyes caught. He pressed his lips to hers and she turned in his arms, her own wrapping around him. 
they forgot about the club, the music, the other people. He gazed down at her and mouthed the words, come home with me. Livia's smile grew wide, and she nodded. Enough anticipation. Twenty minutes later, and they were in a cab back to his mansion. Knox couldn't stop kissing her, tasting her lips, sweet from the liquor, his fingers tangling in her glorious mane. He hardly remembered how they got to his bedroom, but then he was sliding her dress straps down her shoulders and taking one pink breast into his mouth. He heard her soft moan as she pulled his t-shirt over his head and he tumbled her onto the bed. Livia giggled as he blew a raspberry on her belly, then proceeded to tug the rest of her dress and her underwear off. Her fingers went to his zipper as he returned to kiss her mouth, and he felt a wave of pleasure as she freed his prick from his pants. Livia stroked him until it was so hard it was painful, but he resisted the temptation to plunge into her, and instead made his way down the bed until he could bury his face in her. His tongue lashed around her cherry, and she shuddered and trembled as she became even more aroused. Knox, she whispered as her cherry became swollen and sensitive, then he was back, kissing her mouth again. She looked up at him with huge brown eyes that were shining and sleepy with desire. Do you have a? He grinned. Of course, sweetheart. He reached over and opened the drawer in his nightstand and pulled out a rubber. Want to help me with it? She grinned and helped him roll it down. Big boy. She chuckled and yelped as he tickled her, but as he hitched her legs around his waist, she suddenly looked nervous. Are you okay? Knox was concerned, but she nodded. I'm so good, Knox. I just want to savor this moment. He grinned and slowly, his grin growing at her impatience, slid into her. Livia moaned softly. You feel so good, she whispered and smiled up at him as they began to find their rhythm. Knox kissed her throat then found her lips again. Her body was so soft, her breasts pillowy, and he admired the way her body undulated beneath him as they made love. As the intensity grew, their gazes locked and Knox began to thrust harder, faster, deeper, until Livia's back arched up and she cried out his name as she came. The sound of it tipped Knox over into his own peak, and he came hard, groaning her name. They collapsed back on the bed, laughing, panting for air. I guess we didn't hold out for so long, Livia laughed and rolled onto her side. Knox enjoyed the feel of her breasts pressed up against him, and looped an arm around her. Listen. I wanted to do that for at least a week, so we held out just fine. He laughed as she rolled her eyes. Okay, I'll let you have that one. She pressed her lips to his. Gosh, Knox, that was incredible. And only the start. He smoothed a hand down her side. You have the body of a goddess. She giggled. Thank you. Speaking of incredible bodies. She bit down on his nipple gently. I've been dreaming about this one non-stop all week. I even wrote some piano porn about you." Knox laughed loudly. Piano porn? I think I'm flattered, even if I'm not too sure what you mean. Livia grinned. It doesn't matter, I was just being silly. She kissed his chest then rested her chin on it. Nice digs you have here. She looked around the palatial bedroom for the first time, and Knox watched for her reaction. Actually, really nice. Knox watched her check out the navy painted walls, the fireplace stacked with wood. His bedroom could have come out of a Tommy Hilfiger ad. Livia sat up and nodded. I like your room. Classy, elegant, just like you. She grinned and ran her hand through his dark, messy curls. Usually elegant. She looked at him for a long moment, and he was surprised to see her color. What is it, Liv? She bit her lower lip, hesitant. Can I tell you something? Of course. He stroked his finger down her cheek. Anything. I've never, I mean I'm not a maiden but I never knew it could be like that. Intercourse, I mean. So exhilarating, so overwhelming. Knox was silent for a moment. Baby, are you telling me you've never had an orgasm? Yup. She was blushing furiously now. I've never let myself go like that. I honestly couldn't have cared less whether I lived or died at that moment, I felt so utterly blissed out. My whole body was. Gosh, I can't even describe it. Knox chuckled. Then I'm honored your first was with me. 
I promise to do my best to see you come like that every time. Livia smiled. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it means a lot to me. And it doesn't hurt, Mr. Renault, that you are gorgeous. Seriously, look at you, who wouldn't come? Ha ha, he brushed off her compliment, embarrassed. Liv, you know how you said you wanted honesty. That goes for when we're in bed too. If I do anything you don't like, tell me. And the same to you. Deal. She snuggled into his arms. So, what do you want to do now? Knox kissed her. I'm starving, actually. Want something to eat, and I'll give you a tour of the rest of the house. Livia stuck her tongue in her cheek. As long as you promise to show me every single ballroom in the place, I mean I've only seen the main ballroom and, OWW, OWW. Stop you maniac. Knox tickled her until she couldn't breathe from laughing, then they showered together and wandered down to his kitchen. This looks familiar. Livia grinned at him as she hopped up onto a seat at the breakfast bar. Is this your main kitchen or do you have eleven smaller ones for each meal? Funny girl, Nick leaned over to kiss her. No, just the one. It's big enough to feed all seventeen ballrooms though. Livia laughed. Can I help? Nope, let me feed you woman. Grilled cheese? Perfection. They chatted easily while he cooked, Livia admiring the way the muscles on his back flexed as he moved. He really was glorious. She adored the way his shaggy black curls fell around his head, the way his green eyes crinkled at the edges. She still couldn't quite believe she was there, that they had just made love, and that it had been even better than she had dreamed. It seemed somehow surreal, and yet to be with Knox was so natural. Livia studied him with unashamed lust, and when he caught her eye, he pushed the pan to the back of the stove and came to her. How, he murmured, brushing his lips against hers, am I supposed to concentrate on cooking while you look at me like that? He stepped closer and pulled her legs around him. She was wearing his dress shirt, way too big for her obviously, and he began to unbutton it, letting the fabric fall apart. He drew the pad of his thumb from her lips, down to her throat, between her chest and down to her navel, making her shiver with desire. You're so beautiful, Livy. Gosh this man. She pulled his lips back to hers then as they kissed he took of his jeans. Knox, grinning, took out a rubber from the back pocket. Always be prepared. She laughed and rolled it onto him before guiding him inside her, moaning as he filled her entirely. Gosh Knox. He thrust hard into her, supporting her with his strong arms as they made love. Livia bit his chest, kissing his neck and throat, before Knox ground his mouth down on hers. Livia! He reamed into her so hard she thought she might slip from her position, and a second later they tumbled to the floor. Livia straddled him, as they took each other to the edge of ecstasy all over again. Knox's fingers gripped her hips, pressing into the soft flesh as she rocked above him, taking him as deep as she could. Livia came once then Knox flipped her onto her back and began to ram his hips as hard as he could, his hands pinning hers to the cool tile floor. Livia urged him on. Finally, with a long moan he finished, shuddering and trembling, gasping for air. Gosh Livia, can we just do that all the time? No complaints here. She grinned at him as he laughed, kissing her tenderly. The grilled cheese was unsalvageable, so Knox made fresh sandwiches and they both ate as if they were starving. It's all the energy we used up, Livia said, nodding her head wisely and making him laugh. Don't mock. It's fact that making love uses up 4.6 megadons of kilojoule energy for every peak reached. You just made that up. All right I did but still. Lunatic. She stroked his face. You're gorgeous. He smirked. Oh I know. And he strutted around like a peacock, making her giggle. What was that? Mick Jagger crossed with a chicken. Knox gave up his comic strut. Buzzkill. Livia giggled. Gorgeous and funny. Knox Renault, how on earth haven't you been snatched up by some woman already? I mean, apart from that face of yours, you're the full package, aren't you? I don't get why you would ever be single. The smile cracked a little, faded, and Livia cursed herself. Shit. I'm sorry. 
Did I put my foot in it again? Knox was silent for a moment, gathering his thoughts. He played with her fingers as he tried to decide what to say. Liv, when I was a teenager there was someone. Ariel. We were inseparable, and we both knew it was inevitable that we would end up together. One night, I was getting ready to go pick her up for our senior prom. Amber, that's her twin sister, called the house in hysterics. Ariel was missing. A cloud passed over his handsome features and Livia took his hand, holding it tightly. He smiled at her gratefully before clearing his throat. They found her body the next day, laid on one of the tombstones in the cemetery. She'd been street, his voice broke and he looked away from her. Livia was horrified to see tears in his eyes. Stabbed to death. And not quickly either. Whoever murdered her took his time. Oh God no. Livia felt cold. Poor poor Ariel. The heartbreak on Knox's face was still obvious, even though two decades had passed. Knox looked at Livia now, his green eyes filled with pain. I never thought anyone could ever. Not replace I hate that word, and it's not true when you're talking about another human, but that I would meet someone who made my heart sore. I was wrong. Livia touched his face. I want to make you happy again, Knox Renault. He wrapped his arms around her. You already have, Livia. She kissed him, her heart pounding with sorrow for him. What will your friends think about me? I mean, I know you're still friends with Amber. Will she think I'm just a gold-digging interloper? No. Amber has always told me that she wants me to be happy. I think for both of us, we had no closure over Ariel's death because whoever killed her is still out there. I think you and Amber would be good friends. I certainly hope so. On my part I have no qualms, except perhaps the total chasm in our social situations. Knox shook his head. You shouldn't fixate on that. Really? I promise, she smiled up at him, but then her face turned solemn. I'm so sorry about Ariel. That's horrific. The police really had no clues. None. Ariel was the sweetest person. No one could have had a reason to harm her. Livia sighed. Sadly, there doesn't seem to be much reason to kill a woman. Some do it just for the thrill. Knox was silent for a while, but Livia felt his arms tighten around her. When I heard you scream that night, he said softly, when I saw it was you. That was just some dude trying to mug me, Knox. I dealt with it. Badass. You betcha. He kissed the top of her head. Okay, my little warrior woman. Let's go back to bed and keep each other up all night. Chapter 7 Livia's head was bent over her piano when she heard the commotion outside the practice room. She looked up as Charvi, followed by a couple of excited students, came into the room. Charvi looked stunned, overwhelmed, and shocked all at once. She nodded at Livia, and then the piano. You might want to sit down and play that old wreck one last time. Livia blinked, completely discombobulated. She had been working on her composition night, her piano porn, as she had told Knox, and had been so into it that the sudden interruption made her shake her head. What? Charvi smiled. Your boyfriend is a very generous man. She turned as the wide doors of the music room were opened, and a gang of workmen, huffing and puffing, wheeled in a vast trailer. Livia stood, as they maneuvered the covered item onto the floor. You can take this one out, Charvi ordered them, tapping the piano Livia was working from, save us the trouble. The foreman shrugged. Sure, no problem. Livia quickly grabbed her stuff from the rather battered but much-loved piano, even more confused. Charvi and her students grabbed the dust cloth on the new piano and pulled it off with a flourish. Livia couldn't help but gasp. Underneath the cloth sat the most beautiful instrument she'd ever seen. Charvi looked gleeful. You know what this is. Livia nodded her head weakly. It's a Steinway, a Model D concert Grand Steinway. Her legs were shaking. Knox had done this? It's Judy Carmichael's piano. Not hers personally, but her piano of choice. Charvi was watching her. That's right. And Knox donated not just one of these, but four. 
He's donated four of these babies to the university, plus countless other new instruments and a huge endowment. Livia was shocked to her core and also conflicted. She and Knox had only been dating for two weeks, and this was beyond generous. One of the other students was looking at her enviously. Damn, you must be good in bed. Tony. Charvi glared at the student. That's enough. Sorry. Livia shook her head. It's okay. Four Steinways, though. Charvi looked at the other students. Give us the room, will you? After they had gone, Charvi sat Livia down on the new piano stool. You look like you're about to collapse. Sit, breathe. I just. I mean, what? What does this mean? Charvi nodded, but she didn't smile. I think it means he's smitten. This is too much, Charvi. I mean, gosh, it's been two weeks. Not that I'm not happy for the university, but. She opened the lid of the piano and began to press down on the keys. Gosh, listen to that tone. She began to play her composition, listening to the deep bass of Swedish steel and copper wire, the treble so sweet and pure. She played through all she had written so far, twice, forgetting Charvi was in the room. Closing her eyes and moving her fingers over the smooth spruce keys, she lost herself in the composition. Livia thought not of the notes she had to play, but of Knox and of making love with him, the fun and laughter they had shared over the last few days. They had become almost inseparable in such a short time. She sighed and finished playing, opening her eyes. Charvi gave her a round of applause. That sister is coming along nicely. Livia grinned. My piano porn? Charvi laughed. I don't think we'll call it that in the program. Do you have another title? Livia flushed. Night. Charvi sighed. I guess it's no use now to ask you to be cautious with this man. Livia felt stung. Charvi, what is it? Why are you so nervous about my relationship with Knox Renault? Charvi rubbed her eyes. It's not Knox himself so much as it is the people who surround him. I worry about them affecting you. Livia snorted. Charvi, I can look after myself in that respect. Why is it, I think you're keeping something from me? Tell me straight, is Knox dangerous? Tell me now before I fall in love with him, because that is a very real possibility. Charvi looked upset, and as if she were about to say something, but then relented. Just be cautious around his friends. If Knox is anything like Gabriella, then I wish you two nothing but happiness. She was the best person I ever knew. Then he is like his mother, Livia said softly, trying to keep the tone of reproach out of her voice, and Charvi smiled apologetically. In that case, Charvi patted her shoulder. He might have donated the instruments, but you had already started to write that beautiful piece about him, and now you've given it his name. Have you invited him to the recital? Not yet, but I will. I just have to make sure it's perfect. You will. Livia looked at her watch. I have to go thank him. Thank him for all of us, would you? Obviously, the dean will be writing to him to express his gratitude, but from me, from the music department and faculty, say thank you. Livia hugged her teacher. I will. And you know, I think he'd love to see you again. Charvi's smile faded. I'm not sure I'm ready. Gabriella was like a sister to me. Her death still hurts and I. She sighed. I'm scared that if Knox has grown to look like his father too much, I might flip out on him and say all the terrible things I wanted to say to Tynan. So not yet please. Let me work my way up to it. Livia nodded, sadness making her chest hurt. One moment in time and so many lives had been wrecked. Of course. Let me just say. Knox is a wonderful man. You won't find a more generous or kind and open man. I believe you. I just need time is all. Roan stared at Knox who looked back steadily. After all that just no. Roan, you knew this was a long shot coming in here. If you need money, just ask, but we both know you're not cut out to be in this business. It's food importing. Roan threw his hands up in the air and stood up. 
Knox could see he was agitated and shot a glance at a silent Sandor. Sandor cleared his throat. Grown, it's purely from a business standpoint. We've made our reputation on no drama and no gossip by being above board and transparent on everything. And while you're a fantastic salesman, that's not who we are. He tried to lighten the mood. It would be like Freddie Mercury joining Coldplay or the Allman Brothers. Sigur Rose. Snoop Dogg joining the Spice Girls. You're scary, Spice. I'm not. Roan's mouth hitched up at one side as he tried not to smile. Don't make me laugh. I'm mad at you guys. We're just saying we're too staid for you, buddy. Rather, this company is. Look, you want to talk about setting up a new company doing something entirely different, something that will suit you and that we could invest in, go for it. Roan mollified sat back down. You'd consider a new company? Sure thing. Something where you'd be the lead and we would be silent partners. Roan chewed on his lip and Knox shot Sandor a meaningful look. Sandor nodded. Look, I have to make some calls. How about I come back for you in 20 minutes and we'll grab some lunch? Sure thing. When they were alone, Knox looked at his friend. Roan seemed to diminish somehow, stressed, not his usual buoyant self. What is it, Roan? There's something going on with you, something more than wanting a new career. Roan sighed and rubbed his face. Don't worry about it. I do worry about it. Knox frowned. Do you need money? Roan stayed silent. You just have to ask, Knox said in a quiet calm voice. Roan shook his head. Thank you man, but I have to find my own way out of this. Surely Odell's family. Knox trailed off as Roan laughed. Man, if I could keep it my pants maybe she wouldn't hate me right now. Damn Roan. That's what I do. Maybe I should start a male escort business. Knox ignored that remark. Odell knows. Yup. Who? Roan hesitated before looking at his friend. Amber. Knox rocked back. You're kidding. Nope. Geez, Roan, don't you know not to shish? Shit where you sleep. Yup. I'm that much of an idiot. Geez. Roan sighed. Look, I'll work on Odell, apologize, make it up to her. Marry her. Odell may be a strange fish, but she won't fall for any fake sentiments or actions. If you marry her, you had better damn mean it. Or you'll have me to answer to, as well as Odie. Knox was irritated, but Roan held up his hands. I hear you. He studied his friend. What about you? You made a move on the lovely Livia yet? Knox couldn't help his smile. That is going very very well thanks. She's adorable. You bringing her to Thanksgiving? You can you know. She can meet the gang. Knox smiled but didn't answer. Look, get together an idea for the kind of business you'd like to run and we'll talk more, make a business plan. There's a couple of empty offices here you can use as a base. Don't harass the female staff is all I ask. Would I? Yes. Roan laughed. I promise to be good. Thanks man. I appreciate this. Just take it seriously. This could be a turning point. Roan smiled at his friend. You know, you're an excellent big brother. Knox ignored the pain that shot through him, an excellent big brother just like Teague had been and hit it with a smile. Damn straight. And I will kick your butt if you mess this up. Roan stood and shook Knox's hand. I swear to you Knox, I won't let you down. Go tell that to Odell. I will. Thanks brother. Livia waited as the receptionist tried not to stare at her. She smiled at the young woman who flushed slightly. Sorry. Livia shrugged. It's okay. What's your name? Pia. Hey Pia, I'm Liv. I'm kind of seeing your boss. Pia smiled. She was young, early twenties Livia guessed, with big blue eyes and jet black hair. Gorgeous. I know. He's such a great guy, great boss too. Livia smiled and wondered if Pia had a crush on her boss. She couldn't blame her. The next minute, 
Livia realized Knox wasn't the object of Pia's affection when Sander came into the reception and handed her some notes. Pia flushed a deep scarlet, and Livia hid a smile. Sandor grinned at her. Hey Livy, great to see you. Does Knox know you're here? She shook her head. I told Pia I'd wait until he was free. Sandor threw a smile at Pia, which made the young woman light up. Nah, come on, it's only Roan who's in with him. Sandor led her back to Knox's office. As she walked with him, she nudged his shoulder. That girl has a king-size crush on you. Sandor rolled his eyes. I'm old enough to be her father, Liv. So. Sandor laughed. I'm not a cradle snatcher. Livia felt a little sting, after all, there were twelve years between her and Knox. Sandor saw her smile falter and guessed what she was thinking. Totally different situation, he said hurriedly. I'm forty-five, Pia is nineteen. Ah, okay, I get it. Don't tell Pia I told you. Sandor knocked at Knox's door, grinning. I won't. She's young, she'll find some young boy to fall in love with next week. He opened the door. Hey, Renault, found this little treasure in reception. Knox looked delighted to see her. Hey, beautiful, what a nice surprise. He came to greet her, kissing her on the mouth, lingering over it. Roan snickered. Get a room. Livia, blushing, giggled. Hey, Roan. I was just telling Knox here that we look forward to meeting you formally at Thanksgiving. Livia rocked back a little. Formally. Knox rolled his eyes. He means properly, all of us. We'll talk about it over lunch. Guys, do you mind if I take a rain check? Nope. Not at all. Livia took him back to her apartment. He walked around the tiny kitchen living space and nodded. I like it. It suits you. Yeah, this is welcoming, warm. And even better, it smells like you, all soft flowers and fresh air. Flushing, Livia was pleased. Her and Moriko's home was small but they both loved it, decorating it with colored scarves and art pieces and books. The couch was big and squashy, and Livia pushed Knox down on it before straddling him. So, Mr. Renault, before I feed you, there's a little matter of a huge thank you to be discussed. Knox, I cannot believe your generosity. Thank you, on behalf of the university, the faculty, the students, and the music department. I'm overwhelmed. I thought you might appreciate practicing on the same instrument as your heroine, he said shyly, and Livia kissed him, crushing her lips against his. You're perfect, she whispered and sat up, unbuttoning her dress one button at a time, slowing peeling it off. She was naked underneath, and Knox groaned, fixing his mouth on her nipple, sucking and teasing them both, until they were unbearably sensitive. Livia opened his shirt and his fly, running her hands over his taut muscles, his flat belly. Gosh, I want you so badly. With a growl, Knox tipped her to the floor, pressing her knees to her chest and taking her cherry into his mouth. Livia gasped at the sensations he sent flooding through her. I'm supposed to be thanking you, she gasped and felt the vibration from his laugh rumble through her body. You are, he said, his voice muffled. As he brought her to orgasm, she trembled and cried out his name. He moved up to kiss her mouth. When you call my name like that. Gosh, Livy. He kissed her deeply, passionately. Livia pulled away from his kiss and made her way down his body, trailing her tongue down his chest and his belly. Damn, Livy. She felt him jerk underneath her, and then his hands were under her shoulders, pulling her on top of him. He slid a rubber on, and she spread her legs wide for him as he went into her. She moaned softly as they began to move together, really, there was nothing like the way he felt inside her. They made love slowly, taking their time, their eyes never leaving the other's face. Livia had never felt a connection like this, had never experienced this intimacy so quickly with someone. She already knew the planes of his face, his mannerisms, the way his eyes would become more intense as they made love, as if she was the only thing he could see or wanted to see. When they were this close, she wished she could sink into him, become one with him. Her fingernails dug into his firm rounded buttocks now as he plunged into her again and again. I could die right now and be happy, she thought, and then pulled herself up. Really? Oh shit. 
She was falling in love with him. No, no, no. It was too quick, too soon. Calm down, she told herself, burying her face in his neck and kissing his throat. Just let it happen. Knox is the man for you, and you know it. I'm crazy about you, he whispered suddenly, and she nodded. And I you, you gorgeous man. She kissed him, feeling a surge of certainty before all other thoughts were swept away, and she was coming, riding her orgasm like a wave as Knox peaked with her. She wondered if she should tell him she was already on birth control. She was sensible though, they weren't yet at the stage where they could discuss that and she knew it. But gosh, to feel his skin against her, would that be something he would go for? Her brain was too endorphin-soaked to think straight right then. Knox's lips were against hers. Gosh, you're beautiful. He smoothed the hair away from her face. Chocolate eyes. She grinned. Ocean eyes. He laughed and kissed her. So, what were we talking about? Your incredible generosity. Knox, you didn't need to do that. Knox smiled good-naturedly. I know, and it wasn't a thank you gift, so don't think that. It was time I did something for the university, and now I had a focus. Was Charvy pleased? Livia nodded. She was. Good, I'm glad. I hope that we can meet soon. Livia wriggled into his arms. I did speak to her about that. Knox, she's not ready. She told me she still has so much anger towards your father that if she saw you, saw that you looked like him, she might have some kind of left brain hip check and freak out on you. Knox was silent for a while. Livia studied him, her brow furrowed. I hope I haven't upset you. No. But he sat up and rubbed his face. He picked his shirt up and started to put it on. I guess well. What? I guess I should tell you. Charvi and my mom, way before she was married to my dad, they were close. Very close. Lovers. Knox nodded. I was the only one who knew. My mom used to confide in me, and she always told me, although she never regretted marrying my dad and having Teague and me, that she hated being estranged from Charvi that she had loved her entirely. Why did your mom leave her? Knox gave her a sad smile. Family. Enough said. Gosh, the tragedy of it all. She stroked his face. Do you think that's why your father went crazy? He found out. I don't know Liv, I honestly don't. Dad was pretty open-minded, pretty progressive. I can't imagine he would freak out over something like that. Then again, I never imagined he could kill my mother and brother in cold blood. Livia shivered. My father was or is a drunk asshole, but he never laid a hand on me. I can't imagine what it must have been like for you. He kissed her forehead. That's the thing. He was a great dad. Really great. None of that machismo you are boys, so you must be tough, and women belong in the kitchen crap. I guess I'll never understand. Livia was quiet for a while. Why did the police believe he was guilty so easily, then? Why didn't they look into it further? He looked surprised. It was pretty cut and dried, sweetheart. They found Dad with a gun in his mouth, gunshot residue all over him. He could have been framed. Unlikely, according to the forensic team, but I appreciate you thinking well of him. He kissed her again. What about you? You don't talk about your family that much. She shrugged. Not much to tell. Only child, mom was amazing but cancer doesn't discriminate. If the world was fair it would have taken dad. Do you think you'll ever see him again? I doubt it. It's no loss, really. My family is here. Morico and I met first semester in college and have been roommates ever since. She checked her watch. Speaking of which, She's due home any minute so you might want to get dressed. Too late. The door was opening as Livia was speaking, and a grinning Morico strode in. Livia burst into giggles as she covered his groin with her body. Morico's high laughter rang out as she disappeared into her room. Let me know when you're somewhat decent, and I'll come out. A few minutes passed and Morico stuck her head out of the door. She looked disappointed. Oh. You're dressed. 
Give a girl a treat, why don't you? She winked at Knox, who grinned back. Livia shook her head. You are terrible. Look, we're going to order pizza and beer, want in? Hell, yes, if I'm not disturbing anything. Not at all. When the pizza arrived, Livia passed out cold beers, and they sat out on the tiny balcony that looked over the city. If you squint, Morico told Knox, you can see Bourbon Street from here. Knox looked in the direction of the famous street. Really? Squint harder, harder, now close your eyes and imagine Bourbon Street. Morico cackled at her joke, and Livia giggled, throwing a piece of pizza crust at her friend. Don't tease. No, no, Knox said, grinning, that's what best friends are supposed to do to the paramour. It is the law. Morico nodded wisely. You are wise, young Padawan. Livia coughed and it sounded suspiciously like geek. Morco smiled, cat-like. You may mock, Liv, but me and Wonder Toy here are bonding. Knox choked on his pizza, laughing, and Liv threw an apologetic look at him. Sorry, she's not house-trained yet. The three of them were having so much fun that Knox decided not to go back to work, and they spent the late afternoon and evening drinking and laughing. At 10 p.m., Morico got up. Well, it's been swell, guys. I'm Audi. Hot date? Tepid, but doable. Morico threw her denim jacket on. She winked at Knox. Good to meet you properly. Look after each other, kids. And she disappeared into the apartment. And keep those windows open. Yeah, it does, mumbled a decidedly drunk Livia with a satisfied grin. Knox laughed and hoisted her onto his lap. You're drunk. Yep. She kissed him. And you're beautiful. Take me to bed, Renault, and screw the brains right out of me. She shrieked as he stood and threw her over his shoulder, carried her into her bedroom, and proceeded to do exactly as she asked. Chapter 8 The Lavender One No, not that one. Does that look lavender to you? That one, yes. Morico was barking orders at Livia as she dressed for the Thanksgiving meal at Knox's home. The dinner with all his closest friends. All of them. And their girlfriends and boyfriends and oh gosh. Livia felt sick with nerves. She stepped into the dress Morico had directed her to, then shook her head. No. I don't feel right in it. What about the white one? I don't want to come off as a vestal maiden. And anyways, gravy stains. Thanksgiving dinner, remember? Morico sighed. Fair enough. So, we're looking for something that says, hey, don't mind me, I'm the good to go but not skanky girlfriend from the wrong side of the tracks. I've got it. Let's go find some knocked up from the thrift store pink dress, and Ducky can take you to the dance. What the hell are you talking about? Livia was feeling irritated now. She tried on several of her dresses, and was getting down to the last few she owned. Morico rolled her eyes. Pretty in pink, doofus. Morico, this is serious. Knox is picking me up in 15 minutes and I have nothing. Nothing. Geez, don't have a cow. Hang on. She disappeared and Livia heard her rifling through her wardrobe and frowned. Dude, there isn't a chance in hell I'll fit into anything of yours. While Livia was curvy, Morico was a size zero, so stealing each other's clothes had never been an option. Which probably saved many roommate arguments, Livia thought now. Quiet woman. Morico came back bearing a large box. I was saving this for your Christmas present, but I think you need it now. Open it. Livia's eyes widened when she saw the label on the box. Oh no, Mori, you can't afford this. Shut up and open it. Livia lifted the box lid and shifted the tissue paper. She gave a little gasp. She pulled out the mauve dress and held it up against her. Put it on, moron. Livia slid into it and turned to look at herself in the mirror. The neck came down in a V-shape, not too low but low enough to show off her long neck and décolletage. The color picked out all the gold highlights in her golden brown hair and complemented her large eyes and creamy skin. It hugged her curves and fell to just above her knee. Classy and elegant. Oh Maury, I can't believe this. Thank you so much. 
Moriko's eyes were soft. I knew as soon as I saw it, it was made for you. Wear your gold locket with it. Here, let me. She hooked the necklace over her friend's head. Lovely. And wear your hair up. Here. Once again, she took charge and a moment later, Livia's thick, dark golden hair was swept up into a chignon, with a few strands falling down to soften it. Some subtle gold eyeshadow and a slick rose-pink lipstick, and Livia couldn't believe the reflection in the mirror. Was that really her? You look incredible, said Moriko with a self-satisfied grin. Who's your mama? You are. Livia laughed and hugged her. Thank you, boo. Now, I hear a car door which means Knox as early as always. Have a lovely time and don't let anyone look down at you, you know. Do this for the sisterhood. Livia grinned. Looking like this? They wouldn't dare. She high-fived her friend as the doorbell rang. Livia was flattered by the expression on Knox's face. Wow, he said, his voice cracking. Wow, Liv. She flushed and kissed him, but seconds later Maury came out and stuck a post-it note just above his groin. Knox laughed as he read it. Livia Chatelaine, do not touch, squeeze, suck, bounce on this until after the dinner party, and you no longer need to look perfect. Do not ruin my masterpiece. Livia choked out a shocked snort as Knox howled with laughter. Morco grinned and closed the door behind her. Knox offered Liv his arm. Ready, beautiful? He watched the couples as they walked into Knox's huge, welcoming home, already dressed for the meal. The silver service staff moved silently around them with trays of champagne cocktails and a muse pouch. There were going to be twenty guests in all, mostly couples, but a few were flying solo. But all he was really interested in was his host and his beautiful, wrong side of the track's girlfriend. He shot an amused glance at some of the other women and wondered just how spiteful they were, how much they would look down their nose at her. That would be fun at least. All the while he would be watching the girl, seeing just how smitten Knox was with her. Gauging how devastated he would be by her inevitable demise. It would all come down to timing. Murder her too soon, and maybe Knox wouldn't be as crucified as he needed him to be. He gave another laugh. No, that sap Knox would always take these things hard, no matter how long he'd been messing with her. But he didn't want to rush this. He'd waited over twenty years to do this to his old friend again. Ariel had been easy, no one's guard had been up. He still remembered the look of shock, of horror on her lovely face as he'd plunged the knife into her. The look of confusion, of abject horror. He itched to see that again. The door opened, and Knox led Livia into the room. The beautiful couple immediately took the attention of the guests, and as Knox began to introduce Livia to his friends, the man who would soon be her killer watched her, the way she moved, the curve of her body, her full breasts, the sweet smile on her lush pink lips. He smiled. He would enjoy her murder as much as he would enjoy Knox's pain. And by the look on Knox's face, he was already in deep. Knox Renault is in love again. Who knew, he murmured to himself and went to join the party. Chapter 9 Rules of society mean we shouldn't be sitting next to each other at dinner, Knox said to her and grinned at her stricken face. Luckily, I've never been one for rules. She pinched his buttock hard and he laughed. You'll pay for that later, Renault. I do hope so. At last, Amber's here. Come on, you're guaranteed a warm welcome with her. Livia followed him over to where a stunning redhead stood talking to Sandor. Sandor winked at Livia, and she gave him a grateful look. Amber, too, smiled at them both. Well, damn last. Hi, Livia, it's great to meet you finally. You too. Livia cursed the fact that her voice shook with nerves, but this was Knox's best female friend, and she wanted to make a good impression. Amber was sensational. There wasn't another word for it. Tall, at least 5'11", her long cherry red hair fell in waves down her back, her makeup was perfect, and her hourglass figure was poured into a red dress that should have clashed with her hair but worked perfectly on Amber. Amber watched Livia size her up with a grin on her face. It's all artifice, darling. At the end of the night I'm in sweats, shoveling french fries down my throat and watching Netflix. I look like the swamp thing. 
Livia choked out a laugh. Somehow, I don't think so. Amber grinned. Let's leave these dudes and go have some girl talk somewhere. Uh oh. Was this the you hurt my friend and I'll hurt you talk? Well, Amber was entitled, Livia thought, but she couldn't help throwing a nervous glance back at Knox. He winked at her and mouthed, don't worry. Whatever she expected Amber to start out with, it wasn't, thank you. Livia's eyes widened. For what? For putting a smile back on my friend's face. It's been a long time coming. Here, she snagged two glasses of champagne and handed one to Livia, drink up. Let me give you some tips on how to survive this party. Believe me, it's nothing to be nervous about, just a crash course in who to avoid. Livia had just spotted Odell Griffin G walk in with Roan. Well, there's one I do know to avoid. Amber followed her gaze. Odell. Well, she's not the friendliest, but neither is she malevolent. Unlike Mavis Creek over there. She nodded to a squirrely-looking, rail-thin blonde who was making puppy eyes at Knox. Now, she has always had a thing for your man. Little does she know, we all call her Mavis Creep. Livia smothered a snort of laughter as the woman shot daggers at them both. Amber pointed out everyone to avoid, which thankfully wasn't too many. Knox invites them out of politeness. I would have kicked them to the curb a while ago, but then I'm not as nice as Knox. Livia grinned at her. Is anyone? Amber grinned. Oh, he has his dark side, the same as all of us. But, she said in a stage whisper as Knox approached them, his weird fetishes are something we should discuss another time. Remind me to tell you about the thing he had for, oh damn Knox, you're here and it was just about to get interesting. Sorry Liv, we'll have to talk about his peccadillos another time. Knox was grinning, clearly having heard her. Liv, don't listen to this one. Just go on pretending I'm perfect. Oh I will. Livia winked at Amber, who grinned and excused herself. Knox kissed Livia, his lips soft against hers. You okay, sweetheart? She smiled up at him as he slid his arms around her waist. I really am. I love Amber already. Good. Seriously, there's nothing to worry about. It may look elite but really, it is just Thanksgiving dinner. Knox's idea of just Thanksgiving dinner was a lot different than most people's, Livia thought, a half hour later as they sat down to eat. Three huge turkeys, perfectly roasted and ready to be carved by the waitstaff, sat on the sideboard. On the tables were huge silver platters of mashed potatoes, yams, bowls of cranberry sauce, sure, Livia thought, all the same food but you could tell how rich the food was. How it was expertly made by the best chefs money could buy, and when Livia put the first piece of moist, beautifully seasoned turkey in her mouth, she almost groaned with how delicious it was. The meal had its luxurious touches, shaved truffle on the turkey, a sharp sorbet between each course as a palate cleanser, but the whole atmosphere was just as Livia, who had never had a family Thanksgiving, had always imagined. There was love between these people, and she reveled in it. Halfway through the meal, which she had to admit she was enjoying with Knox on her left and Sandor on her right, she felt someone staring at her. She looked up and saw Odell gazing at her. Have we met? Odell's voice cut through the entire table's conversation, and Livia flushed red as everyone went silent and looked at her. Yes we have. Where? Livia was at my Halloween party, Knox said smoothly, but Livia heard an undercurrent in his voice. Was he embarrassed, or was he angry with Odell? She couldn't tell. Odell studied Livia. No, that's not it. Livia sighed. Just get it over with. I work at Le Chat Noir. Of course, there was a silence. The chef. This was from Mavis Creep. Creek, corrected Livia in her head. Amber was right, the woman was obsequious, she clearly knew Livia wasn't the chef. No, I wait tables. I bring you your egg white omelette, Odell. She couldn't read Odell's expression, the other woman simply nodded and turned back to her meal. Mavis Creek was sniggering to herself, nudging her partner, who rolled his eyes and tried to ignore her. Livia is a grad student at the university. She's earning her master's degree, Mavis, and working to pay her dues. The stuff of good character, wouldn't you say? 
Knox's voice was like ice and Mavis's smirk disappeared. I worked the graveyard shift at Home Depot during my college experience. My father wouldn't pay for my tuition unless I worked too, Sander piped up. I had to pay my own rent. Nothing wrong with working your way through. What are you studying, Liv? Amber jumped in now and Livia told her. Amber looked impressed. That's fantastic. We need to hear you play, I think. Roan joined in, and she smiled at them all gratefully. Knox had good taste in friends. They had deftly diffused the situation she had been most wary of, and with class and good humor. Knox took her hand and squeezed it, and Livia felt tears well up in her eyes. Gosh, she loved this man. Who cared if they'd known each other less than a month? She adored him. Sandor nudged her and she turned to smile at him. Sandor nodded at Knox. He's very smitten. It's truly great to see. Thank you, Sandor. I'm crazy about him. Really, truly crazy. I'm glad. He deserves happiness. Livia studied him. Sandor, with his dark brown hair cut short and neatly trimmed beard, was handsome, his eyes merry, his manner calm and friendly. What about you, Sandor? Anyone special? He grinned. Confirmed bachelor, Liv. I was married about ten years ago, but it didn't stick. Shame. She was a nice girl, but I'm not good at sharing my life, I'm afraid. I get it. Before I met Knox, I was all set for a life of singledom. Sandor looked skeptical and grinned. Have you seen yourself, Liv? That would never happen. She blushed but laughed. Because I can't take a compliment, I'm going to swiftly change the subject. Sandor laughed as she grinned. What about your family? Sandor nodded. Only child, mom died of cancer, dad has Alzheimer's. Some days he has full recall but mostly he's lost in time. Gosh, I'm sorry. Sandor nodded. It's okay. It's harder on me than him, but I can take it. He's usually locked back in a world where my mom is alive. Your parents. My mom had cancer too. She died when I was young and my dad, well, I think of him more as just the sperm donor. He's a mean drunk, and if I never see him again, it'll be too soon. Livia didn't know why she was sharing such intimate details with this man, she only knew that she had liked him from the first. He had a warm manner, open and friendly, and she could see why he was Knox's friend and business partner. You know how I met Knox. How about you? Sandor grinned. I was actually his brother Teague's college roommate. But here's the weird thing, my dad and Knox's dad were actually old friends, although they drifted apart. When Teague and I became friends, they reconnected for a while. Until the tragedy, of course. Livia nodded. Heartbreaking. Indeed. Still, I have to say, Knox looks happier than I've seen him in years, thanks to you. After dinner, some of the guests began to drift away until only Amber, Sandor, Roan, and Odell were left. Odell was looking antsy to leave, but Roan showed no sign of leaving. Amber sat sprawled across an armchair, her long legs crossed over the side of it, Sandor sat with Odell, his arm around her shoulders, friendly, comforting. Livia sat on Knox's lap, shoes kicked off now that the formal dinner was over with. She ruffled Knox's curls and he grinned at her. She tickled his beard and rubbed her nose against his. Did you have a good time, baby? She nodded. I really did. She lowered her voice. I love your friends. I mean most of them. She grinned as he laughed. I have to say, I had preconceived opinions and I was wrong. For the most part. Knox nodded subtly at Odell. She means no harm really. I get it. He stroked her cheek with his finger. Will you stay tonight? She leaned into him. You know I will. As the others left after midnight, all vaguely drunk except Odell, Roan hugged Knox and swung a giggling Livia around. You, my little pocket rocket, have made my friend smile. Adore you. She was still giggling when she and Knox walked back into the mansion. It was so quiet, and Livia looked back out of the window. The spooky fog is back. Knox joined her at the window, running a hand down her back. They stared out at the mist coming off the bayou. It's late November. 
Knox turned and trailed his lips down her neck. Do you think it's too late for a little, Alfresco? Livia began to smile, turning to pull his lips to hers. If I ruin this dress, Morico will actually kill me. Literally, not figuratively. Then you'd better take it off in here, woman, because there's no way we're not going out into that garden and making love in five, four. Livia shrieked with laughter as he advanced, and she quickly peeled the dress over her head. Knox tugged his own shirt off and then hauled her over his shoulder. Livia beat a drumbeat on his buttocks as he carried her out into the garden, and when he laid her in the damp grass, she grinned up at him. You are a doofus. A doofus that's going to make you come again, and again, and again. Soon they were naked and clawing at each other. The mist drifting up from the bayou was chilly, and they both shivered, their skin damp with sweat as they made love. Afterwards, they lay wrapped around each other. Livia kissed his mouth. You make everything so magical, baby. You know what I'd love to do. What's that? Remember that little grove where we met? They walked slowly, holding their clothes until they slipped into the secluded little grove. Livia walked to the stone seat and patted it. Come sit with me. Knox sat, his face confused, and Livia smiled, placing her palm on his cheek. When I first saw you here, I thought you were the saddest person I had ever seen. And something in me wanted to take that pain away. Knox leaned his forehead against hers. You have. I hope at least I've begun to. You deserve every happiness, Knox. Every single moment of your life should be full of joy. It is when I'm with you. She kissed him. Remember that night? I was so sure you were going to kiss me and when Amber called your name. Gosh, I was so disappointed. I've always wondered if I imagined that moment. Knox shook his head. You didn't. He grinned slightly. I wanted to do a lot more than kiss you. She laughed. Well, I wanted that too. So, let's make good on that wish right now. She had barely finished her sentence when he crushed his lips against hers. God help me, Livia Chatelaine, he said when they were both breathless, but I think I'm falling in love with you. Livia felt a surge of joy. I love you, Knox Renault. I don't give a shit if it's only been a few weeks. I love you. They were so wrapped up in each other as they began to make love again, that they never saw the man slip quietly from the corner of the grove into the darkness. He watched them make love, their love for each other obvious and palpable. They made a beautiful, ethereal couple, pale skin in the moonlight, their gasps and sighs and moans of pleasure the only sound in the night. Enjoy her, Knox. Enjoy her for as long as you can. He couldn't tear his eyes away from Livia's lush body. At dinner he had studied her, those huge, warm brown eyes, the way she had dealt with the sniping of Mavis Creek. Those pink full lips curving up in a smile. Yes. He imagined it would be very easy to fall in love with Livia Chatelaine. He would pay more attention to her, her life, her friends, it would be interesting to mess with her head too, before she became his victim. In the meantime, Knox? He would make his old friend think he might be losing his mind. That was next, and he knew just how to do it. He looked back at the couple crying out as they came and smiled. Yes, enjoy the beautiful Livia while you can, Knox. Because sooner rather than later, before the winter is out, before the last of the pine needles has fallen from the Christmas trees, she'll be dead. And you, Knox, you will be rotting away in a jail cell, charged with the depraved, brutal, bloody murder of the woman you love. Chapter 10 Odell stared at Roan for a long moment, and then reached into her purse for a cigarette. Roan waited, his heart thumping against his ribs. Odell lit her cigarette and studied him. Why? Roan's mouth hitched up in a smile. Why else do people get married? I want to be your husband, of course. Odell didn't smile. Roan, I think we both know this isn't a love match. Why else would you be messing with other women if it was? She had a point, and Roan nodded. I admit, I have been. I'm immature, Odell, and that's not an excuse. I can change. Odell gave a snort of laughter. Be honest, Roan. I marry you, you get my father's money, and you'll be back to your old ways within a year. 
She sighed. I deserve better. I deserve what your friend and that waitress have. Did you see the way they were looking at each other? We used to look at each other like that. No, we never looked at each like that. Roan sat back in his chair. So you're saying no? Odell half smiled. I didn't say that. I'm saying I'll think about it. Prove to me you can stay faithful. Do this. I'll give you one week to finish whatever you've started with your skanks. One week's grace. The hell with them and tell them goodbye. Do that, and I'll agree to an engagement. Roan nodded. Fine. He got up and went to her, trailing the back of his fingers down her porcelain cheek. Odell, we can make this work. I'm sorry I've made you feel. She looked at him steadily. Second best. He shook his head. You were never that. Then never make me feel that way again, Roan, or you won't know what's hit you. Agreed. He nodded, his blue eyes serious for once. Agreed. Livia grinned at Knox's text message as she pushed her way into her music room. Good to know you're on your way to practice your fingering. I hope to do the same later. I love you, X. She giggled. Since Thanksgiving and their declaration of love, their relationship had become even more fun, and definitely dirtier. They did it in practically every room of his mansion, except for those two rooms he kept locked. She never mentioned them, guessing it was where his family had died. She did wonder why he had continued living there after the deaths. She would ask Sandor or Amber if she could. Both of them had quickly become her confidants, and Livia was delighted that Knox's friends had accepted her so readily. Tonight it was her friend's turn to meet Knox, Marcel and Morico, plus another couple of staff from the restaurant, and now Livia was hoping to persuade Charvi to come too. The music room was empty, as she dumped her stuff on the floor and sat down at the Steinway. She ran her hand over the smooth surface of the piano, wondering again at Knox's generosity. She closed her eyes and thought back to this morning, to waking up in his bed, his mouth on her belly, and finally his tongue lashing around her cherry until she finished. Livia sighed. Her body still ached from the night before, they'd made love all evening and most of the night until they were exhausted, and now her cherry ached from the pounding of Knox's huge tool. He owned her body when they made love, and she loved it. Hey. Livia opened her eyes to see Charvi frowning at her. Do you feel better? Livia was confused. Huh. You said you were sick and wouldn't be in today. Livia shook her head. Not me. You didn't call the admin office? No. Charvi shrugged. They must have gotten the names mixed up. Damn it, then the room is double booked. Oh. Livia was disappointed. No matter, I'll come back later. Shoot no scratch that. I promised Marcel a couple of hours at the restaurant. Well, it doesn't matter. Sorry, honey. Can't be helped. Livia started to pick her things back up. Charvi smiled apologetically at her. Hasn't Knox bought you a Steinway for home use yet? Livia grinned. Where the hell would I put it? And no. It's one thing for him to spend that money on the music department, quite another to spend it on a personal gift. He doesn't have a piano at the mansion. Livia shook his head. You know, I never even considered that, but no. Huh. Livia's eyebrows shot up. Why? You don't know. Charvi pulled out her iPad and flicked to a page on the internet. She handed it to Livia. It was a page from the archives of The Advocate, the newspaper of New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Lafayette. The story was dated 25 years previously. Local boy wins prestigious music award. The son of New Orleans society maven Gabriella Renault has been awarded top prize for his solo composition, Lux, at the New Orleans Children's Music Awards. Twelve-year-old Knox Renault wrote and performed the piece on the cello to an audience of local luminaries at the Lafayette Emporium Music Theater. Also rumored to be listening to the young prodigy, were members of the illustrious Peabody Institute. Sources close to the Renault family, whose patriarch, Tynan Renault, 
is one of Louisiana's richest philanthropists, say that the family is encouraging the young man to seek a future in music. Knox's elder brother Teague is currently being fated by Harvard and Brown, and the family has a long history of academic excellence. Livia looked up at Charvey. I had no idea. Why wouldn't he mention it? I don't know. But I'm guessing since he and his mother, she was a pianist like you, used to play together, it's too painful. Oh. Livia felt a little sick. And here I am, rattling on about. Gosh. Hey no, don't do that. If I know Knox this is like a lifeline. Not that he's using you to remember his mother, but through you, he can get something of her back, you know? I'm sure it's entirely separate from how he feels about you. Livia half smiled. We're having dinner with Morico and Marcel and a couple of others tonight. Come. He'd love to see you. Charvi hesitated, but Livia could see there was a small desire in her to see her lover's son. Please, Livia said softly. Charvi smiled. All right. Just tell me where and when. Livia grinned and hugged her. It will be wonderful, I promise. Charvi nodded. Look, the next student isn't due for ten minutes. Have a quick practice before you go. I will, thanks. When she was alone, Livia couldn't stop thinking about Knox. He was a cello player? She wondered what his composition had been like. She could picture him, his dark curls messy, hanging in his face as he bent over his cello, the intensity of his green eyes as he played. She could see him as an adult, taking the applause of his audience, looking devastatingly handsome in a suit as he played. She had to get him to open up to her. She was still smiling as she opened the lid of the piano. An envelope slid out into the floor, and as she bent to pick it up, she realized it was addressed to her. She didn't recognize the handwriting and assumed it was some college communication. She ripped open the envelope. Ice shot through her. Break it off with Knox or I'll make your life hell skank. Livia couldn't help the gasp of hurt that escaped her lips. What the heck? She glanced at the envelope and then shook herself. Are you really looking for a return address? It was so vile, so hurtful for a moment that she couldn't breathe. Then adrenaline shot through her, a flash of anger. Who the hell would send such a spiteful note? Whoever you are, she said to herself grimly, you can just go to hell. She crumpled the note and shoved it into her coat pocket. She had a pretty good idea of the one person it might be. Mavis Creep. Livia grabbed her stuff and began to walk from the college to the local bus stop. She smiled grimly to herself. Well, Mavis, just for that, I'm going to ride Knox longer and harder than I ever have tonight. What do you think of that? She wished she could say it to the other woman's face. She was so wrapped up in her thoughts that Livia never saw the man following her. He rode the bus with her back to the French Quarter and followed her to La Chat Noir. He watched her interact with her friends, the cute Asian girl, the darkly handsome Frenchman who clearly owned the restaurant. Close friends of hers, obviously. Good, that was good. It meant she was vulnerable. When her shift finished, he followed her home. Was she alone now? He imagined the fun he could have if he surprised her alone. But a quick thrill kill wasn't his plan for her. This was the long game. The note would have unsettled her but not scared her. Probably just made her angry. It begins. He was going to enjoy this. Chapter 11 Knox felt something shift inside him as he saw Charvi arrive at the restaurant. His hand tightened reflexively on Livia's and she smiled up at him. It's okay baby, she whispered and kissed his cheek. He stood to greet his mother's old lover. Charvi looked nervous too as he kissed her cheek. You look just like her, Charvi said, her voice trembling. For a moment, they stared at each other. Then as a tear dropped down Charvi's cheek, they fell into each other's arms. I miss her, was all she said and Knox, overcome with emotion, nodded. I know. I know. They sat down, Knox noticing Livia quickly brushing a tear away from her eyes. He kissed her. Thank you, he murmured into her ear and she smiled. 
I love you, she said, sweeping a loose curl away from his forehead. After that, the tension had all but gone from the small party. Marcel and Knox chatted about business, Charvi, Morocco, and Livia about nothing in particular. Easy, fun. The restaurant they had chosen was spectacular. Knox liked Livia's small group of friends, they were funny, erudite, down-to-earth, just like Liv. She was sitting in the curve of his arm, her body next to his, as she ate and laughed with them all. He buried his face in her hair and breathed her in as she talked to her friends, but he felt her hand on his thigh. Gosh, he loved this woman. His cell phone bleeped and he glanced at it. His throat constricted and he stiffened. Ariel. A photograph of her, laughing and smiling, her dark hair backlit by the sun. He frowned. Who the hell was sending him this now? There was no return phone number. Another text came through. This time, it was a crime scene photo, one he had seen so many times it was seared through his brain. Ariel, dressed in a gray gown, lying on top of one of the tombs in the Lafayette Cemetery, her blood soaking both her gown and the white marble tomb she was laid upon. She looked like she had been sacrificed to some dark god. The blade of the dagger was still buried deep in her belly, her eyes were open and her mouth locked forever in a scream of terror and pain. Knox felt a wave of nausea. Excuse me, he muttered and got up to go to the restroom. He made it just before he threw up. Someone was playing a sick game sending him those photographs. But this wasn't the first time. After his family had died, friends of Ariel's had sent him the photographs then, taunting him, making it clear they thought he was a killer. It had gotten so bad that in his lowest points, he had even asked himself if he had done it, even though, rationally, he knew it was impossible. The police had questioned him for hours, days, after both tragedies, and had released him without any charge or any caution. Knox knew he was innocent, but it didn't stop him from feeling the weight of responsibility. He went back out to the group. Livia looked at him, concern in her warm brown eyes. You okay? He smiled at her. Perfectly, baby. Sorry, just felt a little queasy for a second. Probably just a kickback from being nervous earlier. Livia slid her arm around his waist and kissed him tenderly. I think it went very well, she said in a low voice, a subtle nod to Charvi. Knox nodded. Thanks to you. Livia shook her head. You would have found each other again, with or without me. Knox brushed his lips against hers. I never want to be without you again. You never will. After dinner, they said their goodbyes. Knox and Charvi had a moment alone together. Your mother would have been so proud of the man you've become, Knox. And she would have adored Livia. You two are made for each other. Knox smiled at her. I think so too. You promise you'll take care of my girl. With all my heart. Livia came back to stay with Knox again. As they walked into his bedroom, he smiled at her. Liv, you know you could move in here with me. Livia was silent for a while, and then she sat on the bed. Is it too soon? Knox felt a little stung, but he could see where she was coming from. I honestly don't know. But I do know I'd like it, very much. She half smiled at him. I would too but I don't want to leave Morocco in a difficult position. We can barely afford our apartment between the two of us, and before you make any grand gestures, hear me out. We both needed to do it. We both needed to prove we could, can, make it on our own. Knox, you know that that fact that you're rich has never bothered me, I'm not interested in your money, it's you I want. But neither am I naive. I still stay here with you, eat your food, travel with you. But it is important to me, that I keep in touch with my base. I make my own money, I pay my own way. I have no earthly idea if I'll ever be on the same financial footing as you, as a musician, probably not, she laughed. But I have to have a balance. I won't be that woman, you know. Knox crushed his lips against hers. Do you know you're my heroine? With an E or without? She grinned and he laughed. Both. Definitely both. And yeah, I get it. Can we compromise? How so? At least bring some stuff over here, take space in my closet so that when you're not here. 
You can dress up as me. Livia was grinning widely now, and Knox burst out laughing. Dang it, woman, you see right through me. I can see it now. I get a text message, I'm at home, dressed as you. Bring chocolate syrup and a riding crop. Kinky. Knox wrestled her back onto the bed. You want kinky, I can get kinky, woman. He noticed her breath quicken, excitement in her eyes. Oh, you like the idea of that, huh? She nodded, her pink lips parted. So what is your kink, Miss Chatelaine? He pushed up her dress and buried his face in her soft belly, and Livia chuckled. Well that's nice for a start. Nice but not very kinky, Knox mumbled, rimming her with his tongue. He felt her shiver with pleasure. You know, I honestly never thought about it, but there's very little I won't try with you, Mr. Renault. Knox groaned. Gosh, Liv. He unbuttoned her dress and shimmied her panties down her long legs. Every inch of you is heaven. What do you like, Knox? Tell me and I'll do it. All I can think about right now is your creamy skin and the fact that I need to be inside you. She giggled and he moved up her body. Livia unbuttoned his shirt and fly as he kissed her, then she waved his tie at him. Want to tie me up, bad boy? Knox's eyes lit up. Good idea. He wrapped the tie around her wrists, pulling them above her head. Ha, now you're really at my mercy. He nibbled at her ear as she giggled and writhed beneath him. What do you like, Knox, really? I'll do it, whatever it is, you can spank me, whip me, anything. I'm yours. What you do to me, Miss Chatelaine? He looked into her eyes. May I please lay you on her belly and take you from behind? He turned her over, and Livia felt him part her legs gently. Knox bunched her hair up in his fist as he thrust, pulling her head back and up so he could kiss her mouth. Take me Knox harder, harder. She was gasping. Knox finished inside for the first time. Livia sighed happily as she basked in her own peak. Knox? Knox's mouth was on the back of her neck, kissing, biting her skin in his frenzy for her. Yes, my darling? She turned to look him in the eye. Knox. Take me hard. He gave a growl of desire and sliding a rubber in, he took her just as she'd asked. Easing into her perfect round bottom, they made love again. Livia gave a long cry as she finished, it was mellower peak but just as thrilling. Tearing the rubber off, Knox rolled off of her, flipping her onto her back and freeing her hands. She grabbed his curls and pulled hard, making him grin. Gosh woman, you are a little animal. Livia kissed him, biting his lower lip, wanting to absorb him into her soul. Make me yours again and again. Knox gathered her to him, rolling them both to the floor, where he pressed her legs up to her chest and sat back, admiring her body. You have the most perfect little cherry, Miss Chatelaine. Why don't you feel for yourself while I watch? I want to fill you, baby. Do it, she urged, her eyes almost feral with desire. Take me like you want to hurt me. And he did, slamming his hips into her, pinning her hands to the floor, kissing her until they were both exhausted. Afterward, they showered together. He carried her to the bed after they'd dried and lay down. Livia stroked his face. I don't know a lot about bondage, she said, but I think it's exciting to find out. Have you ever done that with someone before? Knox shook his head. I haven't, but like you said, I'm excited about the thought of doing it with you. We can take it slowly, find out what we like. We can even get some toys if you'd like. I would like. Livia grinned at him. I like the thought of wearing the leather gear for you, you restraining me as you take me. Dominating me. Damn woman. You're not going to let me have any sleep tonight, are you? Livia laughed, rolling him onto his back and straddling him, guiding him. She gave a shuddering moan as she impaled herself on him. I honestly could stay like this forever, talk dirty to me, Knox. Tell me what you like. He cupped her breasts as they jiggled with her motion. I like your beautiful breast, he said, so pillowy and plump. I sometimes think of them when I'm at work, just imagining putting my mouth on each one of them and sucking them until you scream. Gosh, Knox, yes, that's the stuff. I imagine pressing you up against a cold stone wall someplace public 
and just taking you until people wonder what the screaming is. Or clearing off a table in the restaurant and ripping that cute little waitress dress off in front of all those people. Watching them admire your perfect body. Livia cried out, so turned on by his talk but Knox was enjoying himself. I want to take you, like an animal, Livia. I always dream that you've forgotten your underwear, just so that I can take you at any time, anywhere I want. I'm yours, Knox, for always, for always. Gosh, I love you, Livia Chatelaine. And she bent down to kiss him again, and there was no more talking for the rest of the night. Roan looked at the girl sitting in the passenger seat of his car and tried to smile. I'm sorry about this. Gosh, why had he picked such a young one? Someone who didn't know the game. Instead, there were tears in her big blue eyes, and he hated that it was he who had put them there. Pia, I'm sorry. It's my fault, I should never have picked you up that day. He tipped her chin to his. Listen, you're beautiful. There's probably already a queue of people who would love to be with you, and I guarantee they'll all be a lot better for you than me. I'm broken, Pia. I'm not a good person. But I was falling. No. Don't say that. You're too young to know what love is. She suddenly opened the door of his car and got out. Uh oh. This wasn't a good idea. It was past midnight, and the city was no place for a girl like Pia at night. He got out and called to her. Pia, get in the car. No. He sighed. Would it be easier to let her walk away? Yes. It wasn't like she could threaten to tell Odell, she would just shrug and say, what else is new? And after all, he was doing what Odell had asked him to do. Saying goodbye to all his side pieces. Probably stop referring to women as side pieces too, he thought to himself reproachfully. He definitely shouldn't have started up with Pia. Just let me drive you home. No. Go. I only live two blocks from here anyway. She stopped and looked back at him and her expression was resigned. Go, Roan. It's okay. I won't tell anyone about us. She stalked off and disappeared around the corner. Roan stood arguing with himself then followed her. By the time he got to the corner, she was gone. Shit. Too late. He couldn't exactly blame her if she ran to Odell or even Knox. Knox would be more problematic, he would not approve of Roan seeing his 19-year-old assistant. Roan wanted to convince Knox he was responsible. This wasn't the way to do it. Shit, he said again and got back into his car. Pia waited until she heard his car start up and go, before she ducked out of the doorway. She didn't want him to know that her home wasn't two blocks away, but a few miles. Still, she could walk it. Maybe it would get some of her humiliation out. She stalked along, her long legs carrying her easily. The night was cool, and she tugged her coat around herself tightly. Gosh, what the hell had she been thinking, sleeping with Roan St. Mark? The dude was a walking womanizer, everyone knew it. But Pia had to admit, it had bought her some cachet in her peer group. Sander wasn't showing any signs of interest unless you counted paternally. Ah. So when Roan had put the moves on her, she'd gone along with it. And he had been a spectacular lay, she had to admit. She did wonder if he guessed she had been a maiden, but he'd never said. At least she could finally say she'd gotten rid of her V-card. She sniggered to herself. Telling him she'd been falling in love with him. No way. She just wanted to make him feel bad for dumping her. And it had worked. Good. As she turned into the next street, she heard the step behind her. Turning, she realized a man's head was blocking the streetlight and was in shadow. He grabbed her throat and thrust her back hard against the wall, his other hand covering her scream of fright. He's going to rape me. But the attacker made no attempt to lift her skirt or grope her. For a millisecond, she didn't know what the hell he wanted, then she felt it. The pain. A knife being brutally and repeatedly thrust into her stomach. Oh God, please no, no. She felt her legs give way and she slumped to the ground. Her killer crouched next to her, ripping open the tattered dress and stabbing her again. As Pia bled out she managed to croak out, why? 
Her murderer slid the knife between her ribs into her heart, and she never knew the answer. Chapter 12 Livia woke in the dark hours before dawn to an empty bed. She shivered, the window was open and a cold breeze blew into the room. She got up, snagging Knox's shirt and pulling it around her as she went to close the window. Knox? The house was silent. Livia padded into the hall and listened. Something, water, was making a sound somewhere in the house and she followed the noise to the far end of the house to where the two locked rooms stood. Hesitating, Livia reached out and turned the handle of one of the rooms. It opened, and she now heard the definite sound of water running, someone was in the shower in the ensuite. She took a deep breath in, and walked silently to the door of the bathroom. She tried not to look at the room itself but as she reached the bathroom door she glanced to her left and saw the huge dark bloodstains on the floor. Oh God! Why Knox? Why leave it like this? It was like some sort of macabre torture chamber for his psyche. Livia had no doubt who she would see when she pushed open the bathroom door. Knox was in the shower, naked, scrubbing at his skin furiously. He looked up, but Livia could see he wasn't really seeing her. He was sleepwalking. He raised his arms to her. I can't get the blood out. I can't get the blood out. As Livia looked on in horror, Knox began to sob. I can't get the blood out, Ariel. God help me, what have I done? What have I done? Chapter 13 Amber got out of the car and saw a pale, shaken Livia waiting for her at the door of the mansion. She came out to meet her and hugged Amber, and Amber could feel her trembling. Thank you for coming, Amber. I got him back into bed, but I didn't know what else to do. Amber hugged her tightly. You did the right thing, Livia. Is he asleep? Livia nodded, her brown eyes large and frightened. Amber took her hand and they went inside. Knox was asleep in their bed, his handsome face racked with pain. Amber studied him for a moment and then nodded for Livia to follow her out. They sat in the kitchen and Amber made Livia drink some hot, strong coffee. It was a little after dawn. Amber, her face makeup free, her red hair tucked up in a bun tried to smile at Livia. First up, don't be too scared. He's done this before. Sleepwalked I mean. Twice that I know of. Once when Ariel died, once after his family. Tell me, what did you two do last night? Livia told her about the dinner, and the reunion between Knox and Charvy. Amber nodded. Ah. Livia looked at her unhappily. I blame myself. I encouraged them to reconnect. You know what, you shouldn't feel bad. At least we were able to control it, this way. What if he'd run into her unexpectedly? No, this is good. Maybe Knox will start to deal with all of it now. He never did, you see. He stuck his gorgeous head in the sand and just got on with the grief. He never processed what happened. Livia's eyes filled with tears. God. Amber patted her hand. You're good for him, you know. This is a good time for him to start processing. He has you. I suspect he's never felt stronger. Livia smiled at her. You are so kind. Amber sipped her coffee. Anything else happened last night you can think of? Was it just seeing Charvy? There was something? He got a text message and afterward, he went to the bathroom and got sick. He said it was just the release of nerves but I don't know. Where's his phone? Upstairs I think. I'll go get it. Amber waited while Livia went to get Knox's phone and when she came back, her face was stricken. Amber! What is it? Livia looked down at the phone. It's Ariel. There's photos. Amber swallowed and held out her hand. Livia, please. Livia hesitated, then handed over the phone. Amber knew what she'd see before she clicked on the message, but she couldn't help the small sob that escaped her when she saw the brutalized body of her twin sister. Livia's arms went around her then and held her tightly while she cried. Livia smoothed her hair, murmuring, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Amber pulled herself together, but leaned her head against Liv's. Sorry, boo. 
always a shock. Livia smiled at her, handing her a tissue. I can't imagine what it must be like for you. Who would send this? Amber sighed. Hard to say. Someone messing with his head. The killer. No, he or she would have sent personal photos, surely. These are the photos the press used of Ari when she was alive, and a crime scene photo. Anyone could have gotten hold of them. But why? Why now? Amber gave her a crooked grin. If it's someone being malicious, someone jealous maybe, I would say it's because of you. Not you, Livia, but you and Knox. Anyone can see how in love you are. You know what? I forgot this. Livia went out into the hall and came back with her coat. This was left for me at the college yesterday. She handed Amber a crumpled up piece of paper. Amber read it aloud. Break it off with Knox or I'll make your life hell skank. Delightful. Well then, I think we can guess who would be so spiteful. Mavis Creep. Livia's tone was icy. Damn woman, I'll rip her to pieces with my bare hands. Amber grinned at her. At least we can rule out any actual threat. Livia frowned. Threat? Don't you get why these pictures were sent to Knox, honey? They're implying the same will happen to you if you two don't break up. Livia snorted. Then come at me, bro. I don't scare easy. You're a feisty one, Amber grinned at her. You have no idea. They both turned towards the sound of Knox's voice. He smiled at them both, his eyes exhausted, and he slipped his arms around Liv. Sorry I scared you, baby. Just a little nutty. No problem, big guy. I haven't even begun to show you my crazy yet. She grinned up at him, and Amber smiled. Now if you two are going to get mushy. Seriously, Ams, thank you for coming. I don't know what I would have done. Livia's expression was earnest. You're a real friend. Amber reached for her hand. Listen, you two are good for each other. Which doesn't mean you're not going to go through crap like this, but I'll always be there. You, she fixed Knox with a steely look, I've played softball with you for 20 years now. Now that you have Livia, it's hardball from now on. You need to see a shrink, you need grief counseling. It'll hurt, it'll really hurt, but it needs to be done. Knox nodded. I agree. It's time. She saw his arms tighten around Livia, and she smiled. Good. Now I'm going to leave you alone, but I'm a call away. Livia shook her head. Stay. Have breakfast. I would, but I left a rather attractive Australian in my bed, and I think I need to go deal with that. Livia groaned. Gosh Amber, I'm sorry. I'm not. He woke up and wanted to talk, of all things. She grinned as they laughed. Bye peeps. I'll see you later. As they watched her go, Livia looked up at Knox. She's good people. She is. Come inside, Livia, there's something I have to show you. Hand in hand, they walked upstairs to the room where Livia had found him earlier. This was my mom's room. Dad killed her and Tegan here. He sat down heavily on the bed. The heavy counterpane puffed up with dust. The police told me Teague died instantly, a shot to the heart, but mom was shot in the stomach and bled out slowly. My father killed himself in the next room. Livia sat down next to him and took his hand. Knox stared at the bloodstain on the rug. I had to identify their bodies. Dad, he shot himself in the head so you can imagine, but mom and Teague. They just look so peaceful. Asleep. It didn't make sense that they were gone. I was waiting for Teague to open his eyes and grin at me and shout, Psyche. Damn. He rubbed his eyes. Livia pressed her lips to his cheek. I've never seen a photograph of Teague. She tried to say it lightly, so that if he needed to break down, he could without thinking she was trying to jog him out of his melancholy. Knox stood and went to the dresser, picking up a frame. He handed it to her. Livia looked at the photograph of a happy family. Teague and Knox, both tall, were handsome and smiling. Knox had his mother's green eyes, Teague, his father's dark brown. Tynan Renault looked so proud of his family. His wife, Gabriella, was beautiful, 
her arm around her youngest son. Livia traced her finger over Knox's teenage face. He looked so young, like a Greek youth, so gorgeous and free of hurt. She looked up at him. I wish I could take your pain away, Knox. He took her hand and pulled her into his arms. You do, Livia. You do. She touched his face. Come back to bed, Knox. I'll show you happiness. And she led him back to their bedroom. Chapter 14 So, Livia began awkwardly as she sat in the kitchen of La Chat Noir with Morico. Their shift had just ended just after the lunch rush, and Marcel was talking to an attractive young woman out front. His sous chef cat was having a sneak cigarette outside, and Liv and Morico had the kitchen to themselves. So, a small smile was playing around Morico's lips, like she knew what Livia was going to say. She wasn't going to let Liv off the hook though, clearly, and so Livia took a deep breath. So, Knox has asked me to move in with him. Now I want you to know, I gave him a big long speech yesterday about being independent and all that, but screw it Mori. Life is short. I want to be with him. Morico smiled. It's not the biggest surprise, Liv. But, Liv went on, I'm still going to be paying half the rent on our place, the utilities, everything I'm paying now. Morico sighed. I wish I could tell you that was silly, but the truth is. Exactly. Look, please let me do this. I love Knox, but I hate to abandon you. You're not abandoning me, Liv, this is life, and I'm beyond happy for you. Also, however perfect he seems, he'll still get on your nerves eventually and this way you'll have somewhere to come to cool off and have girls' nights in." Liv grinned. You got it, sweetie. When are you moving out? Not clear yet, but it won't be too long. Next couple of weeks. Morico nodded. Has Knox any idea of the tsunami of paperback books that's about to hit his beautifully appointed home? Liv grinned. He sort of knows, just not the extent. Well, I'm happy for you, sweetheart, I really am. Will you be okay? Morico rolled her eyes. Do fuss. Livia hopped off the countertop and hugged her friend. Love you, Mori. Come on, I'll treat you to lunch. Knox spent the morning trying to find a good counselor. Overjoyed that Livia had agreed to move in with him, he was determined he would repay her trust by getting the help he had known he'd needed for years. He contacted his family's old doctor and asked for his recommendation, then made an appointment with a psychiatrist in the city. He had just hung up the phone when Sandor knocked at his door, a frown on his face. Thup dude. Have you seen Pia this morning? She's usually at her desk before any of us, but there's no sign. Shannon from Human Resources called her home but her mother says her bed wasn't slept in. Knox sat back. Really? Well, she's an adult, so I think the police will ask us to wait 24 hours. She could have hooked up with someone. I'll call her mother and see what she wants us to do. I'll get Shannon to give you the number. Sandor disappeared and Knox frowned. It was out of character for Pia to not show up. Knox had always been impressed with her work ethic, even at her young age. Shit. He hated this sort of thing, the uneasiness creeping over his skin, the same way it had all those years ago. He still remembered the police showing up at Ariel's parents' home to tell them a body had been found. He'd known even then that she was dead. He called Pia's mother, who tearfully asked him to keep her informed if Pia showed up. Then, needing to hear her voice, he called Livia. Hey, gorgeous. Her warm greeting made the tension in his body ease. He told her about Pia, and she expressed her concern but told him not to stress unless something concrete was known. I know it seems bad baby but she could just be around a girlfriend's house or a boyfriend's, and overslept, or so hungover that she forgot to call. She's 19. I know. I'm not trying to make unnecessary drama, either. It's just that I worry. There was a small silence on the end of the phone. Did you make the appointment? Her voice was wary, like she didn't want to nag him, and Knox's heart warmed. This girl really did love him. I did, sweetheart. I promised I would and I did. Dr. Feldstein will see me next week. 
Proud of you, Livia said, her voice catching. I love you so much, Knox. I love you too, funny face. Old man. Saddlebags. Livia giggled. That's so mean, but I love it. Listen, I have a tutorial. I'll call you afterwards, okay? I hope there's news on Pia soon. Roan walked into the rent car offices, his portfolio and draft business plan under his arm, and asked to see Knox. Knox himself came to get him. Come on in, buddy. Roan smiled at his friend as he sat opposite him. Now, I know this is quick and it's only a preliminary idea, but I wanted to run this by you. Awesome, Roan, let's get Sandor in here too. When the other man had joined them, Roan cleared his throat. The other day, when we were talking, I was joking around and said I should start an escort service. He saw the alarmed looks on his friends' faces and grinning, held up his hands. No, hear me out. I'm seriously not talking about a traditional escort slash undercover prostitution service. In fact, penalties would be severe if any coitus activities were discovered. What I'm talking about is a kind of reverse Ashley Madison. Say there was a congressman who needed a dinner partner, but his wife was sick or just didn't like the spotlight. That's where I'd come in. I'd arrange for an escort. Now here's the rub. Say I have a female scientist who needed an escort for the same function. I'd partner them up for an introduction fee. Now, admittedly, this is all a bit hazy at the moment. Knox looked unconvinced. I'm just thinking, Roan, that despite your best intentions, it will operate exactly like a traditional escort service. People are people, no matter their social standing. If they want to do it, they'll do it. Seems to me, you're doing exactly what Ashley Madison does, but putting a different spin on it. Sorry, dude. Roan's shoulders slumped. What about if I put safeguards in place? Like contracts? Contracts don't mean a thing if two people want to break it. Who's going to sue them? Me? Knox shook his head. You'll lose. I can't think that there'll be one judge who'll rule in your favor on this, and your reputation, no matter how well-intentioned, will take a hit. Look at that guy who was the arranger for Berlusconi, what was his name? Tarantini, said Sandor brushing down his trousers. He got eight years, I think. In Italy. Roan rolled his eyes. Look, you said to focus on my passion. I like screwing. Exactly, and you're doing what you do without charging for it, perfectly legal. Dude, look, you have to take this seriously. Roan, grow up. You let it rule your life and mess up everything. You got through Harvard, for Christ's sakes, you have a business degree. Roan stared out of the window for a long time. Maybe this is a bad idea, friends going into business together. Maybe I should just find a job myself. He felt irritated that his idea, no matter how vague, had been poo-pooed. Surely he should be allowed to see where it went. It still hurt when Knox nodded. Maybe you should. Roan got up. Well thanks for your time. He didn't wait around, just walked out of the building and got into his car. Well. Damn. He let out a long breath and started the car. Sandor and Knox sat in silence for a long moment. Well, that could have gone better. Sandor shook his head. What was he thinking? Knox looked unhappy. He wasn't. That's the whole problem with Roan. Sando studied his friend. You notice something else? No what? He didn't mention Pia. He always mentions Pia, always stops to talk to her. He didn't even glance at her desk as he came in. Knox paled a little but then waved his hand, dismissing Sandor's observation. He was too full of his damn fool idea. It isn't anything more. Later, as he was enjoying a light supper with Livia at his home, soon to be their home, Knox couldn't help but think of what Sandor had said. Livia smoothed her hand over his face. What's up? What's going on in that mind of yours? He told her about Roan's plan, she rolled her eyes as he'd expected, then related what Sandor had said. Livia agreed with Knox, it was nothing. Does Sandor not like Roan? I would never have guessed. He likes him just fine I think. He's never said anything to the contrary. 
it's just a little strange he would say that. I mean, does Roan even know Pia? Knox considered. Well, he talks to her whenever he comes into the office. I don't think Sandor meant any malice. Hum. Livia thought about it for a moment more, then shrugged. Probably not. So no news? None. Gosh. I hope she's okay. Me too, darling. Let's change the subject. How did Morico take your news? Livia grinned. Surprisingly well. I told her I'd still be paying for half the rent, so it takes a little pressure off of her, and she was grateful. You could let me take care of that. I could not. She chucked his chin and he grinned. Actually, she was more worried that you have no clue what you're letting yourself in for. I have so many books and art supplies, and all sorts of music crap. Is that right? He put down his fork and took her hand. Come with me. He led her across the house to a room she hadn't even known was there. Just how many secret rooms does this place have? Livia grinned as Knox laughed. You haven't even scratched the surface, baby. Anyways, come on in. He said it lightly, but he felt his heart beating hard against his ribs. He opened the door, and Livia stepped inside. It was his and his mother's music studio. His old cello stood in its stand, his mother's piano covered in a dust sheet. Other, less played, less beloved instruments dotted the room. Livia looked at him with wide eyes. I'm sorry I didn't tell you about this room earlier, he said softly. I didn't know whether I was quite ready. But after last night, I think it's important. Livia took his hand. How much does it hurt? Knox considered, then smiled ruefully. It's excruciating. Livia cupped her face in her palm. And it's okay to feel that. Acknowledge it. Speak it. We can go if you like, I think this is a huge step. Knox took a deep breath. No, I brought you here for a reason. My mother's piano. I think it should be heard again, and it just seems right it should be you. Would you play for me? Livia, trembling, nodded. Will you play with me? She nodded to his cello, and Knox hesitated. You don't have to, but I think it would be good for you. Knox touched his cello, dislodging a thick smear of dust. Do you know Sonata No. 3. Bach? I sure do. Let's see. Livia shifted the dust sheets from the piano and opened the lid. She pressed a few of the keys. Good it's still in tune. I hope I can say the same for this thing. Knox rested the cello between his legs and took up the bow. Ready. First few bars. They played slowly at first, the music tentative but sweet, then as they both settled into the rhythm, they played through the first act, both making minor mistakes but smiling encouragingly at the other as they did. Knox lowered his bow. Wow. How do you feel? Livia was watching him, and he smiled at her. Conflicted. Livia closed the piano lid and went to him. She lifted the cello back into its stand and held out her hand. Associations. Let's start to change your association with this room and this instrument. Let's turn your memories into pleasant ones. He took her hand and let her lead him to their bedroom. Inside, she dropped the straps of her dress down her shoulders and wiggled out of it as Knox sat on the edge of the bed and watched her. She turned around slowly in her underwear and looked back over her shoulder at him. You want this, baby? Knox grinned. You know I do. Strip for me, gorgeous. Livia chuckled and slowly began to take her underwear off, unclasping her bra and sliding her panties down her legs. Take me, Knox, but keep your clothes on. Knox grinned and laid her back on the bed, standing to unzip his fly. Fisting the root of it, he gazed down at her as she spread her legs wide for him. Gosh, you're so beautiful, Livia Chatelaine. Livia arched her back up as he plunged into her, moaning at the feel of him. They made love fast and furiously, primal in their desire for each other. As they finished, Livia pulled him onto the bed and tore at his clothes, biting at his chest before straddling him and taking him. He cupped her breasts, his thumbs strumming a beat over her chest until they hardened. They made each other come again and again, 
until, exhausted, they fell asleep in each other's arms. It was dawn when Sandor arrived with the police, looking pale and shaken. They had found Pia's body. A shocked and horrified Knox and Livia listened, as he told them she had been found laid upon Ariel's grave, with a message scrawled in her blood across the cold marble. What did it say? Knox's voice sounded tight. Sandor winced and put his hand on his friend's shoulder. I'm sorry, Knox. It said, everyone you love. Jeez. A worried Livia hugged Knox as he dropped his head into his hands. The lead homicide detective cleared his throat. I'm sorry to do this at what is obviously a very distressing time, but Mr. Renault, I do have to ask. Where were you the night before last? Chapter 15 Morico listened, as Livia filled her in on what had been happening. Gosh how awful. So they arrested Knox. Livia shook her head. No, they just wanted to ask him questions. He offered to go with them to the station for a formal interview but they said he didn't need to. Yet. Gosh what a mess. Poor Pia. Were you close? No, but we met a few times. She was only 19. Jeez. Livia nodded, miserable. Horrific. Marcel came into the kitchen. Hey, you okay? He frowned at Livia. You're really pale. Are you sure you're okay to work? I am, thanks, Marcel. I'd rather be here, it will take my mind off the other stuff. The restaurant was busy in the run up to Christmas. Although the weather outside was still mild, people were wearing coats and trying to get into a winter mindset. Livia wondered aloud if it ever snowed in New Orleans. Sure it does, Marcel told her. Last time was Christmas Day, appropriately enough, back in 04, before that in 89. It doesn't happen often, but we're lucky sometimes. We're due some this year I believe, some weather phenomenon to do with global warming. I don't know but yeah, you might have a white Christmas if you're lucky. Just don't count on it being several feet deep. Livia was daydreaming about sharing a white Christmas with Knox at his mansion, when Morico nudged her. One of your rich friends is in. Livia saw Odell Griffin G seated in her section, her back ramrod straight and groaned inwardly. The woman creeped her out a little, she had to admit. She went over to her. Hey Odell. Odell blinked at her, as if she had only just remembered Livia worked there. Oh, hello. It's Livia. Of course. Hello again, Livia. There was a small smile playing around Odell's lips, and Livia couldn't work out if Odell was mocking her or not. She decided to give her the benefit of the doubt. What can I get for you today? Odell was studying her. An egg white and spinach omelette, please. The smile was back, and Livia realized Odell was attempting to make a joke with her. She smiled back tentatively. Of course. And your company, if that's possible. Just for a few minutes. Livia's eyebrows shot up and she looked around. Well, um. If you can't, that's okay. Livia glanced at Marcel. I guess I'm due a break, but I'll have to run it past my boss. Of course. Livia spoke to Marcel who seemed surprised but shrugged. Go for it. We're slowing down now anyway. It's just for ten minutes at the most. Livia sat down with Odell, feeling oddly out of place. The blonde woman smiled at her, but her eyes were searching Livia's face. Finally, she spoke. Knox is very taken with you. Livia nodded. And I with him, she said carefully, having no idea where Odell was going. Was she about to give Livia the full-on gold digger, warning? Odell picked at her omelet. Knox is very important to me. You may have noticed that I don't make friends easily. I have a tendency to speak my mind and people tell me I have no tact, so forgive me if I say anything out of turn. Sure. I like seeing him happy. He deserves it. Livia held up her hands. Odell let me preempt you. I'm not interested in his money. But he does have money. It's his not mine. Odell nodded. For what it's worth, 
I actually never considered you to be that kind of woman. You genuinely do seem to care about him. Livia lifted her chin. I do care. I love him, Odell. I believe you. What I wanted to say was this, be careful which of his friends you trust. They are not always who they seem to be. Like? Roan. Odell smiled. Roan, God bless him, is not blessed with brains or cunning. No, I mean. Amber Duplas. Livia felt awkward. She has been nothing but kind to me, Odell. And I'm sure she means it. But she's also been sleeping with Roan behind my back. Livia was shocked. Odell, I'm so sorry. It's okay. I'm not naive. I know who Roan is, I know who Amber is. I'm going to marry Roan, did you know that? Livia shook her head. I didn't. Odell, are you sure you should? Odell smiled. You see things as very black and white, don't you? I'm marrying Roan because, despite his infidelities, and yes there have been more than one, he needs me. And I need him. You might have seen I don't do well in social situations. He is my anchor and I am his. I gave him an ultimatum. Get rid of the other women. Do I think he'll be faithful forever? No, of course not. But he's trying. For me. Mostly for my money to be fair, but also for me. Why are you telling me all of this, Odell? Livia felt uncomfortable. Odell smiled. Because I like you. I don't often feel that towards other women, but you, Livia, seem like the genuine article. No bullshit. Despite your relative low background. She stopped and held her hands up. There goes that sledgehammer tack again. What I mean is, despite the difference in our social standing, that's no better. Livia chuckled, suddenly. It's okay, Odell, I get it. Sorry. But what I mean is, you are completely guileless. It's refreshing to me. Fair enough. Look, I really do have to get back to work, but... Livia pulled her notepad from her apron and scribbled her cell phone number down. She gave it to Odell. If you ever need to talk. Thank you, Livia. Take care, Odell. Livia told Knox about Odell's visit and he seemed pleased. Despite her manner, she has a good heart. I'm just getting that. Livia had decided not to tell him about Odell's warning regarding Amber. Knox looked exhausted and drawn and she stroked his face. Did the police have any other information? Knox shook his head. Only that Pia was killed in an identical manner to Ariel. I went to see Pia's parents. They're broken. Gosh, poor things. Knox held her hand to his face. When I think of how you used to run around the streets alone, Livia frowned. Knox, I won't let this stop me from living my life, you know. I don't want to be stuck in an ivory tower. I have work, I have college. Everyone you love. That's what the killer wrote. Are you sure he means you? Why else would he put Pia on Ariel's grave? No, I'm sorry, Liv, until he's caught, you get a protective detail. Livia was annoyed. How about you talk to me about it, rather than tell me, Knox? I don't want some hulking guy with me all the time. I can look after myself. She pushed back her chair and took her plate to the sink, flicking on the water and rinsing it. She felt Knox's arm slide around her waist but she was too pissed to let it go. Sorry, he mumbled into her hair. I'm just terrified something will take you away from me. She turned in his arms. I get it but don't ever dictate how I run my life, okay? That's not going to be how this works between us. He nodded, his eyes sad. I know. Forgive me. He bent his head and brushed her lips with his. Despite herself, Liv responded to his touch, kissing him back. She really couldn't get enough of him, his taste, his scent, his hard body and beautiful face. She smoothed his curls back from his face. Take me to bed, Renault, and show me how sorry you are. Knox's cell phone rang and they both sighed. Rain check for a few. It might be about Pia's case. Go ahead, she said, and let him go. She cleared their dinner things as he answered the call, 
once again glad Knox wasn't someone with a huge staff. It would make these intimate dinners difficult. She listened to him speaking. Thanks, detective. Are you sure you don't want me to make an official statement? Yes, anything, anything to help. I'd like to pay for the funeral but I also don't want to upset the family, yes, yes of course. He hung up and sighed, rubbing his eyes. Livia could see the strain on his face and went to him, pulling him into her arms. I'm so sorry baby. He held her tightly, burying his face in her neck and she could feel his tears. Just promise me Livia, don't ever leave me. I promise, she whispered and knew the truth of her words. Chapter 16 Livia was worried about Knox's state of mind for the next few days, and although he told her he was making good progress with Dr. Feldstein, he looked drawn and tired. Livia comforted him the best way she could, spending all her spare time with him talking, making love and hanging out. Soon though, she felt unable to cheer him, and asked him if he would like Amber to come see him. Amber's out of town. It was Livia's turn to look surprised. She is. Yeah, why? She shrugged. It's just you never said. Should I have? Knox smiled at her, his expression a little confused. No, I guess not. Livia brushed it off, but she wondered why Knox knew exactly where Amber was at any one time and why it bothered her so much. Knox was studying her. She wanted to get away because Pia's murder dragged up bad memories, sweetheart. Nothing insidious. I thought you liked Amber. I do, very much, she reassured him, but something felt off to her. Why would Amber desert her best friend at a time like this? Even if it did bring up memories of her sister's murder, why wouldn't she want to be around the people she was closest to? Livia felt her skin prickle with unease. What did she really know about these people and how they operated? Are you okay? She nodded. Actually, I'm pretty bushed, but I have to practice for the recital. Do you mind if I use your mother's studio? It's your studio now, baby, and of course. Would you like some alone time? If you don't mind, she smiled to soften the blow, otherwise I'll be distracted by your gorgeous body. I'll make it up to you later. Knox grinned, his whole face lighting up, and Liv felt a frisson of desire go through her. I'll hold you to that. At the piano, she ran through her composition again and again, concentrating on the finer details of it. She wondered if it even counted as jazz now, it was so slow and almost classical in its melody. Charvi had assured her that it still had its roots in her favorite genre. It's very New Orleans jazz, she had told Livia at their last tutorial. Slow, sensual, laissez-faire. It's almost listless in its sexuality, as if yes, you desire this man, but just being with him, being still with him, is enough. And it was true, Livia did love just being with Knox, even if they were napping on his couch or reading together, his head on her stomach. Or just being. Being in the moment with Knox felt so natural. Maybe that's why this thing is freaking you out, she told herself. It's all a bit too easy, as if I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. She moved her fingers over the keys again and again, and when after an hour or two she heard the music room door open, she smiled to herself. She had her eyes closed, practicing the chords as she felt his fingers sweep her hair back from her shoulder and his lips against her neck. She continued to play as he unbuttoned her dress slowly, stroking the skin of her back, then trailing his lips down her spine. Livia shivered, closing her eyes as Knox chuckled, a deep sound from the back of his throat. Keep playing, beautiful. Livia giggled softly as he lifted her and slid underneath her, perching her on his lap as he began to peel her dress away from her shoulders. Livia managed to keep playing the melody as he stripped her to the waist. Knox nibbled at her earlobe as he caressed her bare chest. You want me inside? She nodded, turning her head to kiss his mouth. Knox gently closed the piano lid and set her on top of the piano, removing the rest of her clothes. Livia kissed him as he stripped. With him seated on the piano stool, he lifted her on top of him. They rocked together, eyes locked on the others, their mouths hungry as they kissed. Gosh, I love you, Knox growled as their lovemaking became more intense. 
he swept her onto the floor and began to thrust hard as she wrapped her legs around him. The sensations he was sending through her body were intoxicating, and she forgot all of her earlier irritation and misgivings, giving herself to him entirely. Knox, knowing he had command of her body, smiled down at her as he drove her towards orgasm. You and me forever, Livy. Promise me. I promise, gosh, yes. I promise. Knox? Her back arched up and she felt him reach his peak. Livia panted for air, laughing and telling him how much she loved him as they collapsed to the floor. Knox smothered her in kisses, making her giggle, and then started to blow raspberries on her stomach, tickling her sides. Livia shrieked with laughter, twisting and turning to escape him. She turned on her side, then gasped as she saw it. At the window of the mansion, a figure. Someone was watching them. Chapter 17 At Livia's scream of fright, Knox took off, immediately grabbing his pants and shoving his legs into them, even as he began to run to the door. Livia followed him down the long hallway of the mansion, but she stopped as he yelled at her, Stay inside, baby. Call 911. Adrenaline was spiking in her veins as she grabbed her cell phone and called, cursing for once the fact that Knox refused a security team. She got through to the emergency services, who assured her someone was on their way. Keep calm, ma'am, and stay on the line. Is your partner back? No, Livia tried to stop her voice from trembling, he's still out there. She went to the door, peering out into the cold night, shivering from terror and from the cold. She had only managed to grab Knox's shirt to cover herself. She couldn't see Knox, couldn't hear him. Knox? Stay inside. His voice was far away, but she felt a little relief that he was still within earshot. He's still looking for whoever it was, she told the dispatcher. Please hurry. We are, sweetheart, just stay calm. A gunshot rang out in the night and Livia screamed, dropping the cell phone. Knox? Her terror made tears pour down her face as she ran out into the night, not caring about her own safety as long as she got to him. She heard shouting, and another gunshot. She ran towards the sound, screaming his name, and it was a huge relief when he came into view. Knox looked at her, a strange expression in his eyes, and Livia stopped. Baby. I told you to stay inside, he said softly, and to her horror, blood began to drip from his hairline down his perfect face. He reached for her as his knees gave way, and Knox Renault collapsed to the ground. Livia didn't know how she had managed to stop screaming. After the police arrived, followed a few minutes later by a medical team, she watched Knox being loaded, unconscious, into the ambulance. A policewoman wrapped a blanket around her, and when they got to the hospital, a kindly nurse gave her some scrubs to put on. They wheeled Knox straight into the emergency room, and it wasn't long before the doctor came to look for her. Mr. Renault was shot in the head but, thankfully, it's a relatively minor wound. I say relatively, because obviously any headshot will have its complications. What's encouraging is that the bullet took out a chunk of skull bone but didn't penetrate his brain. We're going to go in now and see how much damage was done, and I'll come up at you as soon as we know more. Doc? Will he be okay? We're going to do everything we can. Keep the faith. The police officer with Livia thanked the doctor. When they were alone, she asked Livia to go over what had happened again, and Livia told her again. Could you make out whether the intruder was male or female? I saw them for maybe a split second before whoever it was stepped away from the window. Livia was calm, knowing the police had to ask these questions, but desperately worried about Knox. Knox went out after them and I called you. The next thing I know, Knox is on the ground, bleeding. Her voice broke as the shock hit her full force. Oh God, oh God. She dropped her head into her hands and began to cry. The police officer rubbed her back, and shortly afterward, Livia heard a familiar voice as someone sat down next to her and pulled her into his arms. Shish, it's okay. Sandor held her tightly as she leaned against him. She cried herself out then looked up. Sandor, drawn and shocked, tried to smile at her. He handed her a tissue and rubbed her back. He's going to be okay, sweetheart. You bet your ass, he is, 
Amber stated determinedly as she walked into the room, nodding at the police officer. Hey there. Amber Duplas. I know who you are, Ms. Duplas, and thanks for coming. You called them? Livia, wiping her eyes, looked surprised. The police officer nodded. You were in no condition, and we know Mr. Renault's contacts. We thought it would be best to call them. Thank you. You're very kind. I'm going to step out now, but I'll be back to ask more questions. Of course. When she was alone with Sandor and Amber, she told them what had happened. They shot him, she said incredulously. They actually shot Knox. Amber put her arm around her. Listen, the docs say he'll be fine. Most likely. They told you that. Amber smiled. I'm legally Knox's next of kin. We're each other's, actually, comes of having no living relatives. I see. Liv felt a wave of exhaustion and Sandor seemed to notice. Livy, they may be ours. We can get the nurse to bring a cot in for you so you can rest. Thank you, San, but I couldn't. I just need some coffee. Amber stood. I'll go find some. Sandor kept his arm around Livia. At least lean on me and try to relax some. They may be operating for a while. In the end, the doctor came back after a couple of hours. He was smiling, and Livia felt some of the terror lift. Mr. Renault will be fine. The bullet didn't enter the brain cavity at all. As we thought, he lost a bit of skull bone, but he was incredibly lucky. The bullet glanced off of him. He'll be missing a chunk of skin and hair for a while, but we were able to close the wound. He won't even need to see the plastics team. He's in recovery now, and then we just need to wait for the anesthetic to wear off. He might have a concussion, in fact, I'd say that's a given, so we'll keep him in for a couple of days. Livia felt the tears pouring down her face. Thank you, doctor, thank you so much. He patted her hand. Get some rest. You can see him in an hour or so. Alone with Sandor, Livia finally broke down and sobbed, a mix of relief and terror. Sandor held her tightly and let her cry herself out before she finally fell asleep in his arms. Waking an hour later, Livia felt her eyes were swollen and heavy with salt and tried to smile at Sandor. I know I look like the swamp thing, but I need to see Knox. Doc said we could go through to his room when you awoke. Livia stood, then felt a blood rush and wobbled. Sandor caught her, and she leaned against his solid body. Liv, have you eaten anything? Not since last night. We need to get some food inside you. I want to see him first. Sandor didn't look happy, but he also looked resigned. Come on then, hold on to me. When Livia saw Knox, the tears came again. His head was bandaged and Livia could see dried blood and the beginnings of a huge bruise, red, purple, black and blue, angry and vicious on the right side of his head. God. Remember what the doc said. It looks worse than it is. Livia bent over her lover and kissed his lips, glad to feel that they were warm. I love you so much, she whispered and then smiled as Knox opened his eyes and focused on her. Hey, beautiful. He gazed up at her for a few moments, a smile on his face, then his eyes closed and he fell asleep again. Livia gave a sigh of relief and leaned her forehead gently against his. Thank God, Knox. Sandor rubbed her back. Come sit down before you fall down, Liv. I'll grab you some hot food. It was nighttime and Knox was still asleep. Livia stroked his curls back from his pale face and sighed. She had sent Sandor and Amber away, but she was exhausted. She got up, bending over Knox to kiss his cold lips. Gonna go find some coffee, baby. I'll be right back. She went to find a vending machine, but the one on Knox's floor was out of service. She walked down the stairs, hoping the exercise would wake her up. Now that she knew Knox was out of danger, her adrenaline had disappeared and her body felt heavy and listless. Who the hell would shoot her beloved Knox? Who had been watching them? Her flesh crawled at the thought of it. How had the evening gone from one of sensuality and love to horror? She tried the door to the floor below and went into the corridor. It was silent, and Livia could see that some sort of remodeling was being carried out. 
no one was around. To her relief, the vending machines were working, and she quickly purchased a strong black coffee and a power bar. She snagged some fresh cold water from the cooler and drained the plastic cup. A breeze blew cool against her back and she heard a door slam. Turning, the breath caught in her throat as she saw a figure in shadow standing at the end of the corridor, watching her. Livia took a shaky breath in. Sorry if I'm not supposed to be down here, but the coffee machine on. She trailed off as the figure started to walk towards her without speaking, and that's when she saw it. The knife in his hand. Geez no. She dropped the hot coffee and turned and ran. The intruder was between her and the staircase, so she darted deeper into the corridors, looking for any other way out. She heard him behind her, could hear his breathing as he ran after her. She weaved and slammed through any open door she found until, as she opened a final door, she realized she had run out of luck. In a second, she felt him grab her shoulders and pull her back towards him. Livia screamed, kicked, and struggled with her attacker, determined to fight until either she escaped or he killed her. He was strong, too strong, and when he slammed his fist into her temple, Livia crumpled to the ground, dazed, terrified, and knowing she could do no more. She lay on her back and felt her attacker pushing her top up, exposing her abdomen. She saw the flash of the blade once before she passed out. Chapter 18 Livia Livy sweetheart wake up. She could hear Sandor's voice but was confused. Why was he telling her to wake up? Wasn't she dead? Her murder had been surprisingly painless she had to admit, but now her head screeched with agony. She opened her eyes. White light. Blinding. Ouch, she said and heard Sandor's relieved chuckle. Hello again, beauty. You had us scared. Livia. I'm Dr. Ford. We found you unconscious on the floor below. What happened, my dear? Livia blinked and immediately reached down and ran her hand over her stomach. There were no stab wounds. She reached up and touched her temple. Her hand came away bloody. He chased me and hit me. I think he wanted to kill me, why didn't he? She saw the doctor and Sandor exchange a skeptical glance and felt idiotic. She pushed herself up into a seated position. Who's with Knox? If someone tried to kill me, then he's not safe either. Amber's with him, sweetheart. Now, the doc's going to fix your head right up and the police want to talk to you, okay? Sure. Livia felt as if they were humoring her. Maybe they'll believe me. She couldn't help the snippiness that flooded her tone. The doctor said nothing but Sandor smiled at her. It's not that we don't believe you. It's that when I found you downstairs, it clearly looked like you'd fallen and hit your head is all. There were no signs of a struggle. Are you sure you didn't just panic? You're very tired, honey. It's been a long night. When he put it like that, could she have imagined it? Livia closed her eyes and felt her head spinning. The doctor was cleaning up her head wound. You won't even need stitches. Livia thanked him. When she and Sandor were alone, she felt tears in her eyes. I don't know what to think, San. I was so sure, he had a knife. I saw it. Sandor sat on the edge of the gurney and put his arm around her. Why were you down there? Coffee. The vending machine on this floor isn't working. Hey, I remember dropping the cup of coffee when I was being chased. She looked at him hopefully, but he shook his head. We didn't find any spilled liquid, honey. Damn. Was she going crazy? I want to go see Knox. Of course. Livia walked a little unsteadily back to Knox's room. When she pushed open the door, a shot of jealousy flooded through her when she saw Amber stroking Knox's forehead. He was awake and when he saw her, he smiled such a sweet smile that her heart lifted. Hey you. They told me you had a fall. Livia smiled at him cautiously, shooting a glance at Amber, who gave up her bedside seat for Livia. We'll give you two some space, she said and took Sandor out of the room, closing the door behind them. Livia leaned over and kissed Knox's mouth. You gave me such a scare, baby. I'm sorry, honey. You didn't answer my question, you had a fall. 
Livia hesitated, not knowing what to tell him, but then nodded. They had more important things to talk about right now. I'm fine, but Knox, do you remember what happened before you were shot? She couldn't help touching the bandage on his head. He caught her hand and pressed it to his face. I can. We were making love, some creep was watching us. When I was outside, I heard something and went towards it. I saw, something, a figure, and went after them. He sighed, closing his eyes as she stroked his face. When you called out, I saw the figure turn towards the sound of your voice and I was so scared he'd come after you. I almost caught up with him, then he or she shot me. I remember not knowing if I was a dead man walking, I just wanted to see you one last time, so I came back for you. He opened his eyes and met her gaze. Sweetheart, I was dazed and concussed but in the moment before I passed out, I saw someone behind you. Gosh. His expression was guilt-ridden and Livia felt her throat close. He followed us here, she said softly, and he attacked me. I didn't fall. San and the doctor don't believe me. Who the hell is coming after us, Knox? Knox shook his head grimly and he reached for her. She crawled into the bed with him and he wrapped his arms around her. I don't know, sweetheart, but I can tell you this. He won't get near us again. He kissed her forehead. I know you hate the idea, but first thing in the morning I'm arranging an entire security detail. Agreed. And Livia could not argue with him. Fine. Whatever you think, honey. Knox kissed her forehead. Does it hurt? She shook her head and smiled. Not as much as yours, I'll bet. They've got me hopped up on morphine. Livia chuckled. Things are about to get wild. Knox laughed. Actually, I'm beat. I could do with some more sleep, and by the looks of it, so could you. Livia slept in the bed with Knox, despite the disapproving glance of the nurses who came in to check his vitals. When they awoke, it was evening again. Livia kissed his mouth tenderly. Thank God you're okay, Knox. I don't know what I would have done. He stroked her face. Now you know how I feel. Whatever is going down, we'll beat it, Liv. I want my happily ever after with you. They heard raised voices outside in the hallway. Knox and Livia looked at each other as Roan and Odell, both looking angry and scared, came in. Odell gave a huge sigh of relief. Thank God. Roan, who looked worse for wear, clutched his friend's hand. Geez, Knox, when they said on the news you'd been shot. It's on the news. Odell nodded. That's how we found out. Livia got up. I'm sorry, that's my fault. I should have called you. She wobbled, and Odell stepped forward to steady her. No, Amber and Sandor should have called us. You had this to deal with, what happened to your head? They didn't mention you being hurt, too. This happened in the hospital. I'll tell you about it later. Livia glanced at Roan, who looked distraught. Is he okay? She lowered her voice and Odell shook her head. No, he isn't. Look, we have to talk you and I, let me just have a moment with Knox and we'll go for some coffee and some hot food. You look like you could do with some. Livia nodded and turned to kiss Knox. I'm going to give you a moment with your friends, darling. I'll be right back. She looked back and saw Knox open his arms and hug Odell. Livia was astonished to hear the other woman crying. Odell was so emotionless most of the time that it came as a shock to hear her upset. Livia realized how much Knox meant to Odell then, and it warmed her even more to the other woman. And Roan, there was something going on with him, something that made him look like a man who was barely hanging on. It was beyond being upset about his friend being shot. Livia went to the restroom to freshen up, using one of the disposable toothbrushes to brush her teeth. She felt dirty and itchy, the scrubs she had been given were spotted with dried blood. A bruise was forming over her temple, and she could now see the outline of knuckles in the wound. She gritted her teeth. She hadn't been hallucinating or imagining the intruder coming after her. So why hadn't he killed her? She pulled her top up and examined her abdomen. Nothing, not even a scratch. She was about to drop the top when something caught her eye. 
a small cut on the inside of her navel. A speck of dried blood. What the hell? Was it a warning, or had the man intended to carve her up slowly, but got interrupted? Maybe by Sandor looking for her? It made her flesh crawl and her breath quicken to realize that if Sandor hadn't looked for her, she could be dead right now. Lying disemboweled, her blood pooled around her, forgotten on the floor below, until Knox asked where she was. The assailant had shot Knox in the head then come for her, so why didn't he finish the job? She had been utterly vulnerable. Everyone you love. The warning from Pia's murder scene hit her again. Who was he talking to? Knox? But why? What on earth had triggered this vendetta twenty years after his family and his lover had all died? Livia stared into the mirror. What the hell was going on? And why did she feel so sure, overwhelmingly sure, that Amber had something to do with it all? Amber and Roan, both of them she felt sure knew more than they were saying. Was Amber looking for revenge for Ariel's death now that Knox had finally moved on and fallen in love with another woman? Or was it just that she wanted Knox for herself? What about Roan? He looked like a man destroyed. She couldn't quite believe it had been Roan stalking and attacking her, but then again, Roan was a passionate man. Would he have hesitated to kill her quickly and brutally, no matter who was coming? She didn't think so. Livia shook herself. And it could be just some random psycho who killed Pia, and no more than an intruder staking out Knox's mansion to rob it. She spoke the words aloud to try and reassure herself, but faltered. No, it was something more insidious. She knew it in her bones. She jumped as the restroom door slammed behind her and turned. No one. Which meant someone had been watching her. She darted to the door and looked out. Whoever it was, they were long gone. Livia gritted her teeth, but as she looked down, she saw it. A long red hair on the linoleum floor. Amber. Livia went back to Knox's room, hearing him speaking in a loving, tender tone. It's okay Odell, I'm fine. I'll be out of here in a couple of days. I can't bear the thought of anything happening to you or Livia. You're my family." Livia was unbelievably touched. Who would have thought she meant so much to the Ice Queen? She knocked gently at the door and poked her head in, smiling at them both. Roan had disappeared. I hope I'm not intruding. Not at all, baby. Odell came to her and hugged her, and Livia returned the embrace. We're okay, Odell, really. Odell sniffed and Livia realized she was crying again. The other woman drew away finally, wiping her eyes. Sorry. Don't worry about it. Livia smiled at her then went to Knox, taking his hand. Odell gathered herself. Look, I can get on the phone right now and have protection set up here, at the home, at the restaurant and your office, Knox. Knox nodded. That would be a weight off. Thanks, Odie. Odell got straight on her cell phone, stepping out into the hallway. Livia nudged Knox. Odie. He grinned. I'm the only one she lets call her that. And even then, only on special occasions. Like being shot in the head. Like that. They both laughed, the tension lifted by the joke. Knox kissed her. By the way, I'm liking the hot scrubs look. Livia rolled her eyes. I'm filthy. Look baby, I'll get Sandor to take you home. Eat proper food, grab a shower and some sleep. I'm not going anywhere. It did sound tempting and after a while, Livia agreed. As long as someone is with you. I don't think Odell is going anywhere. Where did Roan go? Knox shook his head. He got choke up, mumbled something about being sorry and left. Odell is annoyed with him about something. They sat in silence for a while, holding hands. Livia cleared her throat. Knox? I have this feeling. A feeling that whoever is behind all this, is close to us. To you. I agree. She studied him. Do you think? Roan. Knox sighed. I hate saying this, but I can't imagine anyone else. He's been drinking, he's broke. Isn't he marrying Odell? Knox's mouth set in a straight line. He is. 
and he should think himself lucky. But it still doesn't guarantee him any money. Odell's father won't permit it. Livia looked at him askance. Odell's father realizes this is the 21st century, right? I don't mean he won't consent to the marriage, but Odell is an heiress. She doesn't have money of her own, it's all tied up in her trust fund, which her father can withdraw at any time. So, why is Odell marrying him anyway? Knox gave her a strange, half-sad smile. Because she loves him. Knox would Roan shoot you. I can only tell you that Roan is a superb marksman. If it was him, then he didn't intend to kill me. Knox looked sick at having to say the words. When I get out of here, beautiful, we need to talk about a lot of things. Your safety is paramount. Our future, too. Odell tells me they have your name in the press. They'll be hounding you at the college and at the restaurant, too. I can cope with that. Knox studied her. You have no idea what they're like. Vultures. They'll dig up anything on you. Livia shrugged. I have no skeletons. Then I have to warn you, Knox said, his handsome face serious, they'll make some up just for you. Things really are about to get crazy. Odell thanked the doorman as she made her way into her apartment building. He called her back. Mr. St. Mark is waiting upstairs for you. Odell nodded, her face impassive. Thank you, Glenn. She took the elevator up to her penthouse and stepped out into the atrium. Roan was slumped against the wall. He looked up at her, desperation in his eyes, and Odell's plan to send him away evaporated. She had never seen him look so desolate. She crouched next him. What is it, Roan? What's the matter? Roan began to sob as he blurted out the words. They're going to say it was me, Odell. They're going to say it was me, that girl, Pia. I was with her the night she was killed, and they're going to say it was me. The police investigation brought up nothing, and as it drew nearer to Christmas and the weather finally turned cold, Livia and Knox holed up in his mansion. Livia only left for work or school, and Knox for any business meetings he couldn't do from home. Neither of them said it, but the self-imposed nearness seemed to have opened up a new element to their relationship, a new intimacy, a closeness they had not known was missing. Of course their more adventurous exploits had now been restricted to their bedroom. Odell had hired what appeared to be an army of protection for Knox and Livia, and even they were a little stunned by how much of their lives was restricted now. I can't send them away. Odell would kill me, and I like to restrict being murdered to just once a year. Knox grinned at Livia, who laughed. It does get in the way of stuff, doesn't it? I mean, I was just murdered the other day, and I had a whole bunch of laundry to do. How inconvenient. Isn't it? They had been joking with each other like this, since Odell had told them about Roan. He had been sleeping with Pia, and had been with her the night she was killed. Odell had persuaded him to go to the police and speak to them. He had been questioned and then charged on suspicion of murder. Odell had paid the $2 million bail money, and now Roan was locked away in her apartment until the trial. Neither Knox nor Livia could believe the turn of events. Worse, when Roan was questioned about the night Knox and Livia had been attacked, he couldn't provide an alibi. The police, desperate to find someone guilty for Pia's murder, had used Knox's rejection of Roan's business proposition as motive. Their case is weak, Roan's lawyer William Corcoran told them when they met at Knox and Sandor's offices, but at the moment, he is the only person with motive and we know he was with the girl. I understand you have arranged a 24-hour guard on him, Ms. Griffin G. Odell pale and drawn nodded. He's not going anywhere, Mr. Corcoran. He wants to be proved innocent. Livia took Odell's hand and squeezed it. We're here for you, Odell. She couldn't bring herself to say that she was there for Roan too, she could well believe that he would hurt Knox and Pia to keep her from telling Odell about their affair. Odell looked shattered, and Livia's heart went out to her. We never did get our girl talk, did we? she said in a low voice to Odell as Knox and Sandor were talking to the lawyer. We should do that. Soon. Odell nodded. I'll come by your restaurant around lunchtime tomorrow, if that's okay. Sure. 
The next day, Morico and Marcel gave her a hard time, and she couldn't blame them. She had called them from the hospital, but wouldn't allow them to visit. She told them it was because Knox had too many visitors already, but truthfully, she didn't want Morico and Marcel on the killer's radar any more than they already were by associating with her. Pia had barely been a part of the circle, and now she was dead. No one was safe. Morico took one look at the cut on Livia's head, and her mouth set in an angry line. And you didn't mention that, either. I slipped on some water at the hospital. No biggie. She hadn't told them about being attacked. Marcel shook his head at her. This is serious, Liv. I don't want you hurt. Livia nodded back at the two huge bodyguards sitting in the restaurant. It's okay. Those two are always with me, unfortunately. She dumped her bag in the back room and went into the kitchen to wash her hands. She felt tired and drained, but at least she was back to doing something familiar. Knox had been reluctant to see her back at work, but couldn't dissuade her. I have responsibilities, baby. Now she tied her apron around her dress and went out front. The restaurant was quiet, the lunchtime rush away off yet, and Morico and Livia polished wine glasses and chatted as they laid out the tables. So I have news, Morico said with a grin, and Livia's eyebrows shot up. She glanced at Marcel, which made Morico roll her eyes. Will you stop with that? I adore Marcel, but I also work for him. No, it's not Marcel, but I did meet someone. Who? Not ready to say yet. But I am giving up the apartment. I thought you should know. You're moving in with whoever it is. Livia was shocked, but Morico just stuck her tongue in her cheek and gave her friend a defiant stare. Livia grinned sheepishly. Yep, she had no right to be scandalized. Sorry. Where are you moving to? Morico told her, and Livia whistled. It was an upscale apartment building in the city, a block or two from where Odell lived. Very nice. It has one of those old-fashioned elevators, like you see in French movies. All wrought iron and fancy schmancy. Morico sounded so proud that Livia couldn't help but giggle. Fancy. You bet it's fancy. Hey, maybe we'll have to do soirees like you do with all your fancy new friends. Livia grinned. Shut up. Well, I'm happy for you, boo. When do we get to meet Captain Elevator? Ha ha. And soon, hopefully. At least tell me his first name. Nope. Live with it. Spoilsport. Odell arrived just after 1 page M, and Livia took her break. They sat two tables away from Livia's conspicuous bodyguards. Odell looked amused. It must be strange for you to have them around. Livia nodded. It is, but don't think I'm not grateful, Odell. You can call me Odie if you like. Livia smiled at her. You've been a true friend to me and Knox, Odie. The other woman flushed a little. I'm not good at making friends, she said, especially with women. They don't trust me, for some reason. I don't know why, it's not like I'm sleeping around with their men. Unlike Amber. Livia sighed. I've been having doubts about her, tracing back to what you said. But at the same time, she hasn't done anything wrong, I don't think. Certainly, Knox doesn't see anything amiss, and I'm hesitant to say anything negative. They're so close. Understandable. Look, maybe I'm biased. I've never liked the woman, and now that I know she was sleeping with Roan. Was? Odell smiled. As soon as she knew I found out, she dumped him. Amber has no use for men after the wife or girlfriend finds out. She looked at Livia. Does that upset you? Livia nodded. I wanted to believe she was a good one. I thought that she was. Livy, you're your own woman. Do I think Amber is malicious? Not where Knox is concerned, certainly, and to be fair, she seemed to take to you two. So, if we rule out Amber and Roan, who else would have a grudge against Knox? Even saying the words made Livia tremble. I honestly don't know. We both know Sandor is straight as a die. He's a teddy bear. Odell smiled. He is. He's a good one. 
if only I'd fallen for him instead. Livia chuckled. I would pay to see that. So, anyone else? Well, there is someone. An ex-girlfriend of Knox's. Well, not really a girlfriend, but a fling. At least for Knox. Janine Dupois. Has Knox mentioned her? Livia shook her head. No, but we've never actually had the ex talk, so I don't blame him for not doing so. Who is she? Fashion editor and socialite. I heard she moved to New York, but made the mistake of trying to break into the scene up there without proving herself. Livia rolled her eyes and Odell laughed. It's the way it works, I'm afraid. If Knox and I are going to be long-term and I hope so, I do hope I won't be expected to become. Like me. But Odell was smiling, and Livia squeezed her hand. You know what I mean. I'm not a socialite. I don't know anything about that world. Odell studied her. You know, Knox is a pretty down-to-earth guy. He wouldn't, couldn't, have fallen for someone who wasn't suited to him. Don't ever be afraid you won't fit in, Livy. When Livia arrived home later, she was feeling more optimistic than she had in weeks. Knox arrived a little after her, and she went to greet him at the door. She kissed him tenderly. I missed you. She took his hand and immediately led him up the stairs. Knox was grinning. Well, if this is how you miss me. In their bedroom, Livia pulled his tie from his neck, kissing his chest as she unbuttoned his shirt. Knox slowly unzipped her dress, his fingertips trailing up and down her spine. As she pushed his shirt aside, her tongue found his nipple, as her fingers unzipped his fly and reached into his pants. His pecker was already hard as she freed it from his pants, and she chuckled as she heard his sharp intake of breath. She pushed him down on the bed and tugged his pants off. Just lay back, baby. I'm in charge. She wiggled out of her dress and Knox Wolf whistled at her. Livia grinned, but then knelt between his legs and took him in her mouth. She heard his long groan of desire as she sucked, tasted, and teased him, and when he was close and tried to pull away, she shook her head. Livia swallowed him, and then shrieked with laughter as he swept her onto the floor and started to kiss her furiously, as if an animal had been unleashed inside him. He sucked her breast and she was writhing beneath him, so turned on she thought she might pass out. Then as he moved down her body, licking, tasting her, she moaned as his mouth found sweet spot. Gosh, Knox. He pleasured her until she was begging him to take her, and then he launched himself into her, pressing her knees to her chest and slamming his hips against hers. Livia screamed her pleasure, not caring if every security guard in the place heard her. She lost herself in this heady delirium, kissing him, telling him again and again how much she loved him. Finally, exhausted, they climbed into bed and wrapped themselves around the other. They kissed and chatted quietly, enjoying the time together. Odell called me Livy and I get to call her Odie, Liv said with wide eyes making Knox laugh. She told me she adores you. You don't bullshit, she likes that. You are a lot closer to her than I first thought, Liv observed, which makes me think we, you and I, that is, should spend more time getting to know each other. Knox laughed. As long as we can keep doing that too. Hell yes. So. So, what do you want to know? More about Ariel, if it's not too painful. Knox was silent for a while, then nodded. Okay. Livia stroked his face. In your own time, baby. It's all right, Livy, I'm not going to break down. The psychiatrist I've been seeing has helped me immeasurably. He paused for a moment, taking a deep breath. Here goes. We met when we were kids, when Ariel and Amber's family moved here. Their parents were nice people, moderately wealthy like us, and Amber's father was a business associate of my dad's. Ariel and I hit it off straight away. You know she and Amber were twins? Non-identical. Ariel had dark brown hair and dark eyes like yours. She always thought she was the plain one, which was a joke. Livia remembered seeing the photographs of Ariel. She was lovely. I know you've told me how she died. Maybe it would help to talk through what happened in the days leading up to her death. Knox looked at her for a long time then nodded. Okay. Okay then, let's talk. Chapter 19 
20 years ago. Ariel fixed Knox with a determined stare, trying not to giggle. I've thought long and hard about it, and I think I know the perfect outfit for prom for both of us. Knox grinned at her, knowing well the look of mischief in her eyes. Oh yeah. Hit me with it. Ariel stood, and proceeded to shuffle sideways then back again rapidly on her carpeted floor. Knox burst out laughing. What the hell? I'm giving you a clue, she said breathlessly, then started to do the running man, moving her arms and legs energetically. You are quite insane, Miss Duplas, and I have no earthly idea what's going on here. Imagine baggy pants. Ariel moved up and down her bedroom, flailing her arms and urging him to guess. Maybe if I sing. She began to intone Oa repeatedly as she moved, then came to an abrupt halt shouting, Stop! Knox finally got it. Hammer time! He collapsed with laughter as Ariel cheered, then collapsed on the bed beside him, panting for air. So, what do you think? We both go in hammer pants and screw the patriarchy. Why should I wear a dress? You could wear anything and still be the queen of the ball. Ariel pretended to puke, and Knox laughed. You really can't take a compliment, Ari, you know that? You know me, Noxy. I leave the cotillions and debutante stuff to Amber. It's her thing. Knox sensed an undercurrent in her voice. What's up? Ariel shrugged. Nothing, really. We're just having one of our timeouts. We're not getting along particularly well at the moment. Any reason? Ariel hesitated, then shrugged. Just reasons. Knox wound a long lock of her hair around his fingers. You don't want to talk about it. Not really. So, now that you know what I've planned for prom. Knox grinned. You think I don't know you by now. You say that, then I turn up in hammer pants, and you'll look like some ethereal goddess in a perfect gown. I still remember junior prom. Remember. That was hilarious. For you. My mom spent weeks on my sailor costume. Ariel giggled. So, so gullible, Mr. Renault. She bent her head and kissed him, lingering over his lips. Now, seriously, do you want to see my dress? I ask because, it has some complicated fastening, and you may need to practice if you want to get it off me. Knox's smile widened. Like most couples, they had planned for prom night to be the first time they slept together, even though they'd done practically everything else already. Neither of them could wait. You know, it might be a good idea. Ariel sent him out of the room while she changed and when she was ready, called him back. Knox pushed the door open and his breath caught in his throat. The pale gray chiffon draped beautifully over her body, clinging to her curves and setting off the pink tones in her creamy white skin. Wow. Wow. Knox walked to her, cupping her face in his. You look insanely gorgeous. Ariel blushed but laughed. That is the correct answer. You may kiss me now. The kiss went on for so long that Ariel, laughing, had to push him away. One more day, Knox, and we'll finish that kiss and then some. Knox nodded. Then, I'd better get out of here before you make it impossible for me. And your blue balls. And my blue balls. He grinned as she squeezed his groin. Damn woman, you're impossible. You know it. She stood on her toes to kiss him. Tomorrow, Knox Renault. Prom night. Ariel and Amber got ready separately, each in their own rooms, not communicating at all. As she finished her makeup and slipped into the gray dress, Ariel considered going to see her sister, trying to bridge the strange chasm that had opened up between them lately. She had lied to Knox yesterday about what was causing the void, it was Knox himself. Ariel knew Amber was in love with him, and did not blame her sister or Knox for it. Knox was easy to love. Amber knew she would never be with him, and to her credit, she didn't even try to take him from her sister, but, her way of dealing with it was to keep her distance from both of them. Ariel tapped cautiously on her sister's door. Ams. Still changing. Flat tone, no invitation in it. Ariel sighed. Okay, well I'm just going to grab a smoke outside. Distract mom if she comes to look for me? I will. 
Ariel stepped out into the sultry Louisiana evening. Sweat popped up on her skin immediately and she cursed, hoping she wouldn't end up with pit stains, this chiffon was too good for that kind of treatment. Not that Knox would give a crap, she smiled to herself fondly, shaking a cigarette from her pack. Her mother probably knew she smoked, but it was a strict don't ask don't tell policy in her house. She walked around the main house to where she sneaked her smokes, out of sight of the house. Hidden by the trees draped with Spanish moss, she breathed in the night air. The bayou was extra smelly on nights like this, the stench of rot creeping across the night. Ariel flicked her butt to the ground, and using the toe of her shoe to stub it out, she turned to go back in. The first thing she registered was a stinging in her neck, then a wave of breathlessness, as whatever had been injected into her flooded her veins. She barely had time to acknowledge that someone had grabbed her before everything went dark, and she passed out. Cold. She was lying down and whatever it was, it was cold against her back. She shivered despite the heat of the night, and then opened her eyes. Her head whirled, her eyes were blurry, and her chest felt heavy. Focusing, she saw him, she assumed it was a him. He was sitting on her legs, straddling her. He was so still that it frightened her, as if he had been waiting for her to wake. Ariel looked around, and felt a wave of panic. They were in a graveyard. What the hell is going on? Her voice trembled, as the black hooded figure seemed to look right at her. She couldn't see any features, and the stranger's silence was making her panic even more. Please, whatever you want. Her voice trailed off when she saw the knife in his hand, and she knew. Oh God, please, please don't. He didn't listen. Before Ariel could scream, he clamped a gloved hand over her mouth and plunged the knife into her belly over and over. Ariel's back arched up as she moaned in agony as he murdered her. His hand fell away from her mouth when he saw she was struggling to breath. Why? Ariel gasped as her killer sat back to watch her bleed out. A tear ran down her cheek. Please tell me, why? But he never answered her. Knox was getting into his car when his mother called him back. Her face was tense. Amber's on the telephone. She's hysterical, and I can't understand what she's saying. It took Knox a few moments to realize Amber was telling her Ariel was missing. They found her body the next morning, and a devastated, distraught Knox drove straight to the cemetery. He fought with a police officer who wouldn't let him near her, so much so that they had to cuff him to calm him down. Please, please let me see her. In the end, to appease him, he was the son of a powerful New Orleans scion after all, and possibly to gauge his reaction, they let him see her. The sight of Ariel, gutted and broken, her gray chiffon soaked in blood, lying pale and dead on the grave, brought Knox to his knees. Something inside him died. The funeral was hell for Knox. He barely acknowledged anyone else, not even Amber or Teague, when they tried to reach him. Amber was destroyed by her sister's death, she was changed forever by it. Eventually, the society around them got back to normal, but Knox and Amber spent more time together, feeling disenfranchised from everyone. The police had no leads. Knox had an airtight alibi, and so the police quickly ran out of clues. The case got put on the back burner, much to the rage of the Duplas and Renault families. Then almost exactly a year later, Tynan Renault murdered his wife and son and shot himself, and Ariel's case was pushed even further to the background. Now. Livia stroked Knox's face as he told her everything. I always felt guilty because when my family died, Ariel was almost forgotten by our circle, by the press, by the police. He sighed, leaning his forehead against hers. I swore I would never let that happen, and yet I was so utterly destroyed by what my father had done. It was almost as if Ariel had been relegated to a place where young, beautiful women are viewed as probable targets just by being young, beautiful, and female. Livia kissed his eyelids. Sadly though, it does seem to be a truth. We women always have to be careful. Don't go out alone at night, because a man might rape or kill you. Don't dress a certain way, we're told, as if we're the ones responsible for not making a man rape or kill us. It's sick and disgusting, but it is how we live in this world. Knox shook his head. Christ. What a messed up way to live. And yet normal for every woman on the planet. She sighed, 
thinking about the terror of her recent assault. How close she had come to death. Can I just apologize for my gender? Livia laughed. No, you cannot. You're one of the good ones, Knox, and don't forget it. Don't take the responsibility of others on your shoulders. Just promise me we'll raise our sons not to think of women solely as sexual beings. Knox kissed the tips of her fingers. Absolutely promise, and our sons. Livia flushed. I'm not presuming anything, just if it happens. Gosh, I hope so. He pressed his lips to hers, pulling her close. I want a bunch of them with you, Livia. But you're young, and you have your career in front of you. Waitressing. Yeah, I'll get right on that. Knox laughed. I meant your music career. Oh, that. Knox, I love music. It is my passion. But I never envisioned a career in music as such. I want to be good enough to teach it, like Charvy. I would love that. Maybe play some small concerts here and there, but as far as a fully-fledged career as a musician, I think that's a pipe dream. You don't want to be famous. Good God, no. No, ah, uh, can you imagine? The press everywhere. Wait. Yeah, you can imagine. Gosh, I'm dense. Sorry. Knox laughed. It's okay. You know, once they get hold of the fact we're dating, you have them to look forward to. Livia groaned and rolled on top of him. Let's not worry about that at the moment. I'm hoping to put that off for as long as we can. Agreed. Promise. Knox didn't realize just how soon that promise would be broken. Chapter 20 At work the next day, the restaurant was so full of customers that Livia and Morico didn't have time to catch their breath, let alone catch up. Livia had mentioned to Knox that she wanted to see more of Morico. I feel since I moved out that we've been drifting apart, and I would hate that. Mori's my girl, you know. She said as much to Morico when they were finally relieved of duty by the evening staff. Morico asked Livia to come back to her new apartment, wanting to show off, she said with a grin. Shadowed discreetly by Livia's bodyguard, they went to Morico's new apartment building, traveling up to the seventh floor in the wrought iron old-fashioned elevator. Fancy, Livia said with a wink at Morico, who grinned. Jealous? Not that you need to be, living in a freaking mansion. Ha! Huh? Listen to us, we're both kept women. What happened to the sisterhood? Livia sat down on a vast dark blue couch. Gosh, this is heavenly. Morico laughed. I know, right? And speak for yourself, I pay Lucas rent. Lucas, is it? Tell me more, girl. You've been keeping this Lucas secret for too long. Morico handed Livia a bottle of beer and sat down next to her. Well, if I saw more of you. Livia punched her shoulder lightly. I know, I'm sorry. I always swore I wouldn't be one of those women who deserted her friends when she fell in love, but I seem to be doing just that. I am sorry, Maury. I'll do better. How are things out on the bayou? Livia talked to Morico about her life with Knox, about how close they had become, and her friend listened with a frown on her face. Sure you two aren't becoming codependent. Livia was stung. What do you mean? Morico sighed. I mean, how long have you actually known each other? Not even two months, right? You moved in with him, less than a day after giving him the whole I'm an independent woman speech I might add, and now you're practically imprisoned in that place. The place where your boyfriend got shot for Christ's sakes. Morico stopped, dragging a shaky breath into her lungs. Livia had never seen her so riled up before. Maury? Where's this coming from? I mean, I. No, let me finish. I'm scared, Liv, I'm terrified. I feel like something bad is going to happen to you, like you might die. Like Knox is a dangerous person to be around, and something, someone, could hurt you, and then his circle of friends will close ranks and will never really find out what happened. Livia was stunned for a long moment. I know the thing with Pia is horrific, and yeah we got assaulted but… and his girlfriend was murdered and his family got killed. Jeez. Death follows him around, Livia. 
Look, I like Knox, I do. I just don't think he's good for you. Livia felt her eyes fill with tears. Having Maury's blessing for her relationship was important to her, and she hadn't seen this coming. So what? You want me to leave him? Yes. Are you kidding me? Livia blinked at the sudden change in the atmosphere between them, and looking closely at her friend, she could see the strain on her face, the dark circles under her eyes. Maury, is something else going on? Are you okay? No, I'm not okay, Maury yelled suddenly, making Livia jump. Geez, every time I get a phone call, I think it's the police telling me you're dead. Dude, you are way overreacting. No, I'm not. Someone shot your boyfriend, attacked you in a freaking hospital, butchered a young girl to send Knox a message. Everyone you love. Jeez. Liv. Maury was trembling, but she backed away when Livia tried to hug her. I had no idea you felt this way. You are my family, Morco said fiercely, my sister. I'm scared, Liv. This time she let Livia hug her. It's okay, Maury, really. Look at the hulking slab of beef I have outside the door. Actually, that's mean. Jason is very nice and he's protecting me. Don't you see how messed up it is that you have a bodyguard? Maury clearly wasn't going to let this go, Livia thought in dismay. Look, I get it, I do. But it's only until they catch the guy, Maury. Knox is a powerful man, he's bound to attract weirdos. Even to Livia's ears, that sounded like a feeble way to describe what they were going through. Morico looked at her with cold eyes for a long minute, then stood and went into her bedroom. Livia heard her moving around, then she re-emerged carrying a stuffed manila folder. She flung it at Livia. Just a weirdo, huh? Livia caught the folder, papers scattering everywhere. She slid down to the carpet to spread them out. Old police reports, clippings from newspapers. Livia saw the photographs of a young Knox, dressed in an exquisite suit, being comforted by his mother as a medical examiner, and his team removed Ariel's body from the cemetery. The photos of the funeral, the intrusion even into this most private of days, was jarring and sickening. All of the photos were accompanied by sensationalist press, condemning the young man before Ariel's body was even cold. The blood on the gravestone. Then later, Knox alone at a funeral service, standing in front of the caskets of his mother and his brother. The look in his eyes was searing, and Livia couldn't help the sob that escaped her. Morico didn't attempt to comfort her. Again, the press eviscerated Knox, the only survivor. Had he been in it with his father? He was the only heir now, after all. Morico, if you believe any of these lies about Knox, I don't see how we can continue to be friends. She looked up to see Maury's eyes soften. Of course I don't. I want to kill them for what they did to that poor boy. But Liv, you have to see. Darkness follows Knox. He couldn't have a more appropriate name, could he? I can't leave him. I love him so much. He really is a good man. What kind of person would I be to leave him now? A person who stays alive. The coldness was back. Livia closed her eyes and rubbed her face with her hands. To say she felt as if her equilibrium was smashed was an understatement. Morico was the balls out one of them, the ride or die girl, and now she was telling Livia to cut and run. No. Livia stood, gathering the folder to her. Can I keep this for a while? Sure. A long silence, then Livia sighed. I better go. Okay. Morico didn't follow her to the door, and Livia felt her heart falter as she turned to look at her friend. Soon. Morico gave a stiff nod. Stay safe, babe. Livia made it back into Knox's town car before she burst into tears. Knox was actually finding success in putting everything to the back of his mind, although not for the greatest reason. Sandor had come to him that morning and said two words that made him sit up and take notice. Hostile takeover. Knox looked up sharply as Sandor came into the room. What did you say? You heard, Knox. Sandor sat down heavily. I can't believe we didn't see this. Oh, back up. 
What are you talking about? I'm talking about Roderick Lefevre and his gang of merry men. So, they only have 30% share in the company. Not anymore. Seems Rod has been quietly buying up every last share that you and I don't own. What the heck? Knox's adrenaline pumped through his veins. How do you know? Sandor smiled without humor. Rod had one holdout. Zeke Manners. Zeke called me and told me Rod was offering him three times market price. Zeke told him to drop dead. He sighed. I blame myself. If I hadn't urged you to float the company, we would still retain overall control. Wait, Knox looked aghast, you're saying we don't? Do the math, Knox. We gave up 51%. Sandor sighed and leaned forward. Look, whatever Rod's planning, we've still got with Zeke's shares a majority. It just means we have to bring Rod in as partner, due to the deal we made. It's not the end of the world. When Knox got home that night, he heard Livia playing piano and went to the music room to find her. He stood at the door watching her, her fingers moving lightly over the keyboard, her body swaying to the melody. He went to her, bending to kiss the soft skin of her shoulder. Don't stop, he said as she started slightly, so Livia continued to play while he sat down beside her. He put his arms around her waist and buried his face in her hair. The hell with work and everything else, he thought. This is all I want, this woman. She and I, us. Nothing else matters. Come away with me for Christmas, he murmured. We'll go somewhere where no one can find us, nothing can bother us. You and me and a log cabin in the mountains. A white Christmas. His lips were at her ear, then they trailed down her neck and he felt her shiver. She stopped playing and turned to kiss him. That sounds perfect. Just perfect. I'm just so sick of everyone interfering in our relationship, in our lives, our work. All I want is you, Livia, for all time. She wound her arms around his neck. And I you. Just you. He kissed her deeply, pouring all the love he felt for her into the kiss, leaving them both breathless. I love you, Livia whispered, brushing her lips back and forth against his. Knox smiled and standing pulled her to her feet. Come with me. He led her into his study, and to the huge globe he kept in there. Pick somewhere, anywhere in the world, and that's where we'll go. Anywhere. I know you won't let me splurge on you often. Unless it's to buy freaking Steinways for my college, she interrupted, grinning, and Knox inclined his head with a grin. Touché, but please let me do this. Let me give you the most romantic, over-the-top Christmas. It's our first one together. Let this be my gift to you. Livia studied him for a long moment then smiled. I guess for our first one, it would be grinchy of me to decline. Okay then, Knox Renault, this one's on you, with two conditions. By the grin on her face, he knew she was about to make a joke. Go ahead. One next year it's my choice, my budget. As long as you promise there will be a next year, and a year after that, and after that, and so on. She kissed him tenderly. God yes, I promise. His arms tightened around her, and he gazed down at her lovely face. And the second one. He deliberately pressed his heart on against her, making her sigh happily. That you never ever make me listen to that god-awful Mariah Carey song. Knox laughed. What? We belong together. Ha ha no, I actually love that one. And we do. Knox kissed her again. Yes we do. Now stop prevaricating and choose somewhere to go on vacation. Livia hummed over the globe, spinning it gently. What about you? Where do you want to go for Christmas? All I want for Christmas is you, Knox said innocently, then laughed as she punched his arm. Ouch, devil woman. Have you made up your mind? Okay, Livia said, closing her eyes and spinning the globe. Wherever I put my finger, we go there. Deal. She let the globe spin a couple of times before pushing her finger against it. That's the middle of the Pacific Ocean, doofus, spin again. Darn it. She repeated her process, but before she could open her eyes to see where she had landed this time, Knox turned her and spun the globe around. I didn't see where I landed, she complained to him, but he just smiled. 
I know. I'm going to leave it as a surprise until the day. Can you get the time off work? She nodded. Marcel closes for five days over Christmas, but he'll need me back for New Year's Eve. Understandable. I'll be partying at your place that night too. They wandered slowly to the kitchen, hand in hand, and Knox pulled open the refrigerator. Pasta? That's good. Livia sat on the tallest stool and watched him prepare their meal. So, yeah, you're really not going to tell me where we're going? For as long as I can keep it secret. We'll use my private jet, yes we will just this once, he shot her a glare. I know, the environment, yada yada, but this will be the last time. I'm selling it afterward, so allow me this one last play with my boy toy. Livia grinned. I like playing with your boy toy. Rude girl. You're really selling it? Livia was impressed. Knox grinned ruefully. Your guilt tripping worked, Enviro woman. Livia snorted with laughter. Seriously, the dullest sounding superhero name. Isn't it? Knox dumped some onion and garlic into a pan and chopped some herbs. Where did you learn to cook, Renault? Livia reached over to steal a piece of Parmesan cheese, grinning when Knox batted her hand away. Mom. Italian, you see. Did you ever spend a lot of time in Italy? Knox nodded as he expertly skinned some tomatoes. Long summer vacations. The heat is intense, drier than here but still. Dad owned some olive groves and vineyards which we spent hours in picking fruit. We stayed in rustic villas and drank wine with every meal, and it was heaven. Simple life. Livia tugged on a lock of his hair gently. You sound as if you want to go back. I haven't been since my parents died. I was waiting for you to come along. I can see us spending summers like that, making love and walking around the hills of Tuscany. Florence is beautiful. Or watching our kids run and play. He stopped and gave a little laugh. Doesn't it seem surreal to you that we've only known each other this short time and yet we're talking about kids and the future? Livia successfully stole another piece of cheese. Popping it into her mouth, she grinned. I think it's what happens in all relationships. Right now, I can't imagine doing that with anyone else. He kissed her, brushing her lips with his. Me either. They ate together, then shared a long soak in the tub. Livia leaned back against his chest as he traced patterns with the soap bubbles along her body. Knox? Yeah, babe? Do you think we're codependent? Knox looked askance. No. What the hell? Just something Moriko said. Knox was silent for a while. She doesn't like me. She does, Livia sat up and turned to face him. She does, she just thinks, with all that's going on that... Gosh, I don't know. He cupped her face in his hand. This is really worrying you, right? She nodded. We didn't leave things in the best place, but I don't know how to fix it. She wants me to break up with you and there's no way that's happening. She actually said that. Knox rocked back a little, hurt. Livia nodded, her face miserable. She's worried someone's going to kill me because of our relationship. Knox sighed. Well, I can't blame her for thinking that. It's something I wrestle with every day. Why should I force all this shit on you? Livia shook her head. Don't go falling into the trap of thinking you have any responsibility for this. I just wish that we knew who and why this was happening. Knox, I think we should look into things ourselves. I just have this feeling, and I don't know where it comes from, that there are things from Ariel's murder and your family's deaths that are right in front of us and yet we can't see. Everyone said they couldn't believe your dad would turn on his family. Well, I believe that too. Even though I never met him, anyone who could bring a man like you into the world couldn't be bad. Knox's eyes were soft. I love you for saying that. But do you feel it too? Slowly he began to nod. I do. I always have, it's just I've never had someone in my corner. I never had you. I think we were destined to meet Livy, not just because we fell in love, but because we were meant to heal each other. Dang, he added with a grin, that was cheesy. 
maybe we are codependent. Livia laughed and kissed him. Yep, let's not get too intense here. All I'm saying is, let's be proactive and look at everything and everyone who could be behind this. Because one thing is for sure. What's that? Her smile faded, but she looked at him steadily. It's someone we know. And with a sinking heart, Knox nodded. I know. I know it is. Chapter 21 Two days before they were due to fly out to wherever Knox was taking Livia for Christmas, Livia had to perform at her end-of-semester concert. She sat in the dressing room now, surrounded by her fellow students as they got ready. She felt sick to her stomach. Charvi had decided that Livia would finish the show with her new composition, and worse, every single one of her friends would be there to watch, except Morico. I have to work, sweetie. Morico had apologized to her over the phone. Both Marcel and I wanted to come, but one of us has to be here. He won. I'm sorry, boo. Livia had reassured her that it was okay, but she knew Morico had probably volunteered to stay behind at the restaurant. Things hadn't been the same since they had last seen each other. Livia took a deep breath in, listening to the music from the concert hall as it was piped back through the speakers into the dressing room. As each performer was called, the room got emptier until Liv was left alone. Because she was in college, she had asked Jason to stay outside, not wanting the extra attention of a bodyguard around her. She needed to breathe to get herself into a space where she could perform. She went to splash her face in the small restroom. Looking in the vanity mirror, she saw how pale she was, she hadn't slept well the night before. She rubbed her cheeks to get some color into them, hearing the dressing room door open. Expecting the stagehand coming to call her, she was surprised when there was silence. She walked back into the dressing room. A hand was clamped over her face, an arm hooked around her waist, and she was thrown to the floor. Not having time to scream, Livia kicked out at her attacker. Not again, no way. But this time, he was so much stronger, pressing his forearm against her throat, choking off her air supply. In horror, Livia felt him push up her dress, tug at her panties. Oh gosh please no. She kicked out again, her head whirling from lack of oxygen, but desperate to keep him away. He slammed his clenched fist into her stomach and she gasped, doubling up in pain. He ripped her panties from her and forced her legs apart. No please please don't. Her voice was cracked, barely a whisper despite the fact that she was screaming inside her head. She felt him touch her, but to her great relief, he didn't try to rape her. She felt him pulling and jerking at his penis, and realized he was masturbating. He gave a grunt, and she groaned in horror as she felt his semen cover her skin. The knife was in his hand then, pressing against her throat. Tell anyone, and I'll kill all of them. Knox, Amber, Sandor, and your pretty little Asian friend. I will be back for you, Livia, don't forget it. The next time you see me, this, he brandished the knife, will be buried deep inside you, like it was inside of that skank aerial. Then he was gone. The whole attack had taken less than three minutes. Livia lay for a few moments, deeply in shock, before dragging herself up and tidying her clothing. She felt numb. She sat down on the chair again, smoothing the skirt of her dress. She couldn't even cry. A knock at the door and the stagehand, Jim, stuck his head in and beamed at her. Hey Livy, two minutes and you're on. Thanks Jim. He didn't notice her voice was faint and cracking. Livia blinked a couple of times, and then moved like an automaton through the hallways to the wings. Her ears rang, her body trembled and she felt colder than she ever had in her life. She barely registered when she was announced, and she walked onto the stage to applause and whoops of delight from her friends. Automatically her eyes searched the room until she saw Knox and immediately wished she hadn't. She wanted to scream, to cry, to run into his arms. He was smiling and cheering her, but as she stood still, she saw his expression change to one of concern. The audience had stopped applauding and were now murmuring, wondering what was going on. Knox started to stand up, but Livia shook her head and went to sit at the piano. She closed her eyes and took a deep breath in. She began to play, her fingers moving across the keyboard, a slowed-down version of her piece, channeling all her shock, her fear, her pain into the recital. 
She had no awareness of the audience or anyone else as she played, only wanting to reach one person, wanting him to know just how much she loved and needed him. She played for nearly an hour, cycling through every section easily. Her fingers ached, her back was sore as she finished and sat numb and still. The audience broke out into rapturous applause, which broke Livia out of her reverie. Shakily, she stood and moved to the microphone at the front of the stage, opened her mouth to speak, and passed out cold. Chapter 22 Knox looked over at Livia as they flew across the Atlantic Ocean, towards Europe. Livia had hardly said a word since the attack at the concert. After she'd collapsed, he'd been the first to reach her, clambering over the seats to get to her. Charvi, Amber and Sandor had looked on in shock, as he'd carried Livia off stage and to the dressing room. She awoke in his arms, then screamed when she saw where they were. He'd looked around and noticed signs of a struggle, her torn panties and his weeping love, and he knew what had happened. At the hospital, they did a rape kit, even though she told them her attacker did not penetrate her. This is still a serious sexual assault, Miss Chatelaine. Let us care for you. Knox insisted she let them tend to her, and then the police came. A kind female police officer took her statement. The rape kit shows he did ejaculate on you, I'm sorry to tell you, so we'll need to ask you for a DNA sample. And Mr. Renault, too. Of course, Knox told her calmly, anything to help. Livia didn't want to stay in the hospital overnight, and so Knox brought her home, putting her to bed and lying down next to her. He stroked her face. If you want me to go sleep somewhere else tonight, he said gently, I won't be offended. Anything you need, baby, just ask. Livia gazed at him. Just hold me, please, Knox. I'm so cold. And so he did, wrapping his arms around her. Neither of them slept. Do you want me to cancel our vacation plans? We can always reschedule. No, she said quickly, I want to go far away. Far, far away, Knox. Is Europe far enough? She half smiled. Europe, is it? He felt her body relax. Yes, that's perfect. He pressed his lips to her forehead. You want me to tell you where? No, keep it a surprise. He studied her face. Her eyes were haunted. I'm so sorry this happened to you, baby. I would do anything to turn back time and prevent it. I swear, the day we find out who it is. Livia shook her head. Please don't. Don't stoop to his level. She hadn't yet told him everything she'd told the police. What aren't you telling me? What did he say to you? Livia hesitated for a long moment. That he was going to kill me the next time he saw me. Like Ariel. Jeez. Knox closed his eyes and drew in a deep breath. That's it. No more sending Jason away. No more late shifts at the restaurant. Liv, please, won't you consider taking a leave of absence? We could stay in Europe, as long as it takes to get the asshole. I want you safe. I'll quit my job at the restaurant. I'm no good to Marcel, if I'm behaving like a scared rabbit every time a stranger comes in. I think he's kind of expecting it anyway. But after New Year's, I don't want to abandon him at his busiest time. Knox's mouth had set in a thin line. Deal, if you agree to extra protection. I'll make sure Marcel is compensated for the lost business. I'll have obvious guards and plainclothesmen there. No one will get to you. But afterward, please, I know it's a lot to ask, but I just want you safe. Livia tried to smile. After all my independent woman rants, I'm agreeing to be a kept woman. A safe woman. An alive woman. After we catch this guy, you can have at the world. Until then, I don't think it's wise to be that exposed. So now, two days later, they were finally on their way to Europe. Livia looked healthier, at least there was that, but she was subdued. He went to sit next to her and took her hand. She turned and smiled at him. Hey you. He leaned in to kiss her, felt her lips move against his. I love you. She tangled her fingers in his curls. Let's make this vacation a time where we forget the horrors of the past, recent and otherwise, and just make this about us. Romance making love. Knox looked vaguely surprised. 
Honey, if you're uncomfortable with intercourse at the moment, we don't have to. She kissed him fiercely. Knox Renault, you better do me good on this vacation, because that's what I intend to do to you. He laughed with a little shocked surprise. Well then, you have a deal. If that was what she wanted, or what she thought she might want, who was he to argue? But Knox knew, if it came down to it and she panicked, he'd be there for her any way she needed him. Hell, if she just wanted to get mad and pummel someone, he'd let her. He was able to distract her from brooding even more as they crossed into Europe. They flew over France and Germany, before he finally relented and told her. Vienna. Or rather, a small ski lodge just outside of it. I thought you would love the musical heritage of the city. Livia looked delighted. Seriously? My God, Knox, you couldn't have chosen better. Actually, you chose it, remember? Livia squinted at him. Are you sure? I swear. Your finger landed on Austria, or near enough. Livia started to giggle at the mischievous expression on his face. What does near enough mean? Where did I really point? Knox shrugged. Somewhere in Kashmir. Livia started to laugh, and she slid over and perched on his knee. You are a bad man. She giggled as he blew raspberries on her shoulders. Crazy boy. Knox grinned up at her. Your boy. Are you mine? I'm your girl always, baby. The ski lodge, located halfway up a mountain, was secluded and private and warmly lit for their arrival. Livia walked around it, her mouth open. This is gorgeous, Knox. Just beautiful. She shrugged out of her coat, a log fire was already burning in the grate. She grinned at Knox. Did you have your Christmas elves come in before we arrived? Something like that, he laughed and held out his hand. Come with me. I have some more surprises for you. In the kitchen, he showed a refrigerator stuffed with every kind of food, ready for their Christmas. And a pantry filled of things made entirely of sugar, butter, and chemicals, Knox said this with a mock serious expression on his face, knowing Livia would laugh. She grinned. Good job. And now the bedroom. He led her along the hallway and pushed open the door to reveal a bedroom, fittingly all in white, with a huge bed in the middle, and a glass window overlooking the mountains, the pines heavy with snow outside. From the living room, at night, you can see the city lit up. This is heavenly, Livia enthused, then nodded at a box on the bed. What's that? Knox grinned a little sheepishly. I was in two minds about this after what's happened, but I think you'll enjoy it. Open it. Livia pulled off the lid of the box and the layer of tissue paper. She began to laugh. Oh, you dirty boy. Inside lay a supple leather harness with creamy brown straps that would lie against her pale skin, crisscrossing her body. A riding crop, lube, and velvet ties were amongst the array of toys Knox had gathered. He grinned. I went shopping. You certainly did. Livia picked up the leather harness and held it against her body. She could tell it would fit perfectly. God, Knox, even looking at this stuff is making me horny. Knox laughed. Can you imagine what shopping for it was like? I did it online, of course, because I'm... Chicken. They both laughed, and Knox curled a lock of her hair around his finger and pulled her toward him. You bet. But also, in the city, there's a very well-known and very well-stocked adult shop. One of Europe's best. I was thinking if we need anything else. Livia wound her arms around his neck, feeling absurdly happy for the first time in a while. Here she could pretend nothing bad was happening to them back home, that the rest of the world was just an illusion. Knox Renault, you make this woman very happy. She pressed her lips to his. Now, what say we grab a shower and something to eat, and then plan our vacation? You want me to slip into this gorgeous harness tonight? Knox grinned. Actually, I was thinking we save it for Christmas Day. As that's tomorrow, I'm okay with that. Just regular old making love tonight then? Oh dang it, he said, rolling in his eyes, if we must. He tickled her until she cried with laughter, then they took a long bath together. Livia worked shampoo into Knox's dark curls, which had grown even wilder of late, 
studying his handsome face. You know, when I look at us as a couple, you wouldn't know there's 12 years between us. You look so much younger than your age. Knox immediately screwed up his face and she laughed. Now that's hot. She poured water over his head to rinse his hair. You know, no one's done that for me since I was a kid, and my mom used to sing to me while she was washing my hair. That's sweet. Every time I see photos of her, I can see you in her features. Not so much your dad. Yeah, that's what everyone said. They ate a small supper, sitting at the large picture windows of the cabin, overlooking the lit-up city. It's so peaceful here, so serene. As long as there isn't an avalanche, Knox grinned as she squeaked in alarm. Relax, I'm kidding. He took her hand. I love you, Livia Chatelaine. She beamed at him. Love you too, rich boy. He laughed. You know, if you married me, it would be your money too. Livia stopped. What? Knox half grinned. Just something to think about. Livia swallowed hard. I wouldn't marry you for your money, Knox. I know that, silly. There was a long silence. Knox, it's only been three months. Which is why I'm not asking the question yet, he said lightly, but she could see the depth of his emotion in his eyes. But make no mistake, I will be asking the question. This is it for me. You are the love of my life, Livia Chatelaine. Tears dropped from her eyes then. And you are mine, Knox Renault. He lifted her left hand and kissed her ring finger. One day. Soon. Later, after they'd made love, Knox lay with his head resting on her stomach, his hands under her hips. Livia tangled her fingers in his hair and brushed her thumbs gently over his face. You handsome, she sang at him. He pulled a face and blew a raspberry on her navel. She giggled. On all fours, he climbed up the bed until their faces were level. He gently bit her bottom lip and then kissed her. She pulled him down so his whole weight was on her and sighed happily. What are you thinking? he asked, kissing her neck all the way down to her shoulders. I'm thinking I wish I could erase the past twenty years for you and make this last forever. Well, he rolled to one side. I can't erase the last twenty years. But I can promise this will last forever. He grinned at her and ran his hand down her body splaying his long fingers over her belly. Livia wriggled with pleasure and looked at him, seeing his expression fall. What is it? He looked away. I wish. I wish my family could have met you. My mom Teague, even my dad. Liv, I've been thinking and thinking and I'm damned if I believe he killed my mom and brother. I want the case reopened. I knew my father, knew him. There's no way he would have done that. I think he was murdered and set up. Liv sat up, nodding, energized by what he said. Good. Good, Knox, I'm glad you're thinking like that because I agree. Let's find out the truth. Something tells me that it's linked to what is going on now. I'm glad, sweetheart, and I'll be with you all the way. He was a good man, Knox said finally, and Livia nodded. She pressed her mouth against his. So are you. The very best. Knox started to shake his head. No, I mess up too often. She didn't let him finish. Everyone makes mistakes, everyone has their demons. You're not perfect. I'm certainly not. No one is. But you and me together, well, I like those odds. She straddled him, and he grinned up at her. Oh, you the boss now? She laughed. I am chief now. You may call me chief. Always ready for action. A fine Native American name. I thank you. Chief? Yes? I think that's my nightstick you've got hold of. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay then. It was late evening when the residential home called Sandor to tell him his father had passed. Sandor listened in silence then thanked the nurse. I'll make the funeral arrangements he told her, stoic as ever, but when he hung up the phone, he felt a shift inside him. Damn it, Dad, couldn't you have waited until after Christmas? He felt bad then. He had known this was coming, that his father was spiraling downwards, but it was still a shock. His last remaining family. Shit. 
His cell phone rang again, and he saw it was Odell calling. Hi Odie, what's up? It's Roan. The police just called me because Knox and Livia are out of town. The seaman Livy's attacker left matched Roan's DNA. Damn that man Sandor. I'm sorry to call and interrupt you, but I didn't know what to do. It's okay, sweetheart. Where's Roan now? I don't know. He's been gone all day. I almost called Amber to see if she was with him, but then I thought I might go off on her, so. I get it. Look, let's meet and talk. Are you at home? I am. I'll come to you, and we'll figure out what to do. He hung up and sighed, knowing he wasn't at all surprised that Roan's DNA had been found on Livia. He wondered how he should break the news to them, but didn't want to interrupt their vacation. Instead he called Amber and got her voicemail. If you know where Roan is, Amber, tell me now. This has gone too far now. Call me back. It was Christmas morning and Knox was cooking eggs for their breakfast, sipping his coffee as he gazed out over the snowy landscape. He heard the shower running and then, a few minutes later, Livia emerged dressed in a thin white robe, her long hair damp. Knox smiled at her. Gosh, what a beautiful sight. Merry Christmas, baby. She stood on her tiptoes to kiss his mouth. Merry Christmas, gorgeous. Hungry? Gosh, yes. They ate breakfast, then as they were brushing their teeth, he saw her grinning to herself. What are you up to with that cheeky smile? She turned to him. Want to open your Christmas present? She nodded down at the belt of her robe and grinning, he hooked a finger into it and pulled it open, leaving her robe to fall open. Underneath, she was wearing the harness he had bought her, the leather crisscrossing her body, her chest and her belly, before sweeping between her legs. Knox got hard immediately. My God! His voice shook and Livia grinned, slipping the robe from her shoulders and taking his hand. Let's go play, baby. As he followed her into the bedroom, he admired her perfectly rounded buttocks, the dimples of Venus, the smooth, flawless skin. His prick strained painfully against his linen pants, and Livia cupped it in her hand. Is that all for me? She looked up at him from beneath her long eyelashes, her mouth parted slightly, and Knox gave a growl of desire. Every inch. I'm going to make love to you so hard, pretty girl. Livia giggled as he swept her up into his arms and onto the bed. He kissed from her neck down to her chest then rimming her belly button with his tongue. Livia squirmed beneath him. To prolong their pleasure, he brought her to near peak then stepped back to strip. Livia watched him, lust in her eyes, a small smile playing around her lips. Knox stripped slowly then, reaching into the box. You want this, he said to her, fisting the root of it, and she nodded. I want to taste you. Knox grinned. In time, beautiful. First, let's tie you up and see how you like the whip. Livia moaned softly. She was beyond turned on. She spread her legs so he could see how much she wanted him. I want you so badly. Knox smiled. Remember our first date? When we talked about anticipation. Well. He tied her hands and feet to the bedposts, then grabbing a tube of warming lube, he slicked some into her. Can you feel the tingle? Livia nodded. Gosh that feels so good. He took the riding crop out of the box. Shall we try this? Where would you like it? Chest and belly, she said breathlessly, then cried out both in pain and excitement as he brought the crop down across her belly, leaving a red welt. You like? More please baby more. Her back arched up as he struck her again, the crop marking a cross on her soft skin. It turned him on so much but he held back. He kissed her passionately as he made love to her. Are you mine? he said, gazing into her eyes, and Livia nodded, her face adorably flushed pink. For all time, she gasped then gave a cry as she finished, her body shuddering and trembling. Gosh I love you Livia, so much so so much. They collapsed, breathless and sated, Knox freeing her from her bonds. Wow, Livia breathed, that's definitely the way to celebrate Christmas. Knox laughed. That's probably quite tame compared to what we could do. We have plenty of time. Livia rolled onto her side, hooking her leg over his body and snuggling into his chest. 
They lay in companionable silence as they caught their breath, kissing softly now and then. Knox gazed down at her. I cannot imagine my life without you now, Liv. It just wouldn't make any sense. I feel the same. Weird, when you think of the coincidences that got us here. I keep thinking, what if you had never decided on Marcel to cater your Halloween party? Or what if I had moved to Seattle, instead of New Orleans? Knox looked surprised. You never mentioned Seattle before. Livia smiled. It was the other option. Morico and I had another roommate, Juno, and she's a Washington girl. You'd like her and her family, actually. It was a toss-up between there and New Orleans. Nola won out. Any reason? Livia gave a small laugh. It was further away from my father. Understood. His arms tightened around her. You don't talk about him a lot. Nothing to say. He's a jerk who never gave a crap about me or mom, so as soon as I could get away from him, I did. Worked multiple jobs at one time to get through my undergrad degree, but I tell you, it was worth every lost hour of sleep. Knox smoothed his hands over her face. Have I ever told you you're my heroine? Liv smirked. Dude, it's not an unusual story, truth be told. So many people don't have access to college when they show so much potential. We had a couple of people in our class who could have, and I'm not exaggerating, gone on to become world-class musicians. They had to drop out after not being able to afford to eat, even working two or three jobs. It was tragic. An idea was forming in Knox's head as she spoke. You know, we could do something about that. Liv grinned at him. You have that I want to save the world look in your eyes again. What's the idea? A charitable foundation, in your name, to help support students with musical ability but who have no means to fund their education or future. Knox saw Liv's eyes fill with tears. Knox? I'm speechless. Could we make it work? With your help? Definitely. Maybe we could get Charvi and some of the music department faculty to help. Would that be something you'd be interested in? Hell yes. But I do have one suggestion. What's that? She touched his face. We should do it in your mother's name. The Gabriella Renault Foundation. Knox felt his throat close. She would have loved that. And I love you for suggesting it. Livia smiled, kissing him softly. But first, Knox, we need to get this thing at home dealt with. Then we can truly move on to better things. I agree. Liv sat up. We should start to make a plan of how we're going to approach this. Knox laughed and pulled her back into his arms. After this vacation, he said firmly. Until then, this is all that matters. Roan St. Mark buried his head in his hands. He had heard Odell take the call that had damned him, and he knew the police would haul him in and arrest him for assaulting Livia, as well as killing Pia. He was a dead man. He walked out of Odell's house with nothing in his hands, nothing in the world. He withdrew as much cash from his checking account as he could, and after debating, he went to Knox's mansion, breaking into the basement. He knew Knox and Livia were away, and that the mansion was empty. He also knew he could live down in Knox's wine cellar, that at least he would have food, drink and shelter. It didn't take him long to find his way down there. He and Knox had found the hidden entrance from the garden when they were kids. He had dumped his cell phone in the city and purchased a bus ticket with his credit card to throw the police off his trail. Hopefully, they would think he was long gone. He found his way into the wine cellar and dumped his bag. Geez, he'd forgotten how damn cold it was down here in the winter. Cold and dark, he grabbed an extra flashlight but just as he lit it he heard the step behind him. Whirling around, he only caught the shape of another human as something heavy connected with his head and everything went dark. Chapter 23 On the last night of their vacation, their blissful, relaxing sensual vacation, Knox and Livia shared a bath in the huge tub. The window overlooked the snow, and they'd lit a bunch of candles to make the room softer, more romantic. Livia didn't know how this vacation, this place, this man could be any more romantic, but the candles were a nice touch. She kissed Knox's temple. 
Can we stay here forever? Knox laughed. It would be nice, huh? But I think eventually, you'd get bored. Besides, it'll be nice to have somewhere we can always guarantee to be stress-free, a safe haven to go when things get bad. Livia stroked her hands down his chest as he laid his head back against her breasts. Speaking of which, yeah. Back to the real world tomorrow. Ah. Uh. Livia laughed. But we have a purpose now, baby. We're finally going to lay every single ghost to rest, however painful it is. I got your back. Knox wound his fingers through hers. Couldn't do it without you. You know what surprises me? What's that? That none of your friends have ever suggested doing it. Really looking into the case, seeing if there's a link between Ariel's murder and what happened to your family. It seems to me that if they are linked, then you are at the heart of it. How come Sandor or Roan or Amber never said to you, come on, let's find out what's really going on here? She sighed and leaned her head against his. Maybe they thought they were protecting you. Maybe. It's a pity Sandor's dad couldn't throw some light on what was going on with your dad. I know they were close. Knox looked surprised. They were business associates, but I wouldn't say they were close. Dad was weirdly protective of Sandor, and it seemed to me that he was shielding him from things Sandor's father did. What I don't know. This is getting complicated. Well, that's kind of why we left things so long. Too many questions, not enough answers. Was Sandor's dad a bad man? I should say, is he a bad man, sorry? Knox considered. He's not someone I would have chosen to hang out with. I guess the apple fell far from that tree. Knox nodded. Very far. Sandor is one of the best men I've ever known. She smiled fondly and pulled him back against her, kissing the top of his head, running her hands down his chest. You like everybody. He laughed. Yeah. He lifted himself off her and with much splashing, turned to face her. I like you best. He pulled her to him, his hand gathered up the damp hair from her neck, the other slipped between her legs. She sighed at his touch as he buried his face in her neck. He pulled the plug out, and as the water drained away, they wrapped themselves around each other, tangled limbs, making love until they were both exhausted, laughing, and sweating on the bathroom floor. Later, as Livia slept, Knox went over what she had said. Yeah, this was going to be complicated. Back in the day when his family had died, DNA profiling wasn't such a big thing, but now he wondered if it would help in any way. Could he have his family exhumed and their skeletons tested? What would it prove? Gosh, this was so confusing, but he knew in his bones that something was wrong about the accepted storyline. It was only now that he had found the courage to acknowledge that he believed his father hadn't killed his mother and brother. It just wasn't the man he had grown up with. Not even a psychotic break was believable. Tynan Renault wasn't a man who got depressed, he worked the problem and found a fix. No. There was no way he would kill Gabriella. Knox's mother had been the love of Tynan's life, just as Livia was Knox's. For a horrible moment, he pictured himself shooting Livia in the stomach and watching her die a slow, agonizing death. Gosh stop, he muttered to himself, rubbing his eyes to scratch the image from his brain. Focus on the beginning. His father, mother and brother had been shot dead. Who would have wanted to kill his family? Geez, he knew why the police had questioned him for hours, he still remembered the incessant jabs. Who did you hire to do it, Knox? Did you want your inheritance that much? Why'd you did you do it, Noxy boy? It dawned on him then, that even the police didn't buy Tynan Renault as a murderer. Why hadn't they pursued that line of thinking even after they'd cleared Knox of all blame? Someone must have asked them to drop it. A shock ran through him. Gosh yes. That must be it. Someone had paid the police off. It wouldn't be unheard of. But why? He could rule Sandor out then, to his relief. Sandor might be rich now because of his own hard work, but there was no way he would have been able to afford the payoff the cops would expect. Which left Roan, Amber and Odell. Odell he ruled out immediately. The woman might be an oddball but she truly loved Knox and his family. 
He winced when he thought of Amber and Roan. They had the money certainly and the influence, but why would? Gosh. Had Amber blamed him for Ariel's death and had his family killed because of it? He shook his head. No way. No way could Amber have kept that secret for twenty years. But the thought kept nagging at him. Knox? Livia looked up sleepily from the bed, and he went to her, lying down beside her. She stroked his face. Are you okay? I am. Just thinking about what we're about to do. Livia smiled, her cheek adorably crumpled from the pillow. Sensual times? Knox chuckled softly. I actually meant our little sleuthing adventure, but I like your thinking. He moved on top of her as she rolled onto her back and wrapped her legs around him. We're going to make everything okay again, she said softly. I promise we will. And Knox believed her. Chapter 24 Back in New Orleans, Knox and Livia made a plan. Knox would go to the police and ask them to reopen his family's case. Livia would research as much as she could about the family and his father's business connections. At first the police were hesitant to even listen to Knox, but finally a younger detective, Brian Jones, called him back. Mr. Renault, I want to help. I've been working cold cases for a couple of years, and although the official record is murder-suicide, something has always struck me as off. Let's talk. Knox called Liv. That's fantastic, she enthused, a real step forward. Haven't found anything online yet, but I'll keep digging. I do have to go into work tonight. I'll try and be back to take you, but if not, make sure you take Jason with you. My pet bodyguard, she sighed but agreed to his request. Livia searched the internet and looked at every news story, feature, article and blog post she could find on the Renault family tragedy. More than one linked it to Ariel's death, calling Knox cursed, which just made Liv angry. By the end of the afternoon, her eyes were sore and she went upstairs to change for work. As she walked into their bedroom, she froze. On the bed was an envelope, which she knew for certain hadn't been there that morning. She felt her chest cramp up with unease. The envelope looked like the same heavy paper brand as the one that had been left for her at the college. Expensive paper. Careful not to touch it too much, she eased the note out of it. She couldn't help the gasp that escaped her. I told you to leave him. Now everyone will have to die before I kill you, beautiful Livia. Jason. Her bodyguard came running, flanked by another couple of Knox's security men. She showed Jason the letter. Grim-faced, he told the men to search the house. And you're sure it wasn't here before this morning? Positive. Jason nodded and got on his phone. One of the security guards came back, his face ashen and visibly shaken. Boss the wine cellar. You need to see this. Livia insisted on going with them, but immediately wished she hadn't. Oh gosh. Blood. Lots of it smeared across the whole room, stinking, rotting. The corpse was leaning up against the wall, belly sliced open, entrails hanging out. All of them wretched. Jason kicked the corpse with his toe. Who the hell brings a cow down here to gut it? Livia, covering her mouth and nose, nodded at it. Someone sending a message. It's what he's going to do to me. Get the police down here now, Jason barked at his men, then turned to Livia was trembling. Miss Chatelaine, we need to get you someplace safe. I'm taking you to Mr. Renault's offices. I don't think it's a good idea for you to be out in public. No, I need to go to work, Livia insisted. Marcel is always shorthanded near New Year's. Jason wasn't happy and called Knox. When he spoke to Livia, Knox listened to her. I don't want to be the one to tell you what to do, even if I think this is beyond worrying. I want to go to work, she insisted. It was a cow. Someone's idea of trying to scare me. The hell with them, Knox. He gave a low chuckle. Okay, but I'm taking you to work, and there will be a fleet of security with you all night long. Deal. Marcel greeted her with a warm hug, but Livia noticed the strain in his eyes. You okay? Marcel shook his head. Liv, I don't want to pile on but, have you seen or heard from Morocco? 
She didn't come in last night, and it's not like her. I tried to call her but there was no answer. Livia looked at Knox, and there was terror in her eyes. Knox nodded to Marcel. We'll go to her place. In the cab, Livia held Knox's hand tightly. Please be okay, please be okay, she kept whispering as she tried in vain to reach her friend on the phone. In the elevator to Moriko's apartment, she grew almost angry. Why the hell isn't she answering? As she spoke, something hit her shoulder. Liquid. They both looked at it. Blood. It had dropped from above. They both turned to look as they approached Moriko's floor, and with mounting horror, they realized that the floor was covered with blood, and that it was definitely pooling out from Moriko's apartment. No no no. Livia fought with the elevator doors, and finally wrenched them open. Knox tried to stop her, his instinct telling him what she'd find but his outstretched hand missed her. Instead, he kept close as she burst through the door to her friend's apartment. They both saw her at the same time. Morico, beautiful sweet Morico, half sat, half lay against the wall of her apartment, ripped open by a knife that still protruded from her body. Her clothes were soaked in blood, her eyes were closed, her face deathly pale. Oh my god. No please. Livia sank to her knees and crawled to her dead friend, willing life back into her, but they both knew she was gone. Butchered. Stabbed to death. Livia let out a howl of agony that Knox would never forget, and gathered Moriko's body to her, willing her to breathe, to please, please come back to her. She clutched her to her, not caring that Moriko's blood was soaking her, her sobs heart wrenching. Knox, his voice shaking, quietly called for backup and the paramedics, but she could see from the amount of blood that there was nothing they could do. Moriko was dead. Murdered. All Livia could see or smell was blood, even after Knox put her into the shower at the hotel. He had told her the mansion was too dangerous now, and she had nodded numbly, not really taking anything in. She felt detached from everything and everyone, even Knox. Moriko was dead. Now she lay in a strange bed, listening as Knox and the police spoke in the other room. She tried to shut out their voices, but also wanted to know what the hell was going on. There was a knock at the door and Odell came in, shutting the door behind her. She didn't say anything, but sat on the edge of the bed and held Livia's hand. For a long time neither of them said anything. Then Livia, her voice trembling, spoke. Moriko's dead. I know. I'm so sorry, Livy. He killed her because Knox and I are together. Odell shook her head. Whoever it was killed her because they are psychopathic, Liv. This is not your fault. Livia closed her eyes, letting out a sob. Why is this happening? I wish I could tell you, lovely, I do. Odell stroked Livy's hair awkwardly. They're looking for Roan. Do you really think Roan is behind this? Odell looked so sad that Livy sat up and hugged her. I used to think no way, but now? I just don't know. I still think Amber knows more than she's telling, but that just might be my bias. Have you seen her lately? Not since before Christmas. Odell sighed and let Liv go. Well, I guess the police will question her too. Knox said she went out of town. I think she did. She's been acting strangely ever since she broke things off with Roan. Liv studied her friend. Odie, would Roan have hurt Amber? Or vice versa? I don't know. I got the feeling their relationship was about making love, and that was it. Roan doesn't do deep. Unless he's with you. Odell half smiled. I was going to argue that, but I think you're right, actually. He does confide in me share his dreams and hopes. I really want to believe that this isn't Roan's doing, Odell. For your sake as much as his and ours. Odell nodded sadly. Me too, Livy, me too. But a week later, as Livia was arranging Moriko's funeral, the police came back to them with devastating news. Roan's semen had been found on Moriko's body and the slaughtered cow's body. A countryside alert was sent out for him. Knox, Livia, Sandor, Odell and Amber sat together in a low-key bar in the French Quarter. All of them looked shattered, but Livia couldn't help studying Amber, who seemed to be on the edge of something else, hysteria. Grief? 
The other woman, her red hair dirty and unkempt, was biting her nails down to the quick. What is it, Amber? Livia asked her gently, but Amber ignored her. Knox fixed his friend with a stare. Gosh, are you high? Geez, Amber, at a time like this? She shook her head, but now that Knox had mentioned it, they could all see Amber was tweaking. Odell rolled her eyes and instead spoke to Livia. How are you doing, Livy? Livia shrugged. I keep seeing her lying there, Odie. It's not your fault, Liv. The medical examiner said she'd been dead for hours. I should have gone to find her sooner. Days sooner. She always looked out for me, I should have done the same for her. Livia smiled through her tears. One time, at college, she shouted at me for opening my dorm room door to her without checking who it was. It was her room too, the doofus. Anyway, she made me promise to always check who was at the door, and if I didn't know who it was, then I didn't open the door. Her face clouded over. What kind of friend am I that I was? Amber suddenly said, her tone harsh. Poor little Livy, precious little Livy, spreading her legs for the nearest billionaire. It was Odell, moving quickly, who slapped Amber hard across the face, making them all jump. Amber rocked back, then lunged for Odell who sidestepped her, leaving Amber to sprawl on the floor. Sandor picked Amber up as Knox stepped between the two women. Livia was too shocked to move. Amber, go home and get cleaned up. And don't ever, ever talk to Livia like that again. Ever. Knox was furious. Amber spat at him. You think that little piece of trash can replace my sister? My sister who loved you. Was devoted to you. Get out of here. Livia jumped up to stop Knox from going after Amber, and Sandor stepped in between them. I'll take her home, Knox. Everyone was staring at them, some people even taking photographs. Knox put his arms around Livia. It's okay, love. She's gone. What the heck was that? Livia said in an incredulous voice. Knox shook his head, holding her tightly. I don't know, baby. It's Amber's birthday, Odell said quietly, and Knox groaned. Oh gosh, I forgot. It's Ariel's birthday too. I've never seen Amber so high on something though. She usually keeps it to pot. That wasn't pot. No. Livia said nothing. Amber's attack had been so out of the blue. Livia could feel the foundations of her composure crumbling, but she leaned into Knox's embrace. Maybe you should go see her. I'm not trying to replace Ariel. I know that. Amber knows that. I apologize on her behalf, she's not herself. Livia looked up at him. Go see her. Make amends. See if she needs help. Knox smiled down at her, stroking her face. This is why I love you. Knox went to meet Amber the next day, and it was a contrite Amber who sat with him. I didn't mean what I said, she began, please please tell Livy I love her. I didn't mean any of it. I was just. Gosh Knox, I miss Ariel so much. Knox nodded. I do too Amber, you know that. But neither of us could have stopped what happened. Amber was silent, and Knox was surprised to see something else in her eyes. What? What is it, Ams? She shook her head. I can't. I can't tell you, Knox. It's too, it's something I did. Something I have to live with, except. I don't know how to live with it anymore. Knox was really worried now. Amber, please tell me you didn't have anything to do with the threats to live. Amber gave a mirthless snort. No, Knox. Not the threats. Then what? She mumbled something and Knox couldn't clearly make out the words. What? Did you say scare her? Amber stared at him with endless sorrow in her eyes, then suddenly got up. I can't. I can't. I'm sorry, Knox. It wasn't until he was in bed with Livia later that it dawned on him what Amber had said. When he realized, it sent a cold arrow right through his heart. He said the words over and over to himself, hoping beyond hope that they didn't mean what he thought they did. He was only supposed to scare her. Amber wasn't talking about Livia, she was talking about Ariel. 
Amber knew Ariel's killer. Chapter 25 Are you sure? Livia was looking at him with shocked eyes. Knox had related his entire theory to her as they sat eating breakfast the next day, and now Livia sat back, her distress obvious. You think she hired someone to scare her sister and he went too far and killed her. That's exactly what I think, Knox said grim-faced. I always knew Amber was jealous of Ariel, but I never thought she would have done this. Liv shook her head. Maybe it was a prank gone wrong. Pranks gone wrong don't end with a woman being stabbed to death, Livia. Whoever killed Ariel meant it. He gutted her, he enjoyed doing it. So Amber got in with the wrong crowd. Maybe she wanted someone to scare her sister, but she picked a psycho who killed Ariel instead and has been blackmailing Amber ever since. Wow, you really ran with that theory. Knox was impressed. Liv half smiled. It just came to me. It's not hard to figure out Amber's motive. It isn't. You numbnuts. Amber's in love with you. No. Livia rolled her eyes. Dude wake up. Of course she is. She always has been, but once the plan with Ariel went awry and Ariel died, she knew she could never be with you, that it would make her look guilty, and sooner or later she would give herself away. Problem is, what do you do now? Do you go to the police? Knox sighed. I think I'd better talk to her again first. If the killer is the same guy and she knows it, then maybe we get it out of her in return for not bringing her into it. But how will we tell the police how we figured it out? Knox's green eyes were dangerous. We don't. I'll deal with whoever it is. Livia swallowed hard. Knox. No one threatens the woman I love. No one. And for Morico, for Pia, for Ariel. I'll deal with it. Livia was both scared and turned on by the menace in his tone. She leaned over and crushed her lips to his. I love you, she whispered, please take care. I promise. His kiss was sweet and tender, and went on for a lot longer than expected, before they were interrupted by his cell phone buzzing. Looking regretful, he broke away from her and glanced down at the screen. It's Detective Jones. He answered the call and Livia listened as he spoke, his face clouding over. What now? She thought wearily and got up to go take a shower. Knox caught her hand and she saw his distress. Okay, thanks, Detective. I'll be right down. He hung up the phone. What is it, baby? Amber's going to have to wait. They're digging up my family today. Knox insisted on watching as his family members were exhumed from their family mausoleum. Livia stayed with him, holding his hand as his expression changed from determination to sorrow as the coffins were raised. He turned away as the medical examiner opened his brother's casket. Knox gagged and threw up while Livia, not knowing what else to do, rubbed his back and tried to console him. I'm so sorry, baby. Knox wiped his mouth. It's okay. I know we're doing the right thing. His family's caskets were loaded into the Mies van and taken away. Left alone, Knox and Livia gazed down at the empty graves. Promise me, Knox said, that when we die we won't be buried like this. Let's both get cremated and fly in the wind for eternity. Agreed, baby. Mausoleums creep me out. Knox half smiled at her attempt to cheer him up. Our family will be a happy one. Certainly will. Livia said firmly. All this crap we're dealing with right now will be behind us, and we'll have a bunch of kids and we'll be happy. Summer vacations in Italy, Christmases in Vienna. I can't wait. He splayed his fingers out over her belly. Is it wrong that I kind of want you to be pregnant right now? Ha, huh, she said. Let's wait until psychopaths aren't threatening to kill me, shall we? His smile faded and she nudged him. Sorry, bad joke. I won't let anything happen to you. Right back at you, she said. Come on. Let's go see Detective Jones. He watched them from the farthest end of the cemetery. They had no idea that whatever they were doing was only going to make his plan to kill Livia better. He had almost brought them to their knees, 
but what he would do next would destroy Knox Renault forever. There was just that one loose end to tie up, and he would do that in spectacular style. Amber Amber was pale but sober when Knox met her in a small café in the city. To her credit, she didn't attempt to speak before Knox sat down and said simply, he was only supposed to scare her. Amber lifted her head from where she had been staring at her coffee, and nodded. It was supposed to be a prank. I knew she would go outside for a smoke before you picked her up. He was supposed to take her for a ride around the block, and then bring her back immediately. I knew something was wrong after a while when he didn't call me like he was supposed to. Who is he, Amber? She shook her head. Please let me finish the story. He had agreed to do it because, he was mad at you. Something to do with your family, I don't know exactly. When he didn't bring her back, I knew. I'd always suspected he was a little off, but nothing like this. When I saw what he did to my sister. She covered her mouth and choked back a sob. He told me if I ever told anyone, he would let them all know that I planned it, that I wanted her dead. I never wanted her dead, Knox, you have to believe me. Knox, a vortex of emotion swirling inside him, stared at her coldly. The sad thing is, I loved you. You and your shiny cap of red hair and your thousand-watt smile. And you loved me too, as long as I stayed in the box you made for me. Lonely bereaved, less. While I still grieved for Ariel, you knew you controlled me. I scared you, I know. Once I crept out from the box and began to stretch and crack my limbs out to their full extent, once I stopped letting myself tamp down this fire, this life, this love, this love for Livia. I didn't want to think, you were one of those women, who only see other women as a threat. One of those friends who kept me around just to make them look better, I've had a lifetime of those. Leeches. I never thought you would turn out to be one of them. But you were the worst of them, because I loved you like a sister Amber. He fell silent then, swirling his glass, watching the ice melt in the green liquor. Melon. The door blew open, and a cackle of noise rushed in with the rain. Rain on wooden floorboards. Two elderly women, huddled in woolen coats, trying to warm up from the cold. Tears dropped silently down Amber's face. Knox shook his head. You killed her. Your own sister. Why? Amber looked at him, her eyes not angry, just sad. I loved you. I love you. Knox tried not to lose his temper, but his voice shook as he asked her the questions he need to. Did you have anything to do with the attacks on Livia? On me? Did you murder Pia? Morocco? No, no, I swear, Amber seemed almost desperate. It wasn't me. Look, I really like Livia and I can see she is perfect for you. Gosh, no. I swear. But. I did do one thing, and I can't believe I did it. Knox wasn't convinced. What? Roan would. He would leave his used rubbers tied up in my trash can. Knox made a disgusted noise. What the hell does that have to do with anything? He leaned forward to make her look at him. Who did you hire to kill Ariel, Amber? She closed her eyes. I didn't hire. There was a sharp crack and for a second, everybody in the cafe froze. Amber's eyes widened, then a thin stream of blood began to stream from her temple. In utter shock, Knox saw the bullet hole in the window in the seconds before it smashed. And then Amber slumped forward, her eyes open and staring but very, very dead. Bedlam. People screaming. Knox was up and running, out into the street to see where the gunman was, who the gunman was. But of course, the killer was in the wind. Knox slumped to the ground, deeply shocked, and waited for the police to arrive. Livia ran straight into his arms. Gosh, Knox, thank God you're all right. She held him tightly as he buried his face in her hair. Enough, he said, his voice muffled, enough people have died. We need to find him, right now. Who, darling? Livia stared up at him with scared eyes. Who? Knox looked shattered beyond belief as he said the words. Roan. We need to find Roan. January slunk onwards as the surviving friends worked with the police to find Roan. More convinced than ever that Roan was the killer, 
Knox asked the police to compare any old DNA that didn't belong to his family to Roan's. Detective Jones agreed. We've issued a countrywide search for St. Mark, but if he is the one who shot Ms. Duplas, he's obviously around New Orleans waiting to finish the job. Do you have adequate protection? Knox nodded. Sandor looked at Livia and Knox now. Look, being at the hotel doesn't work. Come stay with me. It's no mansion, but there's a hell of a lot less dark places for a stalker to hide. Odell, you too. We need to stick together until Roan is found. Sandor's home was large but comfortable, and Livia felt safer there than she had anywhere else for a while. She worried about her friends though, knowing one of their own was responsible for so much of the mayhem and murder. She had hatred in her heart for Roan St. Mark, and although she wouldn't say it aloud, she almost wanted him to come for her so she could avenge her friends. Avenge Morico, avenge herself. Even if it killed her. She could feel Odell keeping an eye on her though, and knew that if she needed to break down, Odell would be the one to help her. She didn't want to add to Knox's pain. Of all of them, he was the most affected, she thought, having seen Amber killed in front of him. He looked shell-shocked still, even after a few weeks, and it was hard to tell if it was from Amber's murder or Amber's admissions. What I don't understand, she said to him, is how Roan knew to shoot her at the moment she was about to tell you about him. He couldn't have been bugging her, for Christ's sakes, he didn't have the resources. It may be that he doesn't know she didn't reveal him, Knox said, in which case, he knows we know and will hopefully trip himself up out of desperation. Or do something reckless that takes someone else's life. Livia sighed. Gosh what a mess, but what the hell is his motive? I don't get it. I can't help you there. I honestly have no idea. Livia chewed her lip. And what did Amber mean about Roan's discarded rubbers? That makes no sense. Unless... Knox was studying her closely. Unless what? Livia was sickened. Unless she was telling us someone was using Roan's semen to frame him. And Amber knew. Detective Jones came to see them one afternoon at Knox's office. Having given up her job at La Chat Noir, Livia now worked on her college projects at Knox's office during the day. She found, to her surprise, that they didn't get tired of seeing each other all day and all night. This bodes well, Knox grinned as she said as much one night and she laughed. It was a relief to laugh and be happy, and they made love often, clinging to each other. They also talked more about their charitable foundation ideas, asking Charvi to be involved. Charvi, who much to her disgust also had a protective detail, was enthusiastic. For a rich dude, Knox Renault, you're quite the guy. But she looked at him with proud eyes, and Livia knew her approval meant the world to him. Charvi got tearful when Knox told her they were naming the foundation after her former lover, and she hugged Gabriella's son. I always thought you might resent me, she told him, wiping her tears, for being with your mother before she met your father but she loved me truly, and she loved Tynan truly. There was not a bad bone in that woman's body. Knox got choked up then and nodded. Livia smiled at them both. Family isn't just blood. I know that. I'm looking at mine right here. When Detective Jones came to see them, family was on their minds again. Something strange, Mr. Renault. When we went to compare your father's DNA to your friends, we found a match. A familial match. The thing is, the lab messed up the labeling. So, we need to take your DNA again to test against the sample, in case for some reason we've made a mistake. The detective was being cagey, and Knox and Livia shared a look. What aren't you telling us? Detective Jones drew in a deep breath. Look, if the lab is right, then one of your two closest friends is also your half brother. Knox's eyes widened. You're kidding me. No, sir. When the detective had left, Knox and Livia stared at each other. My brother. This is just bizarre. I'm sure they must have gotten Teague and someone else's DNA mixed up. It must be. My parents did not cheat on each other. Knox was fierce in his denial, but Livia could see the doubt in his eyes. Look, it can only be Roan or Sandor if it's anyone. I can't see any physical similarity between any of you. 
It's a mistake. Sandor was at the door then, obviously having heard the conversation. The police messed up. Dude, as much as I think of you as my brother, it's not possible. Dad had a vasectomy after they had me, and mom died before even Teague was born. It doesn't explain how it can be a half-brother, if Teague's DNA got mixed up. Teague was my brother, you can see the likeness between us. Knox sighed. Okay, so maybe my dad wasn't a killer, but... What? Sandor looked surprised at that comment, and Knox and Livia exchanged a look. Knox cleared his throat. I've been passive for too long, Sandor. I do not believe my father killed my mom and Teague. I do not. Someone else killed them and I want to know who. Sandor nodded slowly, and Livia studied him. Was there something behind that closed expression or was it just shock? Well good. I think you need to look into it. It's been haunting you too long. I got your back dude. Thanks man. Sandor smiled at them, before disappearing back out of the room. Livia chewed her lip. Unease settled over her. Sandor's reaction to the news that they were looking into Knox's family tragedy had got her thinking. However, she stayed silent, Knox didn't need more complications. You look tired, baby. Knox pressed his lips to her forehead and she wrapped her arms around his waist. I am. Let's go home. I'll see if Sandor needs a ride home. Livia hesitated. I meant our home. I want privacy. Knox sighed. It isn't safe, baby. There are too many ways to get into it, and believe me, Roan knows all of them. And we can't get them secured. Knox was the one to hesitate now. Baby, it's more that I'm scared. Bad things happened there, more than once, and I'm terrified I'll lose concentration for a second and someone will get to you. Seriously, Sandor's place is safer. Within a week of Knox making that statement, he would realize just how horribly wrong he was. Chapter 26 Sandor didn't come home with them. I've got some paperwork to catch up on, then I think I'm going to meet a girl. Knox grinned. Oh yeah. Sandor shrugged. It's nothing. But enjoy the privacy, and I'll see you later. In the car on the way home, Livia was pensive. Huh. What? Sandor said, enjoy the privacy. How does he know Odell won't be home? Knox shrugged. Probably forgot. She does tend to keep to herself, except when you and she are plotting something. His cell phone buzzed. It's the detective. Hey there. He listened and paled. You're sure? Okay, yeah, we'll be right there. He ended the call and looked at Livia. They've pulled a body out of the bayou, near the mansion. They think it might be Roan. They want me to go down there and identify the body. Livia waited in the medical examiner's office while Knox went with the doctor. Soon he was back. He shook his head, looking shaken. Impossible to say. The body's been in the swamp. He didn't have to say any more. Detective Jones followed Knox out of the morgue. Look, we'll do the DNA work then see where we go from here. Livia cleared her throat. Detective Jones? Has Sandor Carpentier submitted his DNA sample? I'll check but I think so. Why? Just curious. No reason. Detective Jones smiled at her. Well then, I'll leave you. Thanks for coming in, and sorry to put you through that, Mr. Renault. Anything to help. In the car, Knox let out a long breath, and Livia looked at him sympathetically. Was it bad? Knox nodded. The body was mutilated and barely looked human. As much as I blame him, I hope to God it wasn't Roan. That body's been in the swamp a while. When they got home, Odell was there, and Knox told her gently about the discovery. Odell nodded calmly. It's him, she said, I know it in my bones. Knox? I think we need to start looking for somewhere else to stay. Knox's eyebrows shot up. Why? I don't feel safe here. Do you feel it, Liv? Odell looked at her, and Livia nodded. I do, but I don't know why. Maybe it's the confusion over the DNA, 
or that the body, if it's Roan's, it means he didn't kill Amber. But until we have confirmation that Sandor's DNA is in the all clear. Knox stared at them both. You honestly think Sandor might have something to do with this? Let me be clear, Odell said, it's just a feeling I have. I have no proof of anything, just my gut instinct. Knox turned to Livia. And you? The same. There's just been something off lately about Sandor, or to be fair, it could be paranoia on my part, given what's been happening. The only people I trust right now are in this room. Knox sighed, and Livia could see him struggling with the idea that his friend might not be who he thought he was. She put her hand on his arm. Look, we're not saying Sandor has done anything wrong. Just be cautious. That's fair enough. Knox thought it over for a while. Okay, look, we'll tell him we're going to move out because... Gosh, I don't know, to give him his privacy back. I'll look into renting something short term. In the end, it was Livia who told Sandor they were moving out. He came to find her one morning while Knox was at work. Livia was packing a bag when she heard a step behind her. She spun around, startled to see Sandor there. He smiled at her. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. Livia, her hand on her chest, tried to smile. It's okay. I just didn't expect to see you. I thought you were at work with Knox. Her heart was beating uncomfortably against her ribs. Sandor sat down on the edge of the bed without being invited and nodded at her bag. Going somewhere? Livia felt awkward. Has Knox spoken to you? About what? About us moving out? We just feel that we're giving in to the killer by huddling together. A thought occurred to her and she half smiled. Knox and I don't want to put you and Odie in the line of fire any more than you already are. I couldn't bear it if anything happened to either of you. That's it, lay it on thick. Sandor touched her face. You're very sweet, Livy. He stood into Livia's surprise and unease, took her face in his hands. Every day, he said softly, I see more and more why Knox fell in love with you. You are beautiful, inside and out, Livia Chatelaine. Is it inappropriate to say that I wish I had met you before Knox did? Livia was about to brush off the compliment, but then Sandor gently, quickly, brushed his lips against hers. He immediately dropped his hands and stepped back, making a good show of looking horrified. Gosh, I'm sorry, Liv. That was so inappropriate. I'm sorry. There was a curl of fear in Livy's stomach. What the hell was going on here? It's okay. I'll leave you alone. I will miss all of you, but I understand why you're moving out. He left her alone, stunned and feeling weirdly tearful. She sat down on the bed heavily and wondered why she felt so upset. The kiss had been wildly inappropriate, but it wasn't even that which upset her. It was the expression in Sandor's eyes the whole time he was speaking. Cold. Dead. Not the eyes of the man she had hoped had assumed he was. Her gut instincts were kicking in again as she closed the bedroom door and called Knox. When he answered, she burst into tears, and it took her a minute to calm herself before she said what she wanted to say. Please, Knox. Come get me out of here. They moved into a hotel to begin with, although Odell simply went home. I've hired extra protection, she assured them, and I don't want to play the third wheel as much as I love you both. At the hotel, Knox and Livia ordered room service, took a long hot shower together, then made love. Livia hadn't felt comfortable having intercourse at Sandor's place, so now, reveling in their privacy, Livia clung to him as he took her slowly and tenderly. She smoothed his dark eyebrows as he moved above her. I love you so much, Knox. He grinned as his pace quickened, and she gave a little cry of pleasure. As I love you, pretty girl. Livia tightened her legs around his hips, squeezing her muscles. Knox groaned. Gosh yes, just like that baby. He slammed his hips against hers, and Livia took him in deeper each time, tilting her pelvis so he could drill ever harder into her. Gosh, I love you, Livia Chatelaine, your body was made for me. Livia grinned then arched her back as her peak hit, pressing her belly against his. Knox? She was gaping as his pace grew rougher and quicker. Come on my belly. 
Knox, panting for air, drove himself to the peak, then withdrew. Afterward, they caught their breath as Knox massaged her body. He circled her navel with his finger. Livia gazed up at him. I'm thinking about our Christmas getaway and all those dirty games we played. You enjoyed them? You know I did. When all this is over, I'd like to do that again. Maybe even try some new stuff. Livia could feel the excitement build again in her body. That's it, Livy. Just lie back and let me do the work. Gosh, that's so good. Sensitive belly. At moments like these, she could pretend everything was okay, that everything was happy. Knox knew how to command her body entirely, and he was relentless in making her come every single time. Gosh, she loved this man. She would do anything, try anything he wanted to, but in the end it came down to their animal selves, almost feral in their carnal desire for each other. They made love until they were exhausted. Then, his head resting on her chest and her arms around him, Knox fell asleep, but Livia's mind was whirling with questions. This whole thing was so confusing, with a myriad of suspects. But in her mind, Livia felt sure she knew who was behind all of this, and tomorrow she would start to find out more about the man she was certain was trying to kill her. Sandor Chapter 27 Charvi Sood was surprised to find Livia not in the music room, but at one of the computers in the college's library. Hey there, kiddo. Hey, Charvi. What are you doing? Livia smiled at her. Research. Charvi, you might be able to help me out. She looked around the library, then lowered her voice. What do you know about Florian Carpentier, Sandor's father? Charvi felt cold inside. Why do you ask? Livia just looked at her, and Charvi nodded. Okay, but not here. They went to Charvi's office, and the older woman locked the door behind her. She offered Livia a cup of coffee, and when they had their drinks, they sat on her old comfortable couch. Charvi sighed. What I'm about to tell you, I've never told anybody, mostly out of respect for Gabriella's wishes. When she died, I thought about going to the police about it, but they seemed so certain that Tynan had killed her and Teague that I didn't want to cause Knox any more pain. That was the real reason I stayed away from him. She sipped her coffee, collecting her thoughts. Before Gabriella met Tynan, and after we had decided to split up, she was worried what our relationship could mean for my career, can you believe it? She worked a little for the Carpentiers as a consultant. Eleanor Carpentier was a lovely woman, and she and Gabriella became good friends. Then one day, Gabriella called me, hysterical. I went to her apartment to find it in disarray, and Gabriella bleeding and bruised. She had been raped. Oh God! Livia felt sick. At first, she wouldn't tell me by whom, she just said she couldn't go out in New Orleans anymore for fear of seeing him. Eventually, I got it out of her. Florian Carpentier was not a good man. He beat Eleanor, raped her too I believe, and Florian didn't even bother to hide it. I tried to make Gabriella go to the police, but she swore he would kill her if she did. She swore me to secrecy, and for a time it seemed like things would go back to normal. Then, about a month later, Gabriella left town unexpectedly and didn't return for a year. Livia's eyes were full of understanding. She was pregnant. Charvi nodded. She had the child and Florian and Eleanor brought him up as their own. Sandor. Sandor is Knox's half-brother. Charvi nodded. When Eleanor died and when Florian got Alzheimer's, Sandor took over the business with Teague. Then, when Knox was at college, they all died. Over the years, I've tried to find reasons why Tynan would have done it, but there are still none. He loved Gabriella and those two boys were his life. I truly believe they were all murdered. Livia swallowed. Bye. I think Florian got confused and thought his secret might be revealed. He went mad and shot them all. But how the hell would he have had the brainpower to frame Tynan then? He was a vicious man no doubt about it, and thought himself above the law. But I believe he had help. Livia closed her eyes. Sandor. Charvi nodded. Over the years I've become more convinced. I don't know Sandor at all, 
so I can't speak to whether he takes after his mother or his father. Wouldn't any loyal son help his father, even after his father committed such a heinous act? Livia was silent for a time. But to frame Tynan? And do that to his supposed best friend? Did Sandor know he was Gabriella's son? I don't know. What if he found out? Got angry. Sandor does a good job of appearing friendly and warm, but there's something else there. An anger. What if it wasn't Florian who killed Gabriella? What if Sandor, on finding out the truth about his parentage, got angry and went to confront her? He took a gun, and when she tried to deny him, he killed her. Tynan and Teague were collateral damage. Livia looked sick, but Charvi nodded. It could have easily happened that way. And Ariel, what if Amber and Sandor had planned the prank together, then Sandor went way, way off script. Got off on killing women. He could have been. Livia, darling, let's work one problem at a time. But I think you should stay well away from this, if your theory is correct. I have to talk to Knox, Livia said, but Sandor is his business partner as well as his best friend, and I know that they're having enough trouble. Someone's been buying up all the shares. Sandor, perhaps? Trying to oust Knox? Livia shook her head. He mentioned someone called Roderick Lefevre. Rod. Charvi looked surprised. I'm surprised. It doesn't seem like his M.O. The Rod I know is a straight shooter. If you know him, could you get me in to see him? I'm sure that can be arranged. An hour later, Livia was waiting nervously in the reception of Roderick Lefevre's company. His opulent offices and sleek staff made Knox's building look shabby and old-fashioned. Why on earth would Roderick be interested in it? Miss Chatelaine? A tall blonde, classically handsome man smiled at her. Rod Lefevre. Please, we'll meet in my office. Liv followed him. So, you're the lady who's won Knox's heart? She smiled hesitantly at him. I am. And you're the man who's been buying all the shares in his company. Rod laughed. I am. I like you already. Straight to the point. In his office, he invited her to sit. Livia studied him. He was a little older than Knox, mid-forties, short hair, dark green eyes. His face could go from friendly to dangerous in a moment, she guessed, but he exuded warmth and honesty. She drew in a deep breath. You seem like you like honesty, so here goes. Was it your idea to buy all the shares you could in Rencar, or did Sandor Carpentier come to you and ask you to do it? Rod's eyebrows shot up. My, my. Okay, well, Miss Chatelaine. Livia. Livia. I could, of course, tell you to mind your own business. You could, and I would respect that. Livia met his gaze steadily. Rod smiled. Yes, I do like you. Well, to answer your question, yes, he did. He told me he wanted to buy the company from underneath Knox, that he thought Knox's heart wasn't in it anymore, and he wanted to give him the push to try something new. Sandor told me that if I bought the shares, he would pay me double for them. Livia scoffed. And you believe him about him wanting to help Knox? Of course not, but that's none of my concern. I'm a businessman, Livia, and what Sandor was suggesting would have made me in the region of $700 million. Livia whistled and shook her head. You people deal in figures I can't even comprehend. What is it you do, Livia? She lifted her chin proudly. I'm a grad student and until recently, a waitress. Rod smiled. Both admirable vocations. I had heard you were one of the finest students ever to study at the university. Livia looked surprised and Rod laughed. I do my research too, Livia. And because I am who I am, if women were my type, I'd be fighting Knox Renault for a woman like you. He grinned. Thankfully for all of us, my husband would object. Livia giggled at his teasing and decided she liked this man very much. Could I ask you not to reveal our conversation to Sandor, please? You have my word. He walked her to the door but then stopped her. Livia. I won't share this conversation, but I can't speak for anyone who might have seen you come here. 
New Orleans is a relatively small town when it comes to who knows who in certain circles. Please tell Knox you came here and make sure you have adequate protection in place. Livia studied him. You think Sandor's dangerous? I have no evidence of it, just gut instinct. Rod nodded, half smiling. Exactly. Livia nodded. Did you know Sandor's father? Florian Carpentier. Rod's smile faded. I did, unfortunately. Why unfortunately? He was a savage. There was that honesty again, and Liv half smiled. Understood. Thank you again, Mr. Lefevre. Rod, please. Goodbye, Livia. Livia, being driven back to the hotel by Jason, called Knox. She didn't want to tell him what she had discovered over the phone, just in case Sandor was listening in, but merely said she'd come to his office later that day. I love you. Love you too, babe. After she ended the call, she looked over at Jason. Jason, could we stop somewhere else before home? She gave him the address, and he turned the car around without comment. At the residential home, she asked if she could see Florian Carpenter. I'm his niece from out of town and I just got here, she lied smoothly. I haven't seen him in years. The receptionist looked at her for a long moment, then turned away. Just a moment please ma'am. Nervous, her hands clenched with fingernails digging into her palms, Livia waited. Soon enough, a smartly dressed administrator came to collect her. If we could just step into my office. Shit, they didn't believe her niece story. If I could just see my uncle. The administrator, whose name tag said Susan, ushered her into the office. Her expression softened. I'm so sorry, Ms. Carpentier. We assumed all the family knew. Did Mr. Carpentier's son not inform you? Inform me of what? I'm sorry to tell you that Mr. Carpentier Sr. passed away last month. Livia stared at her, not needing to pretend her shock now. What? I'm so sorry, my dear. He passed peacefully. Gosh, no. I didn't want him to pass peacefully. I wanted him to suffer after what he did to Gabriella. Livia tried hard to keep the hatred off her face. Susan, reading her, mistook her anger. You weren't down as his next of kin, you see. I haven't spoken to Sandor yet, Livia said by way of explanation. She sighed, closing her eyes. May I see his room? I'm afraid it's occupied, dear. Unfortunately, we can't keep the rooms open for long. Too much demand. Of course I'm sorry. Another idea came to her. Did Sandor, I'm sorry, I mean Mr. Carpentier Jr., take possession of Florian's personal items? Susan nodded. He did. He didn't want to linger. He arranged the cremation quickly and took the small amount of personal possessions that were left. Livia thanked the woman and left the residential home. She sat in silence in the car as Jason turned the car. Where to, Miss Chatelaine? She chewed her lip for a moment. You know, I think I left some personal items at Mr. Carpentier's mansion. Do you think we could swing by there? Chapter 28 Knox looked up as Sandor poked his head around his office door. Skipping out for some lunch. Want to join? Knox shook his head. Not for me, thanks. I'm meeting Liv in a while. Cool. See you around. Knox got back to his paperwork but found he couldn't concentrate. Livia was right, there was something off about Sandor. Oh, he gave the impression of just being your friendly everyman, but behind his eyes Knox shook his head. Were they both just paranoid? Instead, he called Livia. He was surprised when she seemed cagey. Where are you? Um. I left something at Sandor's place and were just about to go pick it up. Knox frowned. Livia had been so adamant that she didn't feel safe there. Why not just get Sandor to bring it to the office? I don't want to bother him, it's only a hairbrush. She was lying, he knew it in his bones. Liv, what are you up to? Tell me. Nothing, honestly. I spent the morning with Charvi and then remembered I'd left my hairbrush at Sandor's, random, I know. 
but it was a present from Morocco. Ah. Well, is Jason with you? Of course, darling. It won't take long. A few minutes later, Harriet, the new receptionist, called him. I have a Roderick Lefevre on the phone for you. Knox was surprised. Calling to buy my shares too, Rod? Rod gave a chuckle, but then his voice turned serious. No, actually, it's about your lovely lady. Livia. Knox was astonished. Unless you have more than one. Knox shook himself. What about Livia? She came to see me this morning. Asked me point blank if Sandra Carpentier was the one who was really buying all the shares in your company. And what did you tell her? Ice was creeping through Knox's veins. What the hell was going on? I told her he was. The shock hit Knox full force in the chest. What? Rod Lefevre explained the same thing to Knox as he had to Livia. Sandra Carpentier is not your friend, he concluded, and damn it if I can't stop worrying about your lovely lady. If Sandor finds out she was asking questions. Thanks, Rod. Listen, I have to call her. Stay safe, Renault, and I'm sorry. Knox tried to call Livia, and then Jason, but to his distress could not reach either of them. As he hung up, his phone rang again and it was Detective Jones. The body is Roan St. Mark, the detective told him, and he's been dead a good couple of months. Multiple skull fractures, he was beaten to death. He couldn't have killed Amber Duplas or Morico Lee. Knox closed his eyes. What about the DNA? Sandor. It's confirmed. Sandor Carpentier is your half-brother. We have men on the way to your office and to his mansion right now. He's not in the office, and Livia is at his home. Gotcha. We're on our way. He got up and raced out of the office, ignoring Harriet's startled yell as he pushed past her and out to his car. Answer your phone, damn it. He called Charvi in desperation. Charvi, I know Livia came to see you this morning. I need you to tell me everything. Everything. Right now. Chapter 29 As Livia moved through the hallways of Sandor's mansion, her heart thumping, she looked for his security team but there was no one. Where the hell is everybody? Jason was looking tense. I think we should get you out of here, Miss Chatelaine. Livia shook her head, heading for Sandor's study. Keep a lookout for me. I'll be quick, I promise. Inside, she rummaged through every drawer in Sandor's desk, every file she could get her hands on from his cabinet. Nothing. Finally, she found a box shoved on the windowsill behind the curtain. She opened it and saw various personal items, toothbrush, toiletries, old postcards, and photos. At the bottom, a stack of letters. She flipped through them and saw they were all addressed to Gabriella. She stuck them in the back pocket of her jeans and returned the box to where it came from. Miss Chatelaine, I think we should go. Jason had stepped into the room but before she could answer he gave a strange gargling noise, his eyes bulging, and in horror she saw blood spurt from his neck. Jason? He looked at her, his expression confused, pained. Blood spurted from the hole in his neck that Sandor's knife had made. Sandor grinned at her as he yanked the knife out of Jason, who slumped dead to the floor. Hey there, Livia. Good to see you. He waved the knife. Time to be gutted, pretty girl. And he went for her. Charvi told him everything and desperate, Knox drove like a madman towards Sandor's home, knowing he might be too late, that Sandor had a head start and if he caught Livia snooping. Images of Ariel dead, of Pia, all superimposed with Livia's face. Livia lying dead on the grave, her belly cut open, her blood soaking everything. No. No. Not again. And his family. Knox knew in his bones that Sandor and Florian had killed them, had framed his beloved dad, murdered his brother, shot the defenseless Gabriella and left her to die a slow, agonizing death. And all because Florian Carpentier was a jealous, psychopathic rapist. But all he could think of now was getting to Livia, to save his love. Please please let her be okay. Despite being shocked and terrified at Sandor's appearance, Livia was ready to fight. Jerk, 
she yelled at him and launched herself at the man. Hitting him full force they tumbled to the floor, the knife slicing through the air precariously close to Livia's body. She pounded at his face kicking him totally enraged. Sandor cuffed her across the face so hard her ears rang as she crashed to the floor. I knew you suspected me, Livia, as soon as I saw your face yesterday. When the home called me this morning and told me you'd been snooping around. He straddled her and tried to bind her hands. Livia struggled, yelling at him, hoping that someone, anyone would come. He grabbed her head and bounced it viciously off the floor. Livia. Knox. Knox was coming. It gave her strength, and she brought her knee up, striking Sandor in the balls, but it wasn't enough. As she scrambled away from him, he jerked her back and slammed her back against the wall, ripping open her shirt. Livia struggled, but then he put his forearm across her throat, pressing down hard, and she couldn't breathe. Screw you jerk, she gasped, you can kill me, but you won't get away with it. Sandor merely smiled and drove his knife into her belly. Livia gasped at the agonizing pain that shot through her. Shame I can't do this slowly, beautiful girl, but as you can tell, I'm in a hurry. Blood pumped from the wound and Livia could smell rust and salt. Sandor admired his work. You bleed well, Livia. I'm going to enjoy this. Dazed by the pain, Livia lost her breath as he stabbed her again, the knife driving through her navel and slicing deep into her. But then Knox was there, roaring, knocking Sandor off of Livia, who slumped to the floor. Livia rolled onto her side and crawled away, bleeding heavily, her hands clamped to the vicious wounds in her belly. Seeing Knox and Sandor struggle, she crawled towards Jason's body. Grabbing the bodyguard's gun, she turned in time to see Sandor sink his knife into Knox's stomach. Knox yelled out in agony and Sandor laughed, yanking the knife free. No. Livia screamed and aimed the gun at Sandor, pulling the trigger. The gun clicked. Livia cursed. Was the gun empty? Sandor got in a vicious right hook to Knox's temple. Knox staggered away from Sandor, and Sandor dived at Livia. Stupid skank, he snarled, you have to turn the safety off. Allow me to demonstrate. As Knox, bleeding, came after him, Sandor turned the gun on Livia and shot her, the bullet tearing through her belly. It felt like fire ripping through her. Her body jerked with the impact, and she could no longer feel her legs. We're going to die here. We're both going to die here. Knox? Her voice was weak and she felt herself dying now. There was blood everywhere, and she could feel her body shutting down. Fighting with Sandor, Knox looked at her desperately. Hang on, baby girl. Hang on please, keep breathing, Livy. He was struggling with Sandor now, trying to get control of the gun. Another shot rang out, the bullet burying itself in the wall, then another, and Knox jerked back, his shoulder gushing blood. Sandor laughed. Whatever you do to me now, Knox, Sandor snarled at Knox, she's still a dead woman. Look at her, bleeding out. And I thought killing your Ariel was satisfying. You can watch while I empty the rest of this gun into your beautiful girl, Renault. He aimed the gun at Livia again. Knox, weakening from blood loss, nevertheless threw himself at Sandor again, and the two men tussled once more. Livia was losing consciousness but she was desperate to stay awake desperate to help Knox. Somehow, she managed to crawl to where Sandor had discarded his knife. Grabbing it, she plunged it into the back of Sandor's knee, then yanked it out and sliced his Achilles tendon. Sandor roared in pain, going down, and Knox grabbed the gun from him. Sandor laughed, knowing he was beaten. I hope she suffers before she bleeds to death. My only regret is that I only got to kill her once. He spat out the words, looking up at Knox in pure hatred. Without a moment's hesitation, Knox shot his half-brother in the face. Sandor went down, stone-cold dead. Knox staggered over to Livia, who was fading fast. Stay alive, baby, please, we get our happy ending. I swear. We deserve our happy ending. He collapsed next to her, trying to stem the blood flowing from her body, ignoring his own savage wounds. Please, Livy, stay with me. Livia stroked his face. If I die, I want you to know, I loved you more than you will ever know. You are the reason I lived. If you die, I die. We go together or we live together, baby, that's the deal. Live? Live please, no. 
Livia heard his beautiful voice begging her to live, hearing the love in his voice. But then the darkness took over, and she heard nothing more. Chapter 30 There was so much pain, and Livia didn't want to open her eyes, but she had to know if she was alive. Please please she begged, let Knox be alive too. If he's dead. Livy. She had never heard such a beautiful voice in her life. Livy baby, you can open your eyes sweetheart. She opened her eyes and focused on his face. Knox was pale and needed a shave but he was there, alive and smiling at her. He stroked her hair back from her face. We made it, Livy. Kiss me. She said the words but no sound came out, her throat was so dry. Knox smiled and helped her sip some water. Kiss me, she said again and this time her voice rang out pure and strong. Knox pressed his lips to hers and she sighed happily. We're alive. Yes we are. Knox took her hand. You just barely. But you're a fighter, Livy. She touched his face as if she couldn't believe he was real. Sandor. Knox's expression hardened. Dead. Good riddance. Agreed. He was a hell of an actor, though. Imagine holding on to that anger, that jealousy, that rage, all those years, just waiting for when you fell in love again. All because his daddy couldn't keep it in his pants. Knox nodded. Sandor didn't intend to get arrested, either. He left a suicide note and mailed it to the local news station. He intended to kill us, then himself. I saved him the bother. He'd killed Roan weeks before. That's how I knew it must have been Sandor, that's how I knew to get to you. My hero. She kissed him again, then groaned. Gosh, I could kill him all over again for how much this hurts. I know. I'm sorry, honey. Press this if you need the morphine, but Doc said you'd be in pain for a while. Livia pressed the button and felt a warm rush of something in her veins. It took the edge off. How about you? Why do you look so good? Knox grinned and pulled his shirt up. A heart-shaped scar was healing well, stark pink against his skin. Livia was confused. Knox, how long have I been out? Knox's smile faded. Three weeks. You had a pulmonary embolism, plus the bullet damaged your liver. Gosh. It was touch and go for a long time. You were in a coma, which, strange to say, was a blessing. He shook his head, as if he couldn't believe what he was saying. Livia took all this in and then nodded. Knox? Yes, baby. Is it all over now? Knox nodded. It is, honey. It was all in the letters Florian wrote to my mom. He didn't regret a thing, the bastard. He wrote such vile things, telling her the way he was going to kill her. He never mailed them, obviously. Florian raped my mom. She had the baby and gave it to them to raise. Then she met my dad. Florian held on to that jealousy for years and one day he just snapped. He killed them all, saving my mom for last. In his letters, he wrote that Florian wasn't even the one who pulled the trigger on my mom. It was Sandor. Livia felt sick. He murdered his own mother? Knox nodded. He was a sick bastard. I don't get why he killed Pia or Morico. I understand Roan to frame him and Amber to silence her, but why those two innocent girls? Knox hesitated. Liv, they think he killed a lot more than that. They think he'd been murdering women all over the country for years. He enjoyed it, darling. He got off on it. Sandor was quite the writer himself. They found diaries where he described his kills. He murdered Ariel, and then blackmailed Amber into shutting up. Pia, Morico, there was an entire notebook on the myriad of ways he dreamed up to kill you. Livia sighed. How's Odell? How is she taking the news of Roan's death? She's doing okay. She's outside if you want to see her. Gosh yes. Knox grinned, kissed her forehead and went to fetch his friend. Odell walked in, and her face was blank as she stared at Livia for a second. Well, look at you, lounging around doing nothing but costing my friend more money. For a moment, Livia was shocked, but then Knox burst out laughing and Odell cracked a smile. Livia giggled. Odie, 
Did you just make a joke? I think I may have. Hello, darling, it's good to see you awake. Odie bent down and kissed Livia's cheek, then held her hand. Livia was surprised to see tears in her friend's eyes. We nearly lost you. But I'm still here, Livia said, squeezing her hand. And I'm not going anywhere. I'm so happy, honey, so glad you're okay. I love you so much. Livia did cry then, and Odell hugged her, awkwardly of course, but Livia clung to her friend. Thank you, Odie. I love you too. Odell couldn't speak then, and soon after she left them alone, promising to come back and bring some contraband food with her. Alone, Livia smiled at Knox. Have I told you how much I love you? Even though I got you into all this. She pulled his head down for another kiss. I would take every minute of pain over and over again for you, Knox Renault. This is us, this is our life. Knox kissed her as if for the first time. From now on, he promised, I swear it will be a good happy life. Knox? He pressed his lips to her forehead. Yeah, baby. His voice was soft and tender. Knox Renault. He grinned at her formal tone. That's me. Livia gazed at him, her eyes shining. Knox Renault, would you do me the great honor of marrying me? Knox's eyes widened and he began to chuckle. Well damn woman, you just stole my best line. Livia grinned and pulled his face to hers, crushing her lips against his. Is that a yes? Knox kissed her passionately and then nodded. It's a hell yes, Miss Chatelaine. It's a yes and a yes and a yes. The End Thank you for listening to this audiobook. Audio Copyright, 2023 BFA Publishing Please like and subscribe to support this channel.